Chapter One of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter One Ancient England and the Romans. If you look at a map of the world, you will see, in the left-hand upper corner of the eastern hemisphere, two islands lying in the sea. They are England and Scotland and Ireland. England and Scotland form the greater part of these islands. Ireland is the next in size. The little neighbouring islands, which are so small upon the map as to be mere dots, are chiefly little bits of Scotland, broken off, I dare say, in the course of a great length of time by the power of the restless water. In the old days, a long, long while ago, before our Saviour was born on earth and lay asleep in a manger, these islands were in the same place, and the stormy sea roared around them, just as it roars now. But the sea was not alive then, with great ships and brave sailors, sailing to and from all parts of the world. It was very lonely, the islands lay solitary in the great expanse of the water. The foaming waves dashed against their cliffs, and the bleak winds blew over their forests. But the winds and waves brought no adventurers to land upon the islands. And the savage islanders knew nothing of the rest of the world, and the rest of the world knew nothing of them. It is supposed that the Phoenicians, who were an ancient people, famous for carrying on trade, came in ships to these islands, and found that they produced tin and lead, both very useful things, as you know, and both produced this very hour upon the sea coast. The most celebrated tin mines in Cornwall are still close to the sea. One of them, which I have seen, is so close to it that it is hollowed out underneath the ocean, and the miners say that in stormy weather, when they are at work down in that deep place, they can hear the noise of the waves thundering above their heads. So the Phoenicians, coasting about the islands, would come without much difficulty to where the tin and lead were. The Phoenicians traded with the islanders for these metals, and gave the islanders some other useful things in exchange. The islanders were, at first, poor savages, going almost naked, or only dressed in the rough skins of beasts, and staining their bodies, as other savages do, with coloured earths and the juices of plants. But the Phoenicians, sailing over to the opposite coasts of France and Belgium, and saying to the people there, We have been to those white cliffs across the water, which you can see in fine weather, and from that country, which is called Britain, we bring this tin and lead. Tempted some of the French and Belgians to come over also. These people settled themselves on the south coast of England, which is now called Kent. And although they were a rough people too, they taught the savage Britons some useful arts, and improved that part of the islands. It is probable that other people came over from Spain to Ireland and settled there. Thus, by little and little, strangers became mixed with the islanders, and the savage Britons grew into a wild, bold people, almost savage still, especially in the interior of the country, away from the sea where the foreign settlers seldom went, but hardy, brave, and strong. The whole country was covered with forests and swamps. The greater part of it was very misty and cold. There were no roads, no bridges, no streets, no houses that you would think deserving of the name. A town was nothing but a collection of straw-covered huts, hidden in a thick wood with a ditch all around, and a low wall made of mud, all the trunks of trees placed one upon another. The people planted little or no corn, but lived upon the flesh of their flocks and cattle. They made no coins but used metal rings for money. They were clever in basket-work, as savage people often are, 
and they could make a coarse kind of cloth and some very bad earthenware. But in building fortresses they were much more clever. They made boats of basket work, covered with the skins of animals, but seldom, if ever, ventured far from the shore. They made swords of copper mixed with tin, but these swords were of an awkward shape, and so soft that a heavy blow would bend one. They made light shields, short pointed daggers and spears, which they jerked back after they had thrown them at an enemy, by a long strip of leather fastened to the stem. The butt-end was a rattle to frighten an enemy's horse. The ancient Britons, being divided into as many as thirty or forty tribes, each commanded by its own little king, were constantly fighting with one another, as savage people usually do, and they always fought with these weapons. They were very fond of horses. The standard of Kent was the picture of a white horse. They could break them in and manage them wonderfully well. Indeed, the horses, of which they had an abundance, though they were rather small, were so well taught in those days that they can scarcely be said to have improved since, though the men are so much wiser. They understood and obeyed every word of command, and would stand still by themselves in all the din and noise of battle, while their masters went to fight on foot. The Britons could not have succeeded in their most remarkable art without the aid of these sensible and trusty animals. The art, I mean, is the construction and management of war chariots or cars, for which they have ever been celebrated in history. Each of the best sort of these chariots, not quite breast-high in front and open at the back, contained one man to drive, and two or three others to fight, all standing up. The horses who drew them were so well trained that they would tear, at full gallop, over the most stony ways, and even through the woods, dashing down their master's enemies beneath their hoofs, and cutting them to pieces with the blades of sword or scythes, which were fastened to the wheels, and stretched out beyond the car on each side for that cruel purpose. In a moment, while at full speed, the horses would stop at the driver's command, the men within would leap out, deal blows about them with their swords like hail, leap on the horses, on the pole, spring back into the chariots anyhow, and, as soon as they were safe, the horses tore away again. The Britons had a strange and terrible religion, called the religion of the Druids. It seems to have been brought over, in very early times indeed, from the opposite country of France, anciently called Gaul and to have mixed up the worship of the serpent and of the sun and moon with the worship of some of the heathen gods and goddesses. Most of its ceremonies were kept secret by the priests, the druids who pretended to be enchanters, and who carried magicians' wands and wore, each of them about his neck. What he told the ignorant people was the serpent's egg in a golden case. But it is certain that the juridical ceremonies included the sacrifice of human victims, the torture of some suspected criminals, and, on particular occasions, even the burning alive, in immense wicker cages, of a number of men and animals together. The Druid priests have some kind of veneration for the oak, and for the mistletoe, the same plant that we hang up in our houses at Christmas time now when its white berries grew upon the oak. They met together in dark woods, which they called sacred groves, and there they instructed in their mysterious arts young men who came to them as pupils, and who sometimes stayed with them as long as twenty years. These druids built great temples and altars open to the sky, fragments of some of which are yet remaining. Stonehenge on Salisbury Plain, in Wiltshire, is the most extraordinary of these. Three curious stones, called Kit's Coty House on Bluebell Hill near Maidstone in Kent, form another. We know from examination of the great blocks of which such buildings are made, that they could not have been raised without the aid of some ingenious machines, which are common now, 
but which the ancient Britons certainly did not use in making their own uncomfortable houses. I shall not wonder if the Druids, and their pupils who stayed with them twenty years, knowing more than the rest of the Britons, kept the people out of sight while they made these buildings, and then pretended that they built them by magic. Perhaps they had a hand in the fortresses too, at all events, as they were very powerful and very much believed in, and as they made and executed the laws and paid no taxes, I don't wonder that they liked their trade. And as they persuaded the people the more druids there were, the better off the people would be, I don't wonder that there are a good many of them. But it is pleasant to think that there are no druids now, who go on in that way and pretend to carry enchanters' wands and serpents' eggs. And, of course, there is nothing of the kind anywhere. Such was the improved condition of the ancient Britons, fifty-five years before the birth of our Saviour, when the Romans, under their great general Julius Caesar, were masters of all the rest of the known world. Julius Caesar had then just conquered Gaul, and, hearing in Gaul a good deal about the opposite island with the white cliffs, and about the bravery of the Britons who inhabited it, some of whom had been fetched over to help the Gauls in the war against him, he resolved, as he was so near, to come and conquer Britain next. So Julius Caesar came sailing over to this island of ours, with eighty vessels and twelve thousand men, and he came from the French coast between Calais and Boulogne, because thence was the shortest passage into Britain just for the same reason as our steamboats now take the same track every day. He expected to conquer Britain easily, but it was not such easy work as he supposed, for the bold Britons fought most bravely, and, what with not having his horse-soldiers with him, for they had been driven back by a storm, and what with having some of his vessels dashed to pieces by a high tide after they were drawn ashore, he ran great risk of being totally defeated. However, for once that the bold Britons beat him, he beat them twice, though not so soundly but that he was very glad to accept their proposals of peace and go away. But in the spring of the next year he came back, this time with eight hundred vessels and thirty thousand men. The British tribes chose, as their general-in-chief, a Briton, whom the Romans in their Latin language called Cassivellaunus, but whose British name is supposed to have been Caswallon. A brave general he was, and well he and his soldiers fought the Roman army. So well, that whenever in that war the Roman soldiers saw a great cloud of dust, and heard the rattle of the rapid British chariots, they trembled in their hearts. Besides a number of smaller battles, there was a battle fought near Canterbury and Kent. There was a battle fought near Chertsey and Surrey. There was a battle fought near a marshy little town in a wood, the capital of that part of Britain, which belonged to Cassivellaunus, and which was probably now what is St. Albans in Hertfordshire. However, brave Cassivellaunus had the worst of it, on the whole, though he and his men always fought like lions. As the other British chiefs were jealous of him, and were always quarrelling with him and with one another, he gave up, and proposed peace. Julius Caesar was very glad to grant peace easily, and to go away again with all his remaining ships and men. He had expected to find pearls in Britain, and he may have found a few for anything I know, but, at all events, he found delicious oysters— and I'm sure he found tough Britons, of whom I dare say he made the same complaint as Napoleon Bonaparte, the great French general did, eighteen hundred years after, when he said they were such unreasonable fellows, that they never knew when they were beaten. They never did know, I believe, and never will. Nearly a hundred years passed on, and all that time there was peace in Britain. The Britons improved their towns and mode of life, became more civilised, 
travelled and learned a great deal from the Gauls and Romans. At last the Roman emperor, Claudius, sent Alus Plautius, a skilful general with a mighty force, to subdue the island, and shortly afterwards arrived himself. They did little, and Astorius Scapula, another general, came. Some of the British chiefs of tribes submitted, others resolved to fight to the death. Of these brave men the bravest was Caractacus, or Caradoc, who gave battle to the Romans with his army among the mountains of North Wales. This day, said he to his soldiers, decides the fate of Britain. Your liberty or your eternal slavery dates from this hour. Remember your brave ancestors who drove the great Caesar himself across the sea. On hearing these words, his men, with a great shout, rushed upon the Romans. But the strong Roman swords and armour were too much for the weaker British weapons in close conflict. The Britons lost that day. The wife and daughter of the brave Caractacus were taken prisoner. His brothers delivered themselves up. He himself was betrayed into the hands of the Romans by his false and base stepmother and they carried him and all his family in triumph to Rome. But a great man will be great in misfortune, great in prison, great in chains. His noble air and dignified endurance of distress so touched the Roman people who thronged the streets to see him, that he and his family were restored to freedom. No one knows whether his great heart broke and he died in Rome, or whether he ever returned to his own dear country. English oaks have grown up from acorns and withered away, when they were hundreds of years old, and other oaks have sprung up in their places and died too, very aged, since the rest of the history of the brave Caractacus was forgotten. Still the Britons would not yield. They rose again and again, and died by thousands sword in hand. They rose on every possible occasion. Suetonius, another Roman general, came and stormed the island of Anglesey, then called Mona, which was supposed to be sacred, and he burnt the Druids in their own wicked cages by their own fires. But even while he was in Britain, with his victorious troops, the Britons rose. Because Boadicea, a British queen, the widow of the king of the Norfolk and Suffolk people, resisted the plundering of her property by the Romans who were settled in England. She was scourged by order of Catus, a Roman officer, and her two daughters were shamefully insulted in her presence, and her husband's relations were made slaves. To avenge this injury the Britons rose, with all their might and rage. They drove Catus into Gaul, they laid the Roman possessions waste, they forced the Romans out of London, then a poor little town, but a trading place. They hanged, burnt, crucified, and slew by the sword seventy thousand Romans in a few days. Sortonius strengthened his army, and advanced to give them battle. They strengthened their army, and desperately attacked his, on a field where it was strongly posted. Before the first charge of the Britons was made, Boadicea, in a war chariot, with her fair hair streaming in the wind, and her injured daughters lying at her feet, drove among the troops and cried to them for vengeance on their oppressors, the licentious Romans. The Britons fought to the last, but they were vanquished with great slaughter, and the unhappy queen took poison. Still the spirit of the Britons was not broken. When Sortonius left the country, they fell upon his troops and retook the island of Anglesey. Agricola came, fifteen or twenty years afterwards, and retook it once more, and devoted seven years to subduing the country, especially that part of it which is now called Scotland. But its people, the Caledonians, resisted him at every inch of ground. They fought the bloodiest battles with him, they killed their very wives and children to prevent his making prisoners of them. They fell fighting in such great numbers that certain hills in Scotland are yet supposed to be vast heaps of stones piled up above their graves. 
Hadrian came thirty years afterwards, and still they resisted him. Severus came nearly a hundred years afterwards, and they worried his great army like dogs, and rejoiced to see them die, by thousands in the bogs and swamps. Caracalla, the son and successor of Severus, did the most to conquer them, for a time, but not by force of arms. He knew how little that would do. He yielded up a quantity of land to the Caledonians, and gave the Britons the same privileges as the Romans possessed. There was peace after this, for seventy years. Then new enemies arose. They were the Saxons, a fierce seafaring people from the countries to the north of the Rhine, the great river of Germany on the banks of which the best grapes grow to make the German wine. They began to come in pirate ships to the sea coast of Gaul and Britain, and to plunder them. They were repulsed by Carasius, a native either of Belgium or of Britain, who was appointed by the Romans to the command, and under whom the Britons first began to fight upon the sea. But after this they renewed their ravages. A few years more, and the Scots, which was then the name for the people of Ireland, and the Picts, a northern people, began to make frequent plundering incursions into the south of Britain. All these attacks were repeated at intervals during two hundred years, and through a long succession of Roman emperors and chiefs, during all which length of time the Britons rose against the Romans over and over again. At last, in the days of the Roman Honorius, when the Roman power all over the world was fast declining, and when Rome wanted all her soldiers at home, the Romans abandoned all hope of conquering Britain, and went away. And still at last, as at first, the Britons rose against them in their old, brave manner. For a very little while before, they had turned away the Roman magistrates, and declared themselves an independent people. Five hundred years had passed since Julius Caesar's first invasion of the island, when the Romans departed from it forever. In the course of that time, although they had been the cause of terrible fighting and bloodshed, they had done much to improve the condition of the Britons. They had made great military roads, they had built forts, they had taught them how to dress and arm themselves, much better than they had ever known how to do before. They had refined the whole British way of living. Agricola had built a great wall of earth, more than seventy miles long, extending from Newcastle to beyond Carlisle, for the purpose of keeping out the Picts and Scots. Hadrian had strengthened it. Severus, finding it much in want of repair, had built it afresh of stone. Above all, it was in the Roman time, and by means of Roman ships, that the Christian religion was first brought into Britain, and its people first taught the great lesson that, to be good in the sight of God, they must love their neighbours as themselves, and do unto others as they would be done by. The Druids declared that it was very wicked to believe in any such thing, and cursed all the people who did believe it very heartily. But when the people found that they were none the better for the blessings of the Druids, and none the worse for the curses of the Druids, but that the sun shone and the rain fell without consulting the Druids at all, they just began to think that the Druids were mere men, and that it signified very little whether they cursed or blessed. After which the pupils of the Druids fell off greatly in numbers, and the Druids took to other trades. Thus I have come to the end of the Roman time in England. It is but little that is known of those five hundred years, but some remains of them are still found. Often when labourers are digging up the ground, to make foundations for houses or churches, they light on rusty money that once belonged to the Romans. Fragments of plates from which they ate, of goblets from which they drank, and of pavement of which they trod, are discovered among the earth that is broken by the plough, or the dust that is crumbled by the gardener's spade. Wells that the Romans sunk still yield water. Roads that the Romans made form part of our highways. 
In some old battlefields, British spearheads and Roman armour have been found, mingled together in decay, as they fell in the thick pressure of the fight. Traces of Roman camps overgrown with grass, and of mounds that are the burial places of heaps of Britons, are to be seen in almost all parts of the country. Across the bleak moors of Northumberland, the wall of Severus, overrun with moss and weeds, still stretches a strong ruin, and the shepherds and their dogs lie sleeping on it in the summer weather. On Salisbury Plain, Stonehenge yet stands, a monument of the earlier time when the Roman name was unknown in Britain, and when the Druids, with their best magic wands, could not have written it in the sands of the wild seashore. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of A Child's History of England》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter Two Ancient England under the Early Saxons. The Romans had scarcely gone away from Britain, when the Britons began to wish they had never left it. For, the Romans being gone, and the Britons being much reduced in numbers by their long wars, the Picts and Scots came pouring in, over the broken and unguarded wall of Severus, in swarms. They plundered the richest towns and killed the people, and came back so often for more booty and more slaughter, that the unfortunate Britons lived a life of terror. As if the Picts and Scots were not bad enough on land, the Saxons attacked the islanders by sea, and, as if something more was still wanting to make them miserable, they quarrelled bitterly among themselves as to what prayers they ought to say, and how they ought to say them. The priests, being very angry with one another on these questions, cursed one another in the heartiest manner and, uncommonly like the old druids, cursed all the people whom they could not persuade. So, altogether, the Britons were very badly off, you may believe. They were in such distress, in short, that they sent a letter to Rome entreating help, which they called the Groans of the Britons, and in which they said, The barbarians chase us into the sea, the sea throws us back upon the barbarians, and we have only the hard choice left us of perishing by the sword or perishing by the waves. But the Romans could not help them, even if they were so inclined, for they had enough to do to defend themselves against their own enemies, who were then very fierce and strong. At last the Britons, unable to bear their hard condition any longer, resolved to make peace with the Saxons and to invite the Saxons to come into their country, and help them to keep out the Picts and Scots. It was a British prince named Vortigern, who took this resolution, and who made a treaty of friendship with Hengist and Horsha, two Saxon chiefs. Both of these names, in the old Saxon language, signify horse, for the Saxons, like many other nations in a rough state, were fond of giving men the names of animals, as horse, wolf, bear, hound. The Indians of North America, a very inferior people to the Saxons, though, do the same to this day. Hengist and Horsha drove out the Picts and Scots, and Vortigern, being grateful to them for that service, made no opposition to their settling themselves in that part of England, which is called the Isle of Thanet or to their inviting over more of their countrymen to join them. But Hengist had a beautiful daughter named Rowena, and when, at a feast, she filled a golden goblet to the brim with wine, and gave it to Vortigern, saying in a sweet voice, Dear king, thy health, the king fell in love with her. My opinion is that the cunning Hengist meant him to do so, in order that the Saxons might have greater influence with him, 
and that the fair Rowena came to that feast, golden goblet and all, on purpose. At any rate, they were married, and long afterwards, whenever the king was angry with the Saxons, or jealous of their encroachments, Rowena would put her beautiful arms round his neck, and softly say, Dear king, they are my people. Be favourable to them, as you loved that Saxon girl who gave you the golden goblet of wine at the feast. And really, I don't see how the king could help himself. Ah, we must all die. In the course of years, Vortigern died. He was dethroned and put in prison first, I am afraid. And Rowena died, and generations of Saxons and Britons died. And events that happened during a long, long time ago would have been quite forgotten but for the tales and songs of the old bards, who used to go about from feast to feast with their white beards, recounting the deeds of their forefathers. Among the histories of which they sang and talked, there was a famous one, concerning the bravery and virtues of King Arthur, supposed to have been a British prince in those old times. But whether such a person really lived, or whether there were several persons whose histories came to be confused together under that one name, or whether all about him was invention, no one knows. I will tell you shortly what is most interesting in the early Saxon times, as they are described in these songs and stories of the bards. In, and long after, the days of Vortigern, fresh bodies of Saxons, under various chiefs, came pouring into Britain, one body conquering the Britons in the east and settling there, calling their king Domessex, another body settled in the west and called their kingdom Wessex. The North folk, or Norfolk people, established themselves in one place, the South folk, or Suffolk people, established themselves in another, and gradually seven kingdoms or states arose in England, which were called the Saxon Heptarchy. The poor Britons, falling back before these crowds of fighting men, whom they had innocently invited over as friends, retired into Wales and the adjacent country, into Devonshire and into Cornwall. Those parts of England long remained unconquered. And in Cornwall now, where the sea coast is very gloomy, steep and rugged, where in the dark winter time ships have often been wrecked close to the land, and every soul on board has perished, where the winds and waves howl drearily and split the solid rocks into arches and caverns, there are very ancient ruins, which the people call the ruins of King Arthur's castle. Kent is the most famous of the seven Saxon kingdoms, because the Christian religion was preached to the Saxons there, who domineered over the Britons too much to care for what they said about their religion or anything else. By Augustine, a monk from Rome. King Ethelbert of Kent was soon converted, and the moment he said he was a Christian, his courtiers all said they were Christians, after which ten thousand of his subjects said they were Christians too. Augustine built a little church close to this king's palace, on the ground now occupied by the beautiful cathedral of Canterbury. Sibbert, the king's nephew, built on a muddy marshy place near London, where there had been a temple to Apollo, a church dedicated to St. Peter, which is now Westminster Abbey. And in London itself, on the foundation of a temple to Diana, he built another little church, which has risen up since that old time, to be St. Paul's. After the death of Ethelbert, Edwin, king of Northumbria, who was such a good king that it was said a woman or child might openly carry a purse of gold in his reign, without fear, allowed his child to be baptized, and held a great council to consider whether he and his people should all be Christians or not. It was decided that they should be. Coifi, the chief priest of the old religion, made a great speech on the occasion. In this discourse he told the people that he had found out the old gods to be impostors. I am quite satisfied of it, he said. Look at me. I have been serving them all my life, 
and they have done nothing for me, whereas, if they had been really powerful, they could not have decently done less, in return for all I have done for them, than make my fortune. As they have never made my fortune, I am quite convinced they are impostors. When this singular priest had finished speaking, he hastily armed himself with sword and lance, mounted a war-horse, rode at a full gallop in sight of all the people to the temple, and flung his lance against it as an insult. From that time the Christian religion spread itself among the Saxons, and became their faith. The next very famous prince was Egbert. He lived about a hundred and fifty years afterwards, and claimed to have a better right to the throne of Wessex than Beatrix, another Saxon prince who was at the head of that kingdom, and who married a Berger, the daughter of Offa, king of another of the seven kingdoms. This queen Egberga was a handsome murderess, who poisoned people when they offended her. One day she mixed a cup of poison for a certain noble belonging to the court, but her husband drank of it too, by mistake, and died. Upon this the people revolted in great crowds, and, running to the palace and thundering at the gates, cried, "'Down with the wicked queen who poisons men!' They drove her out of the country, and abolished the title she had to disgraced. When years had passed away, some travellers came home from Italy, and said that, in the town of Pavia, they had seen a ragged beggar-woman, who had once been handsome, but was then shrivelled, bent, and yellow, wandering about the streets crying for bread, and that this beggar-woman was the poisoning English queen. It was indeed Egberga, and so she died, without a shelter for her wretched head. Egbert, not considering himself safe in England, in consequence of his having claimed the crown to Wessex, for he thought his rival might take him prisoner and put him to death, sought refuge at the court of Charlemagne, king of France. On the death of Beatrix, so unhappily poisoned by mistake, Egbert came back to Britain, succeeded to the throne of Wessex, conquered some of the other monarchs of the Seven Kingdoms, added their territories to his own, and, for the first time, called the country over which he ruled England. And now new enemies arose, who for a long time troubled England sorely. These were the Northmen, the people of Denmark and Norway, whom the English called the Danes. They were a warlike people, quite at home upon the sea, not Christians, very daring and cruel. They came over in ships, and plundered and burned wheresoever they landed. Once they beat Egbert in battle, once Egbert beat them. But they cared no more for being beaten than the English themselves. In the four following short reigns, of Ethelwulf and his sons Ethelbard, Ethelbert, and Ethelred, they came back, over and over again, burning and plundering and laying England waste. In the last-mentioned reign, they seized Edmund, king of East England, and bound him to a tree. Then they proposed to him that he should change his religion. But he, being a good Christian, steadily refused. Upon that they beat him, made cowardly jests upon him, all defenceless as he was, shot arrows at him, and, finally, struck off his head. It is impossible to say whose head they might have struck off next, but for the death of King Ethelred, from a wound he had received in fighting against them, and the succession to his throne of the best and wisest king that ever lived in England. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Joshua Christensen. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 3 England under the Good Saxon, Alfred. Alfred the Great was a young man 
three and twenty years of age when he became king. Twice in his childhood he had been taken to Rome, where the Saxon nobles were in the habit of going on journeys which they supposed to be religious, and once he had stayed for some time in Paris. Learning, however, was so little cared for then, that at twelve years old he had not been taught to read, although of the sons of King Ethelwulf, he, the youngest, was the favorite. But he had, as most men who grow up to be great and good are generally found to have had, an excellent mother. And one day this lady, whose name was Osburga, happened as she was sitting among her sons to read a book of Saxon poetry. The art of printing was not known until long and long after that period, and the book which was written was what is called illuminated, with beautiful bright letters richly painted. The brothers, admiring it very much, their mother said, I will give it to that one of you four princes who first learns to read. Alfred sought out a tutor that very day, applied himself to learn with great diligence, and soon won the book. He was proud of it all his life. This great king, in the first year of his reign, fought nine battles with the Danes. He made some treaties with them, too, by which the false Danes swore they would quit the country. They pretended to consider that they had taken a very solemn oath in swearing this upon holy bracelets that they wore, and which were always buried with them when they died. But they cared little for it, for they thought nothing of breaking oaths and treaties, too, as soon as it suited their purpose, and coming back again to fight, plunder, and burn as usual. One fatal winter, in the fourth year of King Alfred's reign, they spread themselves in great numbers over the whole of England, and so dispersed and routed the king's soldiers that the king was left alone, and was obliged to disguise himself as a common peasant, and to take refuge in the cottage of one of his cowherds, who did not know his face. Here King Alfred, while the Danes sought him far and near, was left alone one day by the cowherd's wife to watch some cakes which she had put to bake upon the hearth. But being at work upon his bow and arrows, with which he hoped to punish the false Danes when a brighter time should come, and thinking deeply of his poor unhappy subjects whom the Danes chased through the land, his noble mind forgot the cakes, and they were burnt. What? said the cowherd's wife, who scolded him well when she came back, and little thought that she was scolding the king. You will be ready enough to eat them by and by, and yet you cannot watch them, idle dog. At length, the Devonshire men made head against a new host of Danes who landed on their coast, killed their chief, and captured their flag, on which was represented the likeness of a raven, a very fit bird for a thievish army like that, I think. The loss of their standard troubled the Danes greatly, for they believed it to be enchanted, woven by three daughters of one father in a single afternoon, and they had a story among themselves that when they were victorious in battle, the raven stretched his wings and seemed to fly, and that when they were defeated he would droop. He had good reason to droop now, if he could have done anything half so sensible, for King Alfred joined the Devonshire men, made a camp with them on a piece of firm ground in the midst of a bog in Somersetshire, and prepared for a great attempt for vengeance on the Danes, and the deliverance of his oppressed people. But first, as it was important to know how numerous those pestilent Danes were, and how they were fortified, King Alfred, being a good musician, disguised himself as a glee man or minstrel, and went with his harp to the Danish camp. He played and sang in the very tent of Guthrum, the Danish leader, and entertained the Danes as they caroused. While he seemed to think of nothing but his music, he was watchful of their tents, their arms, their discipline, everything that he desired to know. And right soon did this great king entertain them to a different tune, for, summoning all his true followers to meet him at an appointed place, where they received him with joyful shouts and tears, as the monarch whom many of them had given up for lost or dead, he put himself at their head, marched on the Danish camp, defeated the Danes with great slaughter, and besieged them for fourteen days to prevent their escape. But being as merciful as he was good and brave, he then, instead of killing them, proposed peace, on condition that they should altogether depart from that western part of England, and settle in the east, and that Guthrum should become a Christian, 
in remembrance of the divine religion which now taught his conqueror, the noble Alfred, to forgive the enemy who had so often injured him. This Guthrum did. At his baptism, King Alfred was his godfather, and Guthrum was an honorable chief who well deserved that clemency, for ever afterwards he was loyal and faithful to the king. The Danes under him were faithful too. They plundered and burned no more, but worked like honest men. They ploughed and sowed and reaped and led good, honest English lives. And I hope the children of those Danes played many a time with Saxon children in the sunny fields, and that Danish young men fell in love with Saxon girls and married them, and that English travellers, benighted at the doors of Danish cottages, often went in for shelter until morning, and that Danes and Saxons sat by the red fire, friends, talking of King Alfred the Great. All the Danes were not like these under Guthrum, for after some years more of them came over, in the old plundering and burning way, among them a fierce pirate of the name of Hastings, who had the boldness to sail up the Thames to Gravesend with eighty ships. For three years there was a war with these Danes, and there was a famine in the country too, and a plague, both upon human creatures and beasts. But King Alfred, whose mighty heart never failed him, built large ships nevertheless, with which to pursue the pirates on the sea, and he encouraged his soldiers, by his brave example, to fight valiantly against them on the shore. At last he drove them all away, and then there was repose in England. As great and good in peace as he was great and good in war, King Alfred never rested from his labors to improve his people. He loved to talk with clever men, and with travelers from foreign countries, and to write down what they told him for his people to read. He had studied Latin after learning to read English, and now another of his labors was to translate Latin books into the English-Saxon tongue that his people might be interested and improved by their contents. He made just laws that they might live more happily and freely. He turned away all partial judges that no wrong might be done them. He was so careful of their property and punished robbers so severely that it was a common thing to say that under the great King Alfred garlands of golden chains and jewels might have hung across the streets, and no man would have touched one. He founded schools. He patiently heard causes himself in his court of justice. The great desires of his heart were to do right to all his subjects, and to leave England better, wiser, happier in all ways than he found it. His industry in these efforts was quite astonishing. Every day he divided into certain portions, and in each portion devoted himself to a certain pursuit. That he might divide his time exactly, he had wax torches or candles made, which were all of the same size, were notched across at regular distances, and were always kept burning. Thus, as the candles burnt down, he divided the day into notches, almost as accurately as we now divide it into hours upon the clock. But when the candles were first invented, it was found that the wind and draughts of air blowing into the place through the doors and windows, and through the chinks in the walls, caused them to gutter and burn unequally. To prevent this, the king had them put into cases formed of wood and white horn, and these were the first lanthorns ever made in England. All this time he was afflicted with a terrible unknown disease, which caused him violent and frequent pain that nothing could relieve. He bore it, as he had borne all the troubles of his life, like a brave good man, until he was fifty-three years old, and then, having reigned thirty years, he died. He died in the year 901, but long ago as that is, his fame, and the love and gratitude with which his subjects regarded him, are freshly remembered to the present hour. In the next reign, which was the reign of Edward, surnamed the Elder, who was chosen in council to succeed, a nephew of King Alfred troubled the country by trying to obtain the throne. The Danes in the east of England took part with this usurper, perhaps because they had honored his uncle so much, and honored him for his uncle's sake, and there was hard fighting. But the king, with the assistance of his sister, gained the day, and reigned in peace for four and twenty years. He gradually extended his power over the whole of England, and so the seven kingdoms were united into one. When England thus became one kingdom, 
ruled over by one Saxon king, the Saxons had been settled in the country more than four hundred and fifty years. Great changes had taken place in its customs during that time. The Saxons were still greedy eaters and great drinkers, and their feasts were often of a noisy and drunken kind, but many new comforts and even elegances had become known, and were fast increasing. Hangings for the walls of rooms, where, in these modern days, we paste up paper, are known to have been sometimes made of silk, ornamented with birds and flowers in needlework. Tables and chairs were curiously carved in different woods, were sometimes decorated with gold or silver, sometimes even made of those precious metals. Knives and spoons were used at table, golden ornaments were worn, with silk and cloth and golden tissues and embroideries. Dishes were made of gold and silver, brass and bone. There were varieties of drinking horns, bedsteads, musical instruments. A harp was passed round at a feast, like the drinking bowl, from guest to guest, and each one usually sang or played when his turn came. The weapons of the Saxons were stoutly made, and among them was a terrible iron hammer that gave deadly blows, and was long remembered. The Saxons themselves were a handsome people. The men were proud of their long, fair hair parted on the forehead, their ample beards, their fresh complexions, and clear eyes. The beauty of the Saxon women filled all England with a new delight and grace. I have more to tell of the Saxons yet, but I stop to say this now, because under the great Alfred all the best points of the English-Saxon character were first encouraged, and in him first shown. It has been the greatest character among the nations of the earth. Wherever the descendants of the Saxon race have gone, have sailed, or otherwise made their way, even to the remotest regions of the world, they have been patient, persevering, never to be broken in spirit, never to be turned aside from enterprises on which they have resolved. In Europe, Asia, Africa, America, the whole world over, in the desert, in the forest, on the sea, scorched by a burning sun or frozen by ice that never melts, the Saxon blood remains unchanged. Wheresoever that race goes, there law and industry and safety for life and property and all the great results of steady perseverance are certain to arise. I pause to think with admiration of the noble king who, in his single person, possessed all the Saxon virtues, whom misfortune could not subdue, whom prosperity could not spoil, whose perseverance nothing could shake, who was hopeful in defeat and generous in success, who loved justice, freedom, truth, and knowledge, who, in his care to instruct his people, probably did more to preserve the beautiful old Saxon language than I can imagine, without whom the English tongue in which I tell this story might have wanted half its meaning. As it is said that his spirit still inspires some of our best English laws, so let you and I pray that it may animate our English hearts, at least to this, to resolve when we see any of our fellow creatures left in ignorance, that we will do our best, while life is in us, to have them taught, and to tell those rulers whose duty it is to teach them, and who neglect their duty, that they have profited very little by all the years that have rolled away since the year 901, and that they are far behind the bright example of King Alfred the Great. End of chapter Chapter 4 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Koskinen. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 4 England under Ethelstan and the Six Boy Kings. Ethelstan the son of Edward the Elder, succeeded that king. He reigned only fifteen years, but he remembered the glory of his grandfather, the great Alfred, and governed England well. He reduced the turbulent people of Wales, and obliged them to pay him a tribute in money, and in cattle, 
and to send him their best hawks and hounds. He was victorious over the Cornish men, who were not yet quite under the Saxon government. He restored such of the old laws as were good, and had fallen into disuse, made some wise new laws, and took care of the poor and weak. A strong alliance made against him by Anulf, a Danish prince, Constantine, king of the Scots, and the people of North Wales, he broke and defeated in one great battle, long famous for the vast numbers slain in it. After that he had a quiet reign. The lords and ladies about him had leisure to become polite and agreeable, and foreign princes were glad, as they have sometimes been since, to come to England on visits to the English court. When Ethelstan died, at forty-seven years old, his brother Edmund, who was only eighteen, became king. He was the first of six boy kings, as you will presently know. They called him the Magnificent, because he showed a taste for improvement and refinement. But he was beset by the Danes, and had a short and troubled reign, which came to a troubled end. One night, when he was feasting in his hall, and had eaten much and drunk deep, he saw among the company a noted robber named Leof, who had been banished from England. Made very angry by the boldness of this man, the king turned to his cup-bearer and said, There is a robber sitting at the table yonder, who, for his crimes, is an outlaw in the land, a hunted wolf, whose life any man may take at any time. Command that robber to depart. I will not depart, said Leof. No, cried the king. No, by the lord, said Leof. Upon that the king rose from his seat, and making passionately at the robber, and seizing him by his long hair, tried to throw him down. But the robber had a dagger underneath his cloak, and in the scuffle stabbed the king to death. That done, he set his back against the wall, and fought so desperately that although he was soon cut to pieces by the king's armed men, and the wall and pavement were splashed with his blood, yet it was not before he had killed and wounded many of them. You may imagine what rough lives the kings of those times led, when one of them could struggle, half drunk, with a public robber in his own dining-hall, and be stabbed in presence of the company who ate and drank with him. Then succeeded the boy-king Edred, who was weak and sickly in body, but of a strong mind. And his armies fought the Northmen, the Danes, and Norwegians, or the sea-kings, as they were called, and beat them for the time. And in nine years Edred died and passed away. Then came the boy-king Edwy, fifteen years of age, but the real king, who had the real power, was a monk named Dunstan, a clever priest, a little mad, and not a little proud and cruel. Dunstan was then abbot of Glastonbury Abbey, whither the body of King Edmund the Magnificent was carried to be buried. While yet a boy, he had got out of his bed one night, being then in a fever, and walked about Glastonbury Church when it was under repair, and because he did not tumble off some scaffolds that were there and break his neck, it was reported that he had been shown over the building by an angel. He had also made a harp that was said to play of itself, which it very likely did, as Aeolian harps which are played by the wind, and are understood now, always do. For these wonders he had been once denounced by his enemies, who were jealous of his favour with the late King Ethelstan, as a magician. And he had been waylaid, bound hand and foot, and thrown into a marsh. But he got out again, somehow, to cause a great deal of trouble yet. The priests of those days were, generally, the only scholars. They were learned in many things. Having to make their own convents and monasteries, on uncultivated grounds that were granted to them by the crown, it was necessary that they should be good farmers and good gardeners, or their lands would have been too poor to support them. For the decoration of the chapels where they prayed, 
and for the comfort of the refectories where they ate and drank, it was necessary that there should be good carpenters, good smiths, good painters among them. For their greater safety in sickness and accident, living alone by themselves in solitary places, it was necessary that they should study the virtues of plants and herbs, and should know how to dress cuts, burns, scalds, and bruises, and how to set broken limbs. Accordingly, they taught themselves and one another a great variety of useful arts, and became skillful in agriculture, medicine, surgery, and handicraft. And when they wanted the aid of any little piece of machinery, which would be simple enough now, but was marvellous then, to impose a trick upon the poor peasants, they knew very well how to make it, and did make it many a time and often, I have no doubt. Dunstan, abbot of Glastonbury Abbey, was one of the most sagacious of these monks. He was an ingenious smith, and worked at a forge in a little cell. This cell was made too short to admit of his lying at full length when he went to sleep, as if that did any good to anybody. And he used to tell the most extraordinary lies about demons and spirits, who, he said, came there to persecute him. For instance, he related that one day, when he was at work, the devil looked in at the little window, and tried to tempt him to lead a life of idle pleasure. Whereupon, having his pincers in the fire, red-hot, he seized the devil by the nose, and put him to such pain that his bellowings were heard for miles and miles. Some people are inclined to think this nonsense a part of Dunstan's madness, for his head never quite recovered the fever, but I think not. I observe that it induced the ignorant people to consider him a holy man, and that it made him very powerful, which was exactly what he always wanted. On the day of the coronation of the handsome boy King Edwy, it was remarked by Odo, Archbishop of Canterbury, who was a Dane by birth, that the king quietly left the coronation feast, while all the company were there. Odo, much displeased, sent his friend Dunstan to seek him. Dunstan, finding him in the company of his beautiful young wife, Elgiva, and her mother, Ethelgiva, a good and virtuous lady, not only grossly abused them, but dragged the young king back into the feasting hall by force. Some, again, think Dunstan did this because the young king's fair wife was his own cousin, and the monks objected to people marrying their own cousins. But I believe he did it because he was an imperious, audacious, ill-conditioned priest, who, having loved a young lady himself before he became a sour monk, hated all love now, and everything belonging to it. The young king was quite old enough to feel this insult. Dunstan had been treasurer in the last reign, and he soon charged Dunstan with having taken some of the last king's money. The Glastonbury abbot fled to Belgium, very narrowly escaping some pursuers who were sent to put out his eyes, as you will wish they had, when you read what follows. And his abbey was given to priests who were married, whom he always both before and afterwards opposed. But he quickly conspired with his friend, Odo the Dane, to set up the king's young brother, Edgar, as his rival for the throne, and not content with this revenge, he caused the beautiful queen Elgiva, though a lovely girl of only seventeen or eighteen, to be stolen from one of the royal palaces, branded in the cheek with a red-hot iron, and sold into slavery in Ireland. But the Irish people pitied and befriended her, and they said, Let us restore the girl queen to the boy king, and make the young lovers happy. And they cured her of her cruel wound, and sent her home as beautiful as before. But the villain Dunstan, and that other villain Odo, caused her to be waylaid at Gloucester, as she was joyfully hurrying to join her husband and to be hacked and hewn with swords, and to be barbarously maimed and lamed and left to die. 
when Edwy the Fair, his people called him so because he was so young and handsome, heard of her dreadful fate, he died of a broken heart. And so the pitiful story of the young wife and husband ends. Ah, better to be two cottagers in these better times than king and queen of England in those bad days, though never so fair. Then came the boy King Edgar, called the Peaceful, fifteen years old. Dunstan, being still the real king, drove all married priests out of the monasteries and abbeys, and replaced them by solitary monks like himself, of the rigid order called the Benedictines. He made himself Archbishop of Canterbury for his greater glory, and exercised such power over the neighboring British princes, and so collected them about the king, that once, when the king held his court at Chester, and went on the River Dee to visit the monastery of St. John, the eight oars of his boat were pulled, as the people used to delight in relating in stories and songs, by eight crowned kings, and steered by the king of England. As Edgar was very obedient to Dunstan and the monks, they took great pains to represent him as the best of kings. But he was really profligate, debauched, and vicious. He once forcibly carried off a young lady from the convent at Wilton, and Dunstan, pretending to be very much shocked, condemned him not to wear his crown upon his head for seven years. No great punishment, I dare say, as it can hardly have been a more comfortable ornament to wear than a stewpan without a handle. His marriage with his second wife, Elfrida, is one of the worst events of his reign. Hearing of the beauty of this lady, he dispatched his favorite courtier, Ethelwald, to her father's castle in Devonshire, to see if she were really as charming as fame reported. Now, she was so exceedingly beautiful, that Ethelwald fell in love with her himself, and married her. But he told the king that she was only rich, and not handsome. The king, suspecting the truth when they came home, resolved to pay the newly married couple a visit, and suddenly told Ethelwald to prepare for his immediate coming. Ethelwald, terrified, confessed to his young wife what he had said and done, and implored her to disguise her beauty by some ugly dress or silly manner, that he might be safe from the king's anger. She promised that she would. But she was a proud woman, who would far rather have been a queen than the wife of a courtier. She dressed herself in her best dress, and adorned herself with her richest jewels, and when the king came, presently, he discovered the cheat. So he caused his false friend, Ethelwald, to be murdered in a wood, and married his widow, this bad Elfrida. Six or seven years afterwards he died, and was buried, as if he had been all that the monks said he was, in the abbey of Glastonbury, which he, or Dunstan for him, had much enriched. England, in one part of this reign, was so troubled by wolves, which, driven out of the open country, hid themselves in the mountains of Wales when they were not attacking travellers and animals, that the tribute payable by the Welsh people was forgiven them, on condition of their producing, every year, three hundred wolves' heads. And the Welshmen were so sharp upon the wolves, to save their money, that in four years there was not a wolf left. Then came the boy king Edward, called the Martyr, from the manner of his death. Elfrida had a son, named Ethelred, for whom she claimed the throne. But Dunstan did not choose to favor him, and he made Edward king. The boy was hunting one day, down in Dorsetshire, when he rode near to Corfe Castle, where Elfrida and Ethelred lived. Wishing to see them kindly, he rode away from his attendants and galloped to the castle gate, where he arrived at twilight, and blew his hunting-horn. "'You are welcome, dear king,' said Elfrida, coming out with her brightest smiles. "'Pray you, dismount and enter.' "'Not so, dear madam,' said the king, 
My company will miss me, and fear that I have met with some harm. Please you to give me a cup of wine, that I may drink here, in the saddle, to you and to my little brother, and so ride away with the good speed I have made in riding here. Elfrida, going in to bring the wine, whispered an armed servant, one of her attendants, who stole out of the darkening gateway, and crept round behind the king's horse. As the king raised the cup to his lips, saying, Health! to the wicked woman who was smiling on him, and to his innocent brother whose hand she held in hers, and who was only ten years old, this armed man made a spring, and stabbed him in the back. He dropped the cup, and spurred his horse away, but soon fainting with loss of blood, dropped from the saddle, and, in his fall, entangled one of his feet in the stirrup. The frightened horse dashed on, trailing his rider's curls upon the ground, dragging his smooth young face through ruts and stones and briars and fallen leaves and mud, until the hunters tracking the animal's course by the king's blood caught his bridle and released the disfigured body. Then came the sixth and last of the boy kings, Ethelred, whom Elfrida, when he cried out at the sight of his murdered brother, riding away from the castle gate, unmercifully beat with a torch which she snatched from one of the attendants. The people so disliked this boy, on account of his cruel mother and the murder she had done to promote him, that Dunstan would not have had him for king, but would have made Edgitha, the daughter of the dead King Edgar, and of the lady whom he stole out of the convent at Wilton, Queen of England if she would have consented. But she knew the stories of the youthful kings too well, and would not be persuaded from the convent where she lived in peace. So Dunstan put Ethelred on the throne, having no one else to put there, and gave him the nickname of the Unready, knowing that he wanted resolution and firmness. At first Elfrida possessed great influence over the young king, but as he grew older and came of age, her influence declined. The infamous woman, not having it in her power to do any more evil, then retired from court, and, according to the fashion of the time, built churches and monasteries to expiate her guilt. As if a church, with a steeple reaching to the very stars, would have been any sign of true repentance for the blood of the poor boy, whose murdered form was trailed at his horse's heels, as if she could have buried her wickedness beneath the senseless stones of the whole world, piled up one upon another for the monks to live in. About the ninth or tenth year of this reign, Dunstan died. He was growing old then, but was as stern and artful as ever. Two circumstances that happened in connection with him in this reign of Ethelred, made a great noise. Once he was present at a meeting of the church, when the question was discussed whether priests should have permission to marry, and, as he sat with his head hung down, apparently thinking about it, a voice seemed to come out of a crucifix in the room, and warn the meeting to be of his opinion. This was some juggling of Dunstan's, and was probably his own voice disguised. But he played off a worse juggle than that soon afterwards, for another meeting being held on the same subject, and he and his supporters being seated on one side of a great room, and their opponents on the other, he rose and said, To Christ himself, as judge, do I commit this cause. Immediately on these words being spoken, the floor where the opposite party sat gave way, and some were killed and many wounded. You may be pretty sure that it had been weakened under Dunstan's direction, and that it fell at Dunstan's signal. His part of the floor did not go down. No, no, he was too good a workman for that. When he died, the monks settled that he was a saint, and called him Saint Dunstan ever afterwards. They might just as well have settled that he was a coach-horse, and could just as easily have called him one. 
Ethelred the Unready was glad enough, I dare say, to be rid of this holy saint, but left to himself, he was a poor, weak king, and his reign was a reign of defeat and shame. The restless Danes, led by Svein, a son of the king of Denmark, who had quarrelled with his father, and had been banished from home, again came into England, and year after year attacked and despoiled large towns. To coax these sea-kings away, the weak Ethelred paid them money, but the more money he paid, the more money the Danes wanted. At first he gave them ten thousand pounds. On their next invasion, sixteen thousand pounds. On their next invasion, four and twenty thousand pounds, to pay which large sums the unfortunate English people were heavily taxed. But as the Danes still came back and wanted more, he thought it would be a good plan to marry into some powerful foreign family that would help him with soldiers. So in the year 1002 he courted and married Emma, the sister of Richard, Duke of Normandy, a lady who was called the Flower of Normandy. And now a terrible deed was done in England, the like of which was never done on English ground before or since. On the 13th of November, in pursuance of secret instructions sent by the king over the whole country, the inhabitants of every town and city armed, and murdered all the Danes who were their neighbors. Young and old, babies and soldiers, men and women, every Dane was killed. No doubt there were among them many ferocious men who had done the English great wrong, and whose pride and insolence in swaggering in the houses of the English, and insulting their wives and daughters, had become unbearable. But no doubt there were also among them many peaceful Christian Danes, who had married English women, and become like English men. They were all slain, even to Gunhilda, the sister of the King of Denmark, married to an English lord, who was first obliged to see the murder of her husband and her child, and then was killed herself. When the king of the sea-kings heard of this deed of blood, he swore that he would have a great revenge. He raised an army, and a mightier fleet of ships than ever yet had sailed to England. And in all his army there was not a slave or an old man, but every soldier was a free man, and the son of a free man, and in the prime of life, and sworn to be revenged upon the English nation for the massacre of that dread 13th of November, when his countrymen and countrywomen and the little children whom they loved were killed with fire and sword. And so the sea kings came to England in many great ships, each bearing the flag of its own commander. Golden eagles, ravens, dragons, dolphins, beasts of prey, threatened England from the prows of those ships, as they came onward through the water, and were reflected in the shining shields that hung upon their sides. The ship that bore the standard of the king of the sea kings was carved and painted like a mighty serpent, and the king, in his anger, prayed that the gods in whom he trusted might all desert him, if his serpent did not strike its fangs into England's heart. And indeed it did, for the great army landing from the great fleet near Exeter went forward, laying England waste, and striking their lances in the earth as they advanced, or throwing them into rivers in token of their making all the island theirs. In remembrance of the black November night when the Danes were murdered, wheresoever the invaders came, they made the Saxons prepare and spread for them great feasts, and when they had eaten those feasts, and had drunk a curse to England with wild rejoicings, they drew their swords, and killed their Saxon entertainers, and marched on. For six long years they carried on this war, burning the crops, farmhouses, barns, mills, granaries, killing the laborers in the fields, preventing the seed from being sown in the ground, causing famine and starvation, leaving only heaps of ruin and smoking ashes, 
where they had found rich towns. To crown this misery, English officers and men deserted, and even the favorites of Ethelred the Unready, becoming traitors, seized many of the English ships, turned pirates against their own country, and aided by a storm, occasioned the loss of nearly the whole English navy. There was but one man of note at this miserable pass, who was true to his country and the feeble king. He was a priest, and a brave one. For twenty days the Archbishop of Canterbury defended that city against its Danish besiegers, and when a traitor in the town threw the gates open and admitted them, he said, in chains, I will not buy my life with money that must be extorted from the suffering people. Do with me what you please. Again and again he steadily refused to purchase his release with gold wrung from the poor. At last, the Danes being tired of this, and being assembled at a drunken merry-making, had him brought into the feasting hall. Now, Bishop, they said, we want gold. He looked round on the crowd of angry faces, from the shaggy beards close to him, to the shaggy beards against the walls, where men were mounted on tables and forms, to see him over the heads of others, and he knew that his time was come. "'I have no gold,' he said. "'Get it, Bishop,' they all thundered. "'That I have often told you I will not,' said he. They gathered closer round him, threatening, but he stood unmoved. Then one man struck him, then another. Then a cursing soldier picked up from a heap in a corner of the hall, where fragments had been rudely thrown at dinner, a great ox-bone, and cast it at his face, from which the blood came spurting forth. Then others ran to the same heap, and knocked him down with other bones, and bruised and battered him, until one soldier, whom he had baptized, willing, as I hope, for the sake of that soldier's soul, to shorten the sufferings of the good man, struck him dead with his battle-axe. If Ethelred had had the heart to emulate the courage of this noble archbishop, he might have done something yet. But he paid the Danes forty-eight thousand pounds instead, and gained so little by the cowardly act that Svein soon afterwards came over to subdue all England. So broken was the attachment of the English people by this time to their incapable king and their forlorn country, which could not protect them, that they welcomed Svein on all sides as a deliverer. London faithfully stood out, as long as the king was within its walls, but when he sneaked away, it also welcomed the Dane. Then all was over, and the king took refuge abroad with the Duke of Normandy, who had already given shelter to the king's wife, once the flower of that country, and to her children. Still, the English people, in spite of their sad sufferings, could not quite forget the great King Alfred and the Saxon race. When Svein died, suddenly, in little more than a month after he had been proclaimed King of England, they generously sent to Ethelred, to say that they would have him for their king again, if he would only govern them better than he had governed them before. The unready, instead of coming himself, sent Edward, one of his sons, to make promises for him. At last he followed, and the English declared him king. The Danes declared Canute, the son of Svein, king. Thus direful war began again, and lasted for three years, when the unready died. And I know of nothing better that he did, in all his reign of eight and thirty years. Was Canute to be king now? Not over the Saxons, they said. They must have Edmund, one of the sons of the unready, who was surnamed Ironside, because of his strength and stature. Edmund and Canute thereupon fell to, and fought five battles. O oh, unhappy England! What a fighting ground it was! And then Ironside, who was a big man, proposed to Canute, who was a little man, that they too should fight it out in single combat. 
If Canute had been the big man, he would probably have said yes. But being the little man, he decidedly said no. However, he declared that he was willing to divide the kingdom, to take all that lay north of Watling Street, as the old Roman military road from Dover to Chester was called, and to give Ironside all that lay south of it. Most men, being weary of so much bloodshed, this was done. But Canute soon became sole king of England, for Ironside died suddenly within two months. Some think that he was killed, and killed by Canute's orders. No one knows. End of chapter 4 Recording by Laura Koskinen Chapter 5 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Koskinen. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 5 England under Canute the Dane. Canute reigned eighteen years. He was a merciless king at first. After he had clasped the hands of the Saxon chiefs, in token of the sincerity with which he swore to be just and good to them in return for their acknowledging him, he denounced and slew many of them, as well as many relations of the late king. He who brings me the head of one of my enemies, he used to say, shall be dearer to me than a brother. And he was so severe in hunting down his enemies that he must have got together a pretty large family of these dear brothers. He was strongly inclined to kill Edmund and Edward, two children, sons of poor Ironside. But being afraid to do so in England, he sent them over to the king of Sweden, with a request that the king would be so good as to dispose of them. If the king of Sweden had been like many, many other men of that day, he would have had their innocent throats cut, but he was a kind man, and brought them up tenderly. Normandy ran much in Canute's mind. In Normandy were the two children of the late king, Edward and Alfred by name, and their uncle the duke might one day claim the crown for them. But the duke showed so little inclination to do so now, that he proposed to Canute to marry his sister, the widow of the unready, who, being but a showy flower, and caring for nothing so much as becoming a queen again, left her children, and was wedded to him. Successful and triumphant, assisted by the valour of the English in his foreign wars, and with little strife to trouble him at home, Canute had a prosperous reign, and made many improvements. He was a poet, and a musician. He grew sorry, as he grew older, for the blood he had shed at first, and went to Rome in a pilgrim's dress, by way of washing it out. He gave a great deal of money to foreigners on his journey, but he took it from the English before he started. On the whole, however, he certainly became a far better man, when he had no opposition to contend with, and was as great a king as England had known for some time. The old writers of history relate how that Canute was one day disgusted with his courtiers for their flattery, and how he caused his chair to be set on the seashore, and feigned to command the tide as it came up not to wet the edge of his robe, for the land was his. How the tide came up, of course, without regarding him, and how he then turned to his flatterers and rebuked them, saying, What was the might of any earthly king? to the might of the Creator, who could say unto the sea, Thus far shalt thou go, and no farther. We may learn from this, I think, that a little sense will go a long way in a king, and that courtiers are not easily cured of flattery, nor kings of a liking for it. If the courtiers of Canute had not known, long before, that the king was fond of flattery, they would have known better than to offer it in such large doses. And if they had not known that he was vain of this speech, 
anything but a wonderful speech, it seems to me, if a good child had made it, they would not have been at such great pains to repeat it. I fancy I see them all on the seashore together, the king's chair sinking in the sand, the king in a mighty good humour with his own wisdom, and the courtiers pretending to be quite stunned by it. It is not the sea alone that is bidden to go thus far and no farther. The great command goes forth to all the kings upon the earth, and went to Canute in the year 1035, and stretched him dead upon his bed. Beside it stood his Norman wife. Perhaps, as the king looked his last upon her, he, who had so often thought distrustfully of Normandy long ago, thought once more of the two exiled princes in their uncle's court, and of the little favour they could feel for either Danes or Saxons, and of a rising cloud in Normandy that slowly moved towards England. End of chapter 5 Recording by Laura Koskinen Chapter 6 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Koskinen. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 6 England under Harold Harefoot, Hardicanute, and Edward the Confessor. Canute left three sons, by name Svein, Harold, and Hardicanute. But his queen, Emma, once the flower of Normandy, was the mother of only Hardicanute. Canute had wished his dominions to be divided between the three, and had wished Harold to have England. But the Saxon people in the south of England, headed by a nobleman with great possessions, called the powerful Earl Godwin, who is said to have been originally a poor cowboy, opposed this, and desired to have instead either Hardicanute or one of the two exiled princes who were over in Normandy. It seemed so certain that there would be more bloodshed to settle this dispute that many people left their homes and took refuge in the woods and swamps. Happily, however, it was agreed to refer the whole question to a great meeting at Oxford which decided that Harold should have all the country north of the Thames, with London for his capital city, and that Hardicanute should have all the south. The quarrel was so arranged, and, as Hardicanute was in Denmark, troubling himself very little about anything but eating and getting drunk, his mother and Earl Godwin governed the south for him. They had hardly begun to do so, and the trembling people who had hidden themselves were scarcely at home again, when Edward, the elder of the two exiled princes, came over from Normandy with a few followers to claim the English crown. His mother Emma, however, who only cared for her last son Hardicanute, instead of assisting him, as he expected, opposed him so strongly with all her influence that he was very soon glad to get safely back. His brother Alfred was not so fortunate. Believing in an affectionate letter, written some time afterwards to him and his brother, in his mother's name, but whether really with or without his mother's knowledge is now uncertain, he allowed himself to be tempted over to England, with a good force of soldiers, and landing on the Kentish coast, and being met and welcomed by Earl Godwin, proceeded into Surrey, as far as the town of Guildford. Here, he and his men halted in the evening to rest, having still the earl in their company, who had ordered lodgings and good cheer for them. But in the dead of the night, when they were off their guard, being divided into small parties, sleeping soundly, after a long march and a plentiful supper in different houses, they were set upon by the king's troops, and taken prisoners. Next morning they were drawn out in a line, to the number of six hundred men, and were barbarously tortured and killed, with the exception of every tenth man who was sold into slavery. As to the wretched Prince Alfred, he was stripped naked, tied to a horse, 
and sent away into the Isle of Ely, where his eyes were torn out of his head, and where in a few days he miserably died. I am not sure that the Earl had willfully entrapped him, but I suspect it strongly. Harold was now king all over England, though it is doubtful whether the Archbishop of Canterbury, the greater part of the priests were Saxons and not friendly to the Danes, ever consented to crown him. Crowned or uncrowned, with the Archbishop's leave or without it, he was king for four years, after which short reign he died and was buried, having never done much in life but go a-hunting. He was such a fast runner at this, his favorite sport, that the people called him Harold Harefoot. Hardicanute was then at Bruges, in Flanders, plotting with his mother, who had gone over there after the cruel murder of Prince Alfred, for the invasion of England. The Danes and Saxons, finding themselves without a king, and dreading new disputes, made common cause and joined in inviting him to occupy the throne. He consented, and soon troubled them enough, for he brought over numbers of Danes, and taxed the people so insupportably to enrich those greedy favorites, that there were many insurrections, especially one at Worcester, where the citizens rose and killed his tax collectors, in revenge for which he burned their city. He was a brutal king, whose first public act was to order the dead body of poor Harold Harefoot to be dug up, beheaded, and thrown into the river. His end was worthy of such a beginning. He fell down drunk, with a goblet of wine in his hand, at a wedding feast at Lambeth, given in honor of the marriage of his standard-bearer, a Dane named Toad the Proud, and he never spoke again. Edward, afterwards called by the monks, the confessor, succeeded, and his first act was to oblige his mother Emma, who had favored him so little, to retire into the country, where she died some ten years afterwards. He was the exiled prince whose brother Alfred had been so foully killed. He had been invited over from Normandy by Hardicanute in the course of his short reign of two years, and had been handsomely treated at court. His cause was now favored by the powerful Earl Godwin, and he was soon made king. This earl had been suspected by the people, ever since Prince Alfred's cruel death. He had even been tried in the last reign for the prince's murder, but had been pronounced not guilty, chiefly, as it was supposed, because of a present he had made to the swinish king, of a gilded ship with a figurehead of solid gold, and a crew of eighty splendidly armed men. It was his interest to help the new king with his power, if the new king would help him against the popular distrust and hatred. So they made a bargain. Edward the Confessor got the throne. The Earl got more power and more land, and his daughter, Editha, was made queen, for it was a part of their compact that the king should take her for his wife. But although she was a gentle lady, in all things worthy to be beloved, good, beautiful, sensible, and kind, the king from the first neglected her. Her father and her six proud brothers, resenting this cold treatment, harassed the king greatly by exerting all their power to make him unpopular. Having lived so long in Normandy, he preferred the Normans to the English. He made a Norman archbishop and Norman bishops. His great officers and favorites were all Normans. He introduced the Norman fashions and the Norman language. In imitation of the state custom of Normandy, he attached a great seal to his state documents, instead of merely marking them, as the Saxon kings had done, with the sign of the cross, just as poor people who have never been taught to write now make the same mark for their names. All this the powerful Earl Godwin and his six proud sons represented to the people as disfavor shown towards the English, and thus they daily increased their own power, and daily diminished the power of the king. They were greatly helped by an event that occurred when he had reigned eight years. Eustace, Earl of Boulogne, 
who had married the king's sister, came to England on a visit. After staying at the court some time, he set forth, with his numerous train of attendants, to return home. They were to embark at Dover. Entering that peaceful town in armor, they took possession of the best houses, and noisily demanded to be lodged and entertained without payment. One of the bold men of Dover, who would not endure to have these domineering strangers jingling their heavy swords and iron corslets up and down his house, eating his meat and drinking his strong liquor, stood in his doorway and refused admission to the first armed man who came there. The armed man drew and wounded him. The man of Dover struck the armed man dead. Intelligence of what he had done, spreading through the streets to where the Count Eustace and his men were standing by their horses, bridle in hand, they passionately mounted, galloped to the house, surrounded it, forced their way in, the doors and windows being closed when they came up, and killed the man of Dover at his own fireside. They then clattered through the streets, cutting down and riding over men, women, and children. This did not last long, you may believe. The men of Dover set upon them, with great fury, killed nineteen of the foreigners, wounded many more, and, blockading the road to the port so that they should not embark, beat them out of the town by the way they had come. Hereupon Count Eustace rides as hard as man can ride to Gloucester, where Edward is, surrounded by Norman monks and Norman lords. Justice, cries the Count, upon the men of Dover, who have set upon and slain my people. The king sends immediately for the powerful Earl Godwin, who happens to be near, reminds him that Dover is under his government, and orders him to repair to Dover and do military execution on the inhabitants. It does not become you, says the proud earl in reply, to condemn without a hearing those whom you have sworn to protect. I will not do it. The king, therefore, summoned the earl on pain of banishment and loss of his titles and property, to appear before the court to answer this disobedience. The earl refused to appear. He, his eldest son Harold, and his second son Svein, hastily raised as many fighting men as their utmost power could collect, and demanded to have Count Eustace and his followers surrendered to the justice of the country. The king, in his turn, refused to give them up, and raised a strong force. After some treaty and delay, the troops of the great earl and his sons began to fall off. The earl, with a part of his family and abundance of treasure, sailed to Flanders. Harold escaped to Ireland, and the power of the great family was for that time gone in England. But the people did not forget them. Then Edward the Confessor, with the true meanness of a mean spirit, visited his dislike of the once powerful father and sons upon the helpless daughter and sister, his unoffending wife, whom all who saw her, her husband and his monks excepted, loved. He seized rapaciously upon her fortune and her jewels, and allowing her only one attendant, confined her in a gloomy convent, of which a sister of his, no doubt an unpleasant lady after his own heart, was abbess or jailer. Having got Earl Godwin and his six sons well out of his way, the king favoured the Normans more than ever. He invited over William, Duke of Normandy, the son of that duke who had received him and his murdered brother long ago, and of a peasant girl, a tanner's daughter, with whom that duke had fallen in love for her beauty as he saw her washing clothes in a brook. William, who was a great warrior, with a passion for fine horses, dogs, and arms, accepted the invitation, and the Normans in England, finding themselves more numerous than ever when he arrived with his retinue, and held in still greater honor at court than before, became more and more haughty towards the people, and were more and more disliked by them. The old Earl Godwin, though he was abroad, knew well how the people felt, for, with part of the treasure he had carried away with him, 
he kept spies and agents in his pay all over England. Accordingly, he thought the time was come for fitting out a great expedition against the Norman-loving king. With it he sailed to the Isle of Wight, where he was joined by his son Harold, the most gallant and brave of all his family. And so the father and son came sailing up the Thames to Southwark, great numbers of the people declaring for them, and shouting for the English Earl and the English Herald, against the Norman favourites. The king was at first as blind and stubborn as kings usually have been, whensoever they have been in the hands of monks. But the people rallied so thickly round the old earl and his son, and the old earl was so steady in demanding, without bloodshed, the restoration of himself and his family to their rights, that at last the court took the alarm. The Norman Archbishop of Canterbury, and the Norman Bishop of London, surrounded by their retainers, fought their way out of London, and escaped from Essex to France in a fishing boat. The other Norman favourites dispersed in all directions. The old earl and his sons, except Svein, who had committed crimes against the law, were restored to their possessions and dignities. Editha, the virtuous and lovely queen of the insensible king, was triumphantly released from her prison, the convent, and once more sat in her chair of state, arrayed in the jewels of which, when she had no champion to support her rights, her cold-blooded husband had deprived her. The old Earl Godwin did not long enjoy his restored fortune. He fell down in a fit at the king's table, and died upon the third day afterwards. Harold succeeded to his power, and to a far higher place in the attachment of the people than his father had ever held. By his valour he subdued the king's enemies in many bloody fights. He was vigorous against rebels in Scotland. This was the time when Macbeth slew Duncan, upon which event our English Shakespeare, hundreds of years afterwards, wrote his great tragedy, and he killed the restless Welsh King Griffith, and brought his head to England. What Harold was doing at sea, when he was driven on the French coast by a tempest, is not at all certain, nor does it at all matter. That his ship was forced by a storm on that shore, and that he was taken prisoner, there is no doubt. In those barbarous days all shipwrecked strangers were taken prisoners, and obliged to pay ransom. So a certain Count Guy, who was the lord of Ponthieu, where Harold's disaster happened, seized him, instead of relieving him like a hospitable and Christian lord as he ought to have done, and expected to make a very good thing of it. But Harold sent off immediately to Duke William of Normandy, complaining of this treatment, and the Duke no sooner heard of it than he ordered Harold to be escorted to the ancient town of Rouen, where he then was, and where he received him as an honoured guest. Now, some writers tell us that Edward the Confessor, who was by this time old and had no children, had made a will, appointing Duke William of Normandy his successor, and had informed the Duke of his having done so. There is no doubt that he was anxious about his successor, because he had even invited over from abroad Edward the Outlaw, a son of Ironside, who had come to England with his wife and three children but whom the king had strangely refused to see when he did come, and who had died in London suddenly. Princes were terribly liable to sudden death in those days, and had been buried in St. Paul's Cathedral. The king might possibly have made such a will, or, having always been fond of the Normans, he might have encouraged Norman William to aspire to the English crown, by something that he said to him when he was staying at the English court but certainly William did now aspire to it, and knowing that Harold would be a powerful rival, he called together a great assembly of his nobles, offered Harold his daughter Adele in marriage, informed him that he meant on King Edward's death to claim the English crown as his own inheritance, and required Harold then and there to swear to aid him. Harold, being in the duke's power, 
took this oath upon the missal, or prayer-book. It is a good example of the superstitions of the monks, that this missal, instead of being placed upon a table, was placed upon a tub, which, when Harold had sworn, was uncovered and shown to be full of dead men's bones, bones, as the monks pretended, of saints. This was supposed to make Harold's oath a great deal more impressive and binding, as if the great name of the Creator of heaven and earth could be made more solemn by a knuckle-bone, or a double-tooth, or a finger-nail of Dunstan. Within a week or two, after Harold's return to England, the dreary old confessor was found to be dying. After wandering in his mind like a very weak old man, he died. As he had put himself entirely in the hands of the monks when he was alive, they praised him lustily when he was dead. They had gone so far already, as to persuade him that he could work miracles, and had brought people afflicted with a bad disorder of the skin to him to be touched and cured. This was called touching for the king's evil, which afterwards became a royal custom. You know, however, who really touched the sick and healed them, and you know his sacred name is not among the dusty line of human kings. End of chapter 6 Recording by Laura Koskinen Chapter 7 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura Koskinen. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 7 England under Harold the Second and Conquered by the Normans. Harold was crowned King of England on the very day of the maudlin confessor's funeral. He had good need to be quick about it. When the news reached Norman William, hunting in his park at Rouen, he dropped his bow, returned to his palace, called his nobles to council, and presently sent ambassadors to Harold, calling on him to keep his oath and resign the crown. Harold would do no such thing. The barons of France leagued together round Duke William for the invasion of England. Duke William promised freely to distribute English wealth and English lands among them. The Pope sent to Normandy a consecrated banner, and a ring containing a hair, which he warranted to have grown on the head of St. Peter. He blessed the enterprise, and cursed Harold, and requested that the Normans would pay Peter's pence, or a tax to himself of a penny a year on every house, a little more regularly in future, if they could make it convenient. King Harold had a rebel brother in Flanders, who was a vassal of Harold Hardrada, king of Norway. This brother and this Norwegian king, joining their forces against England with Duke William's help, won a fight in which the English were commanded by two nobles, and then besieged York. Harold, who was waiting for the Normans on the coast at Hastings, with his army, marched to Stamford Bridge upon the river Derwent to give them instant battle. He found them drawn up in a hollow circle, marked out by their shining spears. Riding round this circle at a distance to survey it, he saw a brave figure on horseback, in a blue mantle and a bright helmet, whose horse suddenly stumbled and threw him. "'Who is that man who has fallen?' Harold asked of one of his captains. "'The king of Norway,' he replied. "'He is a tall and stately king,' said Harold. "'But his end is near.' He added, in a little while, "'Go yonder to my brother and tell him, "'if he withdraw his troops, "'he shall be Earl of Northumberland "'and rich and powerful in England.' The captain rode away, and gave the message. "'What will he give to my friend, the King of Norway?' asked the brother. Seven feet of earth for a grave,' replied the captain. "'No more,' returned the brother with a smile. 
"'The king of Norway being a tall man, perhaps a little more,' replied the captain. "'Ride back,' said the brother, "'and tell King Harold to make ready for the fight.' He did so very soon, and such a fight King Harold led against that force that his brother and the Norwegian king, and every chief of note in all their host, except the Norwegian king's son Olaf, to whom he gave honorable dismissal, were left dead upon the field. The victorious army marched to York. As King Harold sat there, at the feast, in the midst of all his company, a stir was heard at the doors, and messengers, all covered with mire, from riding far and fast through broken ground, came hurrying in, to report that the Normans had landed in England. The intelligence was true. They had been tossed about by contrary winds, and some of their ships had been wrecked. A part of their own shore, to which they had been driven back, was strewn with Norman bodies. But they had once more made sail, led by the Duke's own galley, a present from his wife, upon the prow whereof the figure of a golden boy stood pointing towards England. By day, the banner of the three lions of Normandy, the diverse colored sails, the gilded bands, the many decorations of this gorgeous ship, had glittered in the sun and sunny water. By night, a light had sparkled like a star at her masthead, and now, encamped near Hastings, with their leader lying in the old Roman castle of Pevensey, the English retiring in all directions, the land for miles around scorched and smoking, fired and pillaged, was the whole Norman power, hopeful and strong on English ground. Harold broke up the feast and hurried to London. Within a week his army was ready. He sent out spies to ascertain the Norman strength. William took them, caused them to be led through his whole camp, and then dismissed. The Normans, said these spies to Harold, are not bearded on the upper lip as we English are, but are shorn. They are priests. My men, replied Harold with a laugh, will find those priests good soldiers. The Saxons reported Duke William's outposts of Norman soldiers, who were instructed to retire as King Harold's army advanced, rush on us through their pillaged country with the fury of madmen. Let them come, and come soon, said Duke William. Some proposals for a reconciliation were made, but were soon abandoned. In the middle of the month of October, in the year 1066, the Normans and the English came front to front. All night the armies lay encamped before each other, in a part of the country then called Senlac, now called, in remembrance of them, Battle. With the first dawn of the day they arose. There in the faint light were the English on a hill, a wood behind them, in their midst the royal banner, representing a fighting warrior woven in gold thread, adorned with precious stones. Beneath the banner, as it rustled in the wind, stood King Harold on foot, with two of his remaining brothers by his side. Around them, still and silent as the dead, clustered the whole English army. Every soldier covered by his shield, and bearing in his hand his dreaded English battle-axe. On an opposite hill, in three lines, archers, foot-soldiers, horsemen, was the Norman force. Of a sudden a great battle-cry, God help us, burst from the Norman lines. The English answered with their own battle-cry, God's rude, holy rude. The Normans then came sweeping down the hill to attack the English. There was one tall Norman knight who rode before the Norman army on a prancing horse, throwing up his heavy sword and catching it, and singing of the bravery of his countrymen. An English knight, who rode out from the English force to meet him, fell by this knight's hand. Another English knight rode out, and he fell too. But then a third rode out, and killed the Norman. This was in the first beginning of the fight. 
It soon raged everywhere. The English, keeping side by side in a great mass, cared no more for the showers of Norman arrows than if they had been showers of Norman rain. When the Norman horsemen rode against them, with their battle-axes they cut men and horses down. The Normans gave way. The English pressed forward. A cry went forth among the Norman troops that Duke William was killed. Duke William took off his helmet, in order that his face might be distinctly seen, and rode along the line before his men. This gave them courage. As they turned again to face the English, some of their Norman horse divided the pursuing body of the English from the rest, and thus all that foremost portion of the English army fell, fighting bravely. The main body still remaining firm, heedless of the Norman arrows, and with their battle-axes cutting down the crowds of horsemen when they rode up, like forests of young trees, Duke William pretended to retreat. The eager English followed. The Norman army closed again, and fell upon them with great slaughter. Still, said Duke William, there are thousands of the English, firm as rocks around their king. Shoot upward, Norman archers, that your arrows may fall down upon their faces. The sun rose high, and sank, and the battle still raged. Through all the wild October day, the clash and din resounded in the air. In the red sunset, and in the white moonlight, heaps upon heaps of dead men lay strewn, a dreadful spectacle, all over the ground. King Harold, wounded with an arrow in the eye, was nearly blind. His brothers were already killed. Twenty Norman knights, whose battered armor had flashed fiery and golden in the sunshine all day long, and now looked silvery in the moonlight, dashed forward to seize the royal banner from the English knights and soldiers, still faithfully collected round their blinded king. The king received a mortal wound and dropped. The English broke and fled. The Normans rallied, and the day was lost. Oh, what a sight beneath the moon and stars! When lights were shining in the tent of the victorious Duke William, which was pitched near the spot where Harold fell, and he and his knights were carousing within, and soldiers with torches, going slowly to and fro without, sought for the corpse of Harold among piles of dead, and the warrior, worked in golden thread and precious stones, lay low, all torn and soiled with blood, and the three Norman lions kept watch over the field. End of chapter 7 Recording by Laura Koskinen Chapter 8 of A Child's History of England This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens Chapter 8 England under William I, the Norman Conqueror Upon the ground where brave Harold fell, William the Norman afterwards founded an abbey, which, under the name of Battle Abbey, was a rich and splendid place through many a troubled year, though now it is a grey ruin overgrown with ivy. But the first work he had to do was to conquer the English thoroughly, and that, as you know by this time, was hard work for any man. He ravaged several counties, he burned and plundered many towns, he laid waste scores upon scores of miles of pleasant country, he destroyed innumerable lives. At length Stigand, Archbishop of Canterbury, with other representatives of the clergy and people, went to his camp and submitted to him. Edgar, the insignificant son of Edmund Ironside, was proclaimed king by others, but nothing came of it. He fled to Scotland afterwards, where his sister, who was young and beautiful, married the Scottish king. Edgar himself was not important enough for anybody to care much about him. On Christmas Day, William was crowned in Westminster Abbey, under the title of William I but he is best known as William the Conqueror. It was a strange coronation. 
one of the bishops who performed the ceremony asked the Normans in French if they would have Duke William for their king. They answered yes. Another of the bishops put the same question to the Saxons in English. They too answered yes with a loud shout. The noise being heard by a guard of Norman horse soldiers outside was mistaken for resistance on the part of the English. The guard instantly set fire to the neighboring houses, and a tumult ensued, in the midst of which the king, being left alone in the abbey with a few priests, and they all being in a terrible fright together, was hurriedly crowned. When the crown was placed upon his head, he swore to govern the English as well as the best of their own monarchs. I dare say you think, as I do, that if we accept the great Alfred, he might pretty easily have done that. Numbers of the English nobles had been killed in the last disastrous battle. Their estates, and the estates of all the nobles who had fought against him there, King William seized upon, and gave to his own Norman knights and nobles. Many great English families of the present time acquired their English lands in this way, and are very proud of it. But what is got by force must be maintained by force. These nobles were obliged to build castles all over England to defend their new property, and do what he would the king could neither soothe nor quell the nation as he wished. He gradually introduced the Norman language and the Norman customs, yet for a long time the great body of the English remained sullen and revengeful. On his going over to Normandy to visit his subjects there, the oppressions of his half-brother Odo, whom he left in charge of his English kingdom, drove the people mad. The men of Kent even invited over to take possession of Dover their old enemy Count Eustace of Boulogne, who had led the fray when the Dover man was slain at his own fireside. The men of Hereford, aided by the Welsh, and commanded by a chief named Edric the Wild, drove the Normans out of their country. Some of those who had been dispossessed of their lands banded together in the north of England, some in Scotland, some in the thick woods and marshes, and whensoever they could fall upon the Normans, or upon the English who had submitted to the Normans, they fought, despoiled, and murdered, like the desperate outlaws that they were. Conspiracies were set on foot for a general massacre of the Normans, like the old massacre of the Danes. In short, the English were in a murderous mood all through the kingdom. King William, fearing he might lose his conquest, came back, and tried to pacify the London people by soft words. He then set forth to repress the country people by stern deeds, among the towns which he besieged, and where he killed and maimed the inhabitants without any distinction, sparing none, young or old, armed or unarmed, were Oxford, Warwick, Leicester, Nottingham, Derby, Lincoln, York. In all these places, and in many others, fire and sword worked their utmost horrors, and made the land dreadful to behold. The streams and rivers were discoloured with blood, the sky was blackened with smoke, the fields were wastes of ashes, the waysides were heaped up with dead. Such are the fatal results of conquest and ambition. Although William was a harsh and angry man, I do not suppose that he deliberately meant to work this shocking ruin when he invaded England. But what he had got by the strong hand, he could only keep by the strong hand, and in so doing he made England a great grave. Two sons of Harold, by the name Edmund and Godwin, came over from Ireland, with some ships against the Normans, but were defeated. This was scarcely done when the outlaws in the woods so harassed York that the governor sent to the king for help. The king dispatched a general and a large force to occupy the town of Durham. The bishop of that place met the general outside the town and warned him not to enter, as he would be in danger there. The general cared nothing for the warning and went in with all his men. That night on every hill within sight of Durham signal fires were seen to blaze. When the morning dawned, the English, who had assembled in great strength, forced the gates, rushed into the town, and slew the Normans every one. The English afterwards besought the Danes to come and help them. The Danes came with two hundred and forty ships. The outlawed nobles joined them. They captured York, and drove the Normans out of that city. Then William bribed the Danes to go away, and took such vengeance on the English that all the former fire and sword, smoke and ashes, death and ruin, were nothing compared with it. In melancholy songs and doleful stories, it was still sung and told by cottage fires on winter evenings, a hundred years afterwards, how, in those dreadful days of the Normans, there was not, from the River Humber to the River Tyne, one inhabited village left, nor one cultivated field. 
how there was nothing but a dismal ruin, where the human creatures and the beasts lay dead together. The outlaws had at this time what they called a camp of refuge, in the midst of the fens of Cambridgeshire. Protected by those marshy grounds which were difficult of approach, they lay among the reeds and rushes, and were hidden by the mists that rose up from the watery earth. Now there was also at that time over the sea in Flanders an Englishman named Hereward, whose father had died in his absence, and whose property had been given to a Norman. When he heard of this wrong that had been done him, from such of the exiled English as chanced to wander into that country, he longed for revenge, and joining the outlaws in their camp of refuge became their commander. He was so good a soldier that the Normans supposed him to be aided by enchantment. William, even after he had made a road three miles in length across the Cambridgeshire marshes, on purpose to attack this supposed enchanter, thought it necessary to engage an old lady, who pretended to be a sorceress, to come and do a little enchantment in the royal cause. For this purpose she was pushed on before the troops in a wooden tower. But Hereward very soon disposed of this unfortunate sorceress, by burning her tower and all. The monks of the convent of Eli near at hand, however, who were fond of good living, and who found it very uncomfortable to have the country blockaded and their supplies of meat and drink cut off, showed the king a secret way of surprising the camp. So Hereward was soon defeated. Whether he afterwards died quietly, or whether he was killed after killing sixteen of the men who attacked him, as some old rhymes relate that he did, I cannot say. His defeat put an end to the camp of refuge, and very soon afterwards the king, victorious both in Scotland and in England, quelled the last rebellious English noble. He then surrounded himself with Norman lords, enriched by the property of the English nobles, had a great survey made of all the land in England, which was entered as the property of its new owners, on a roll called the Doomsday Book, it obliged the people to put out their fires and candles at a certain hour every night, on the ringing of a bell which was called the curfew, introduced the Norman dresses and manners, made the Normans masters everywhere, and the English servants, turned out the English bishops, and put Normans in their places and showed himself to be the conqueror indeed. But even with his own Normans he had a restless life. They were always hungering and thirsting for the riches of the English, and the more he gave the more they wanted. His priests were as greedy as his soldiers. We know of only one Norman who plainly told his master, the king, that he had come with him to England to do his duty as a faithful servant, and that property taken by force from other men had no charms for him. His name was Guibert. We should not forget his name, for it is good to remember and to honour honest men. Besides all these troubles, William the Conqueror was troubled by quarrels among his sons. He had three living. Robert, called Curthose because of his short legs. William, called Rufus, or the Red, from the colour of his hair. And Henry, fond of learning, and called in the Norman language Beauclerc, or Fine Scholar. When Robert grew up, he asked of his father the government of Normandy, which he had nominally possessed as a child under his mother Matilda. The king refusing to grant it, Robert became jealous and discontented, and happening one day well in this temper to be ridiculed by his brothers, who threw water on him from a balcony as he was walking before the door, he drew his sword, rushed upstairs, and was only prevented by the king himself from putting them to death. That same night he hotly departed with some followers from his father's court and endeavoured to take the castle of Rouen by surprise. Failing in this, he shut himself up in another castle in Normandy, which the king besieged, and where Robert one day unhorsed and nearly killed him without knowing who he was. His submission when he discovered his father, and the intercession of the queen and others, reconciled them, but not soundly, for Robert soon strayed abroad and went from court to court with his complaints. He was a gay, careless, thoughtless fellow, spending all he got on musicians and dancers. But his mother loved him, and often, against the king's command, supplied him with money through a messenger named Samson. At length the incensed king swore he would tear out Samson's eyes, and Samson, thinking that his only hope of safety was in becoming a monk, became one, and went on such errands no more, and kept his eyes in his head. All this time, from the turbulent day of his strange coronation, the conqueror had been struggling, you see, at any cost of cruelty and bloodshed, to maintain what he had seized. All his reign he struggled still, with the same object ever before him. He was a stern, bold man, and he succeeded in it. He loved money, and was particular in his eating. 
but he had only leisure to indulge one other passion, and that was his love of hunting. He carried it to such a height that he ordered whole villages and towns to be swept away to make forests for the deer. Not satisfied with sixty-eight royal forests, he laid waste to an immense district to form another in Hampshire called the New Forest. The many thousands of miserable peasants who saw their little houses pulled down, and themselves and children turned into the open country without a shelter, detested him for his merciless addition to their many sufferings. And when, in the twenty-first year of his reign, which proved to be the last, he went over to Rouen, England was as full of hatred against him as if every leaf on every tree in all his royal forests had been a curse upon his head. In the new forest his son Richard, for he had four sons, had been gored to death by a stag, and the people said that this cruelly made forest would yet be fatal to others of the conqueror's race. He was engaged in a dispute with the king of France about some territory. While he stayed at Rouen, negotiating with that king, he kept his bed and took medicines, being advised by his physicians to do so, on account of having grown to an unwieldy size. Word being brought to him that the king of France made light of this, and joked about it, he swore in a great rage that he should rue his jests. He assembled his army, marched into the disputed territory, burnt his old way, the vines, the crops, and fruit, and set the town of Mantes on fire. But in an evil hour, for as he rode over the hot ruins, his horse, setting his hoofs upon some burning embers, started, threw him forward against the pommel of the saddle, and gave him a mortal hurt. For six weeks he lay dying in a monastery near Rouen, and then made his will giving England to William, Normandy to Robert, and five thousand pounds to Henry. And now his violent deeds lay heavy on his mind. He ordered money to be given to many English churches and monasteries, and, which was much better repentance, released his prisoners of state, some of whom had been confined in his dungeons twenty years. It was a September morning, and the sun was rising, when the king was awakened from slumber by the sound of a church bell. "'What bell is that?' he faintly asked. They told him it was the bell of the chapel of St. Mary. "'I commend my soul,' said he, "'to Mary,' and died." Think of his name, the Conqueror, and then consider how he lay in death. The moment he was dead, his physicians, priests, and nobles, not knowing what contest for the throne might now take place, or what might happen in it, hastened away, each man for himself and his own property. The mercenary servants of the court began to rob and plunder. The body of the king, in the indecent strife, was rolled from the bed, and lay alone for hours upon the ground. O conqueror, of whom so many great names are proud now, of whom so many great names thought nothing then, it were better to have conquered one true heart than England. By and by the priests came creeping in with prayers and candles, and a good knight named Herr Luen undertook, which no one else would do, to convey the body to Cain, in Normandy, in order that it might be buried in St. Stephen's Church there, which the conqueror had founded. But fire, of which he had made such bad use in his life, seemed to follow him of itself in death. A great conflagration broke out in the town when the body was placed in the church, and those present running out to extinguish the flames, it was once again left alone. It was not even buried in peace. It was about to be let down in its royal robes into a tomb near the high altar, in presence of a great concourse of people, when a loud voice in the crowd cried out, This ground is mine! Upon it stood my father's house. This king despoiled me of both ground and house to build this church. In the great name of God I here forbid his body to be covered with the earth that is my right. The priests and bishops present, knowing the speaker's right, and knowing that the king had often denied him justice, paid him down sixty shillings for the grave. Even then the corpse was not at rest. The tomb was too small, and they tried to force it in. It broke. A dreadful smell arose, and the people hurried out into the air, and for the third time it was left alone. Where were the conqueror's three sons that they were not at their father's burial? Robert was lounging among minstrels, dancers, and gamesters in France or Germany. Henry was carrying his five thousand pounds safely away in a convenient chest he had got made. William the Red was hurrying to England to lay hands upon the royal treasure and the crown. End of chapter 8
Chapter 9 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 9 England under William the Second, called Rufus. William the Red, in breathless haste, secured the three great forts of Dover, Pevensey, and Hastings and made with hot speed for Winchester, where the royal treasure was kept. The treasurer delivering him the keys, he found that it amounted to sixty thousand pounds in silver, besides gold and jewels. Possessed of this wealth, he soon persuaded the Archbishop of Canterbury to crown him, and became William the Second, King of England. Rufus was no sooner on the throne than he ordered into prison again the unhappy state captives whom his father had set free and directed a goldsmith to ornament his father's tomb profusely with gold and silver. It would have been more dutiful in him to have attended the sick conqueror when he was dying, but England itself, like this red king who once governed it, has sometimes made expensive tombs for dead men whom it treated shabbily when they were alive. The king's brother, Robert of Normandy, seemed quite content to be only duke of that country, and the king's other brother, fine scholar, being quiet enough with his five thousand pounds in a chest, the king flattered himself, we may suppose, with the hope of an easy reign. But easy reigns were difficult to have in those days. The turbulent Bishop Odo, who had blessed the Norman army at the Battle of Hastings, and who I dare say took all the credit of the victory to himself, soon began, in concert with some powerful Norman nobles, to trouble the Red King. The truth seems to be that this bishop and his friends, who had land in England and lands in Normandy, wished to hold both under one sovereign, and greatly preferred a thoughtless, good-natured person such as Robert was, to Rufus, who, though being far from an amiable man in any respect, was keen and not to be imposed upon. They declared in Robert's favour and retired to their castles, those castles were very troublesome to kings, in a sullen humour. The Red King, seeing the Normans thus falling from him, revenged himself upon them by appealing to the English to whom he made a variety of promises, which he never meant to perform, in particular promises to soften the cruelty of the forest laws, and who in return so aided him with their valour, that Odo was besieged in the castle of Rochester, and forced to abandon it, and to depart from England for ever, whereupon the other rebellious Norman nobles were soon reduced and scattered. Then the Red King went over to Normandy, where the people suffered greatly under the loose rule of Duke Robert. The king's object was to seize upon the duke's dominions. This the duke, of course, prepared to resist, and miserable war between the two brothers seemed inevitable, when the powerful nobles on both sides, who had seen so much of war, interfered to prevent it. A treaty was made. Each of the two brothers agreed to give up something of his claims, and that the longer liver of the two should inherit all the dominions of the other. When they had come to this loving understanding, they embraced and joined their forces against fine scholar, who had bought some territory of Robert with a part of his five thousand pounds, and was considered a dangerous individual in consequence. St. Michael's Mount in Normandy, there is another St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall, wonderfully like it, was then, as it is now, a strong place perched upon the top of a high rock, around which, when the tide is in, the sea flows, leaving no road to the mainland. In this place, fine scholars shut himself up with his soldiers, and here he was closely besieged by his two brothers. At one time, when he was reduced to great distress for want of water, the generous Robert not only permitted his men to get water, but sent fine scholar wine from his own table, and, on being remonstrated with by the Red King, said, What, shall we let our own brother die of thirst? Where shall we get another when he is gone? At another time, the Red King, riding alone on the shore of the bay, looking up at the castle, was taken by two of fine scholar's men, one of whom was about to kill him, when he cried out, Hold, knave, I am the King of England. The story says that the soldier raised him from the ground respectfully and humbly, and that the king took him into his service. The story may or may not be true, but at any rate it is true that fine scholar could not hold out against his united brothers, and that he abandoned Mount St. Michael, and wandered about, as poor and forlorn as other scholars have been sometimes known to be. The Scotch became unquiet in the Red King's time, and were twice defeated, the second time with the loss of their king, Malcolm, and his son. The Welsh became unquiet, too, 
Against them, Rufus was less successful, for they fought among their native mountains, and did great execution on the king's troops. Robert of Normandy became unquiet too, and complaining that his brother the king did not faithfully perform his part of their agreement, took up arms, and obtained assistance from the king of France, whom Rufus, in the end, bought off with vast sums of money. England became unquiet too. Lord Mowbray, the powerful Earl of Northumberland, headed a great conspiracy to depose the king, and to place upon the throne Stephen, the conqueror's near relative. The plot was discovered. All the chief conspirators were seized. Some were fined, some were put in prison, and some were put to death. The Earl of Northumberland himself was shut up in a dungeon beneath Windsor Castle, where he died an old man thirty long years afterwards. The priests in England were more unquiet than any other class or power, for the Red King treated them with such small ceremony that he refused to appoint new bishops or archbishops when the old ones died, but kept all the wealth belonging to those offices in his own hands. In return for this, the priests wrote his life when he was dead, and abused him well. I am inclined to think, myself, that there was little to choose between the priests and the Red King, that both sides were greedy and designing, and that they were fairly matched. The Red King was false of heart, selfish, covetous, and mean. He had a worthy minister in his favorite, Ralph, nicknamed, for almost every famous person had a nickname in those rough days, Flambard, or the Firebrand. Once, the king being ill, became penitent, and made Anselm, a foreign priest and a good man, Archbishop of Canterbury. But he no sooner got well again than he repented of his repentance, and persisted in wrongfully keeping to himself some of the wealth belonging to the archbishopric. This led to violent disputes, which were aggravated by there being in Rome at that time two rival popes, each of whom declared he was the only real, original, infallible pope, who couldn't make a mistake. At last, Anselm, knowing the Red King's character, and not feeling himself safe in England, asked leave to return abroad. The Red King gladly gave it, for he knew that as soon as Anselm was gone, he could begin to store up all the Canterbury money again, for his own use. By such means, and by taxing and oppressing the English people in every possible way, the Red King became very rich. When he wanted money for any purpose, he raised it by some means or other, and cared nothing for the injustice he did, or the misery he caused. Having the opportunity of buying from Robert the whole Duchy of Normandy for five years, he taxed the English people more than ever, and made the very convents sell their plate and valuables to supply him with the means to make the purchase. But he was as quick and eager in putting down revolt as he was in raising money, for a part of the Norman people objecting, very naturally, I think, to being sold in this way, he headed an army against them with all the speed and energy of his father. He was so impatient that he embarked for Normandy in a great gale of wind, and when the sailors told him it was dangerous to go to sea in such angry weather, he replied, Hoist and sail away! Did you ever hear of a king who was drowned? You will wonder how it was that even the careless Robert came to sell his dominions. It happened thus. It had long been the custom for many English people to make journeys to Jerusalem, which were called pilgrimages, in order that they might pray beside the tomb of our Saviour there. Jerusalem belonging to the Turks, and the Turks hating Christianity, these Christian travellers were often insulted and ill-used. The pilgrims bore it patiently for some time, but at length a remarkable man of great earnestness and eloquence, called Peter the Hermit, began to preach in various places against the Turks, and to declare that it was the duty of good Christians to drive away those unbelievers from the tomb of our Saviour, and to take possession of it and protect it. An excitement such as the world had never known before was created. Thousands and thousands of men of all ranks and conditions departed for Jerusalem to make war against the Turks. This war is called in history the First Crusade, and every crusader wore a cross marked on his right shoulder. All the crusaders were not zealous Christians. Among them were vast numbers of the restless, idle, profligate, and adventurous spirit of the time. Some became crusaders for the love of change, some in hope of plunder, some because they had nothing to do at home, some because they did what the priests told them, some because they liked to see foreign countries, some because they were fond of knocking men about, and would as soon knock a Turk about as a Christian. Robert of Normandy may have been influenced by all these motives, and by a kind desire, besides, to save the Christian pilgrims from bad treatment in the future. He wanted to raise a number of armed men, 
and to go to the crusade. He could not do so without money. He had no money, and he sold his dominions to his brother, the Red King, for five years. With the large sum he thus obtained, he fitted out his crusaders gallantly, and went away to Jerusalem in martial state. The Red King, who made money out of everything, stayed at home, busily squeezing more money out of Normans and English. After three years of great hardship and suffering, from shipwreck at sea, from travel in strange lands, from hunger, thirst, and fever upon the burning sands of the desert, and from the fury of the Turks, the valiant crusaders got possession of our Saviour's tomb. The Turks were still resisting and fighting bravely, but this success increased the general desire in Europe to join the crusade. Another great French duke was proposing to sell his dominions for a term to the rich Red King, when the Red King's reign came to a sudden and violent end. You have not forgotten the new forest which the conqueror made, and which the miserable people whose homes he laid waste so hated. The cruelty of the forest laws, and the torture and death they brought upon the peasantry, increased this hatred. The poor persecuted country people believed that the new forest was enchanted. They said that in thunderstorms and on dark nights demons appeared, moving beneath the branches of the gloomy trees. They said that a terrible spectre had foretold to Norman hunters that the Red King should be punished there. And now, in the pleasant season of May, when the Red King had reigned almost thirteen years, and a second prince of the conqueror's blood, another Richard, the son of Duke Robert, was killed by an arrow in this dreaded forest, the people said that the second time was not the last, and that there was another death to come. It was a lonely forest, accursed in the people's hearts for the wicked deeds that had been done to make it and no man save the king and his courtiers and huntsmen liked to stray there. But in reality it was like any other forest. In the spring the green leaves broke out of the buds. In the summer flourished hardily, and made deep shades. In the winter shriveled and blew down, and lay in brown heaps on the moss. Some trees were stately and grew high and strong. Some had fallen of themselves. Some were felled by the forester's axe. Some were hollow, and the rabbits burrowed at their roots. Some few were struck by lightning and stood white and bare. There were hillsides covered with rich fern, on which the morning dew so beautifully sparkled. There were brooks where the deer went down to drink, or over which the whole herd bounded, flying from the arrows of the huntsmen. There were sunny glades and solemn places where but little light came through the rustling leaves. The songs of the birds in the new forest were pleasanter to hear than the shouts of fighting men outside and even when the Red King and his court came hunting through its solitudes, cursing loud and riding hard, with a jingling of stirrups and bridles and knives and daggers, they did much less harm there than among the English or Normans, and the stags died, as they lived, far easier than the people. Upon a day in August, the Red King, now reconciled to his brother, Fine Scholar, came with a great train to hunt in the new forest. Fine Scholar was of the party. They were a merry party, and had lain all night at Melwood Keep, a hunting lodge in the forest, where they had made good cheer both at supper and breakfast, and had drunk a deal of wine. The party dispersed in various directions, as the custom of the hunters then was. The king took with him only Sir Walter Tyrrell, who was a famous sportsman, and to whom he had given, before they mounted horse that morning, two fine arrows. The last time the king was ever seen alive, he was riding with Sir Walter Tyrrell, and their dogs were hunting together. It was almost night when a poor charcoal burner, passing through the forest with his cart, came upon the solitary body of a dead man, shot with an arrow in the breast, and still bleeding. He got it into his cart. It was the body of the king, shaken and tumbled with its red beard, all whitened with lime and clotted with blood. It was driven in the cart by the charcoal burner next day to Winchester Cathedral, where it was received and buried. Sir Walter Tyrrell, who escaped to Normandy, and claimed the protection of the King of France, swore in France that the Red King was suddenly shot dead by an arrow from an unseen hand while they were hunting together, that he was fearful of being suspected as the King's murderer, and that he instantly set spurs to horse and fled to the seashore. Others declared that the King and Sir Walter Tyrrell were hunting in company, a little before sunset, standing in bushes opposite one another when a stag came between them, that the King drew his bow and took aim, but the string broke, that the king then cried, Shoot, Walter, in the devil's name, that Sir Walter shot, that the arrow glanced against a tree, was turned aside from the stag, 
and struck the king from his horse dead. By whose hand the red king really fell, and whether that hand dispatched the arrow to his breast by accident or by design, is only known to God. Some think his brother may have caused him to be killed, but the red king had made so many enemies both among priests and people that suspicion may reasonably rest upon a less unnatural murderer. Men know no more than that he was found dead in the new forest, which the suffering people had regarded as a doomed ground for his race. End of chapter 9、Chapter 10 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jennings. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 10 England under Henry I, called Fine Scholar. Fine Scholar, on hearing of the Red King's death, hurried to Winchester with as much speed as Rufus himself had made to seize the royal treasure. But the keeper of the treasure, who had been one of the hunting party in the forest, made haste to Winchester too. And arriving there at about the same time, refused to yield it up. Upon this, Fine Scholar drew his sword and threatened to kill the treasurer, who might have paid for his fidelity with his life, but that he knew longer resistance to be useless when he found the prince supported by a company of powerful barons, who declared they were determined to make him king. The treasurer, therefore, gave up the money and jewels of the crown, and on the third day after the death of the Red King, being a Sunday, Fine Scholar stood before the high altar in Westminster Abbey, and made a solemn declaration that he would resign the church property which his brother had seized, that he would do no wrong to the nobles, and that he would restore to the people the laws of Edward the Confessor, with all the improvements of William the Conqueror. So began the reign of King Henry I. The people were attached to their new king, both because he had known distresses, and because he was an Englishman by birth, and not a Norman. To strengthen this last hold upon them, the king wished to marry an English lady, and could think of no other wife than Maud the Good, the daughter of the King of Scotland. Although this good princess did not love the king, she was so affected by the representations the nobles made to her of the great charity it would be in her to unite the Norman and Saxon races, and prevent hatred and bloodshed between them for the future, that she consented to be his wife. After some disputing among the priests, who said that as she had been in a convent in her youth, and had worn the veil of a nun, she could not lawfully be married, against which the princess stated that her aunt, with whom she had lived in her youth, had indeed sometimes thrown a piece of black stuff over her, but for no other reason than because the nun's veil was the only dress the conquering Normans respected in girl or woman, and not because she had taken the vows of a nun, which she never had. She was declared free to marry, and was made King Henry's queen. A good queen she was, beautiful, kind-hearted, and worthy of a better husband than the king. For he was a cunning and unscrupulous man, though firm and clever. He cared very little for his word, and took any means to gain his ends. All this is shown in his treatment of his brother Robert. Robert, who had suffered him to be refreshed with water, and who had sent him the wine from his own table, when he was shut up with the crows flying below him, parched with thirst, in the castle on the top of St. Michael's Mount, where his red brother would have let him die. Before the king began to deal with Robert, he removed and disgraced all the favourites of the late king, who were for the most part base characters much detested by the people. Flambard, or Firebrand, whom the late king had made Bishop of Durham of all things in the world, Henry imprisoned in the tower. But Firebrand was a great joker and a jolly companion, and made himself so popular with the guards that they pretended to know nothing about a long rope that was sent into his prison at the bottom of a deep flagon of wine. The guards took the wine, and Firebrand took the rope, with which, when they were fast asleep, he let himself down from a window in the night, and so got cleverly aboard ship and away to Normandy. Now Robert, when his brother Fine Scholar came to the throne, was still absent in the Holy Land. Henry pretended that Robert had been made sovereign of that country, and he had been away so long that the ignorant people believed it. But behold, when Henry had been some time King of England, Robert came home to Normandy. Having leisurely returned from Jerusalem through Italy, in which beautiful country he had enjoyed himself very much, and had married a lady as beautiful as itself. 
In Normandy he found Firebrand waiting to urge him to assert his claim to the English crown, and declare war against King Henry. This, after great loss of time in feasting and dancing with his beautiful Italian wife among his Norman friends, he at last did. The English in general were on King Henry's side, though many of the Normans were on Robert's. But the English sailors deserted the king, and took a great part of the English fleet over to Normandy, so that Robert came to invade this country in no foreign vessels, but in English ships. The virtuous Anselm, however, whom Henry had invited back from abroad, and made Archbishop of Canterbury, was steadfast in the king's cause, and it was so well supported that the two armies, instead of fighting, made a peace. Poor Robert, who trusted anybody and everybody, readily trusted his brother the king, and agreed to go home and receive a pension from England, on condition that all his followers were fully pardoned. This the king very faithfully promised, but Robert was no sooner gone than he began to punish them. Among them was the Earl of Shrewsbury, who, on being summoned by the king to answer to five-and-forty accusations, rode away to one of his strong castles, shut himself up therein, called around him his tenants and vassals, and fought for his liberty, but was defeated and banished. Robert, with all his faults, was so true to his word that when he first heard of this nobleman having risen against his brother, he laid waste the Earl of Shrewsbury's estates in Normandy, to show the king that he would favour no breach of their treaty. Finding on better information afterwards that the Earl's only crime was having been his friend, he came over to England in his old thoughtless warm-hearted way to intercede with the king, and remind him of the solemn promise to pardon all his followers. This confidence might have put the false king to the blush, but it did not. Pretending to be very friendly, he so surrounded his brother with spies and traps, that Robert, who was quite in his power, had nothing for it but to renounce his pension and escape while he could. Getting home to Normandy, and understanding the king better now, he naturally allied himself with his old friend the Earl of Shrewsbury, who still had thirty castles in that country. This was exactly what Henry wanted. He immediately declared that Robert had broken the treaty, and next year invaded Normandy. He pretended that he came to deliver the Normans, at their own request, from his brother's misrule. There is reason to fear that his misrule was bad enough, for his beautiful wife had died, leaving him with an infant son, and his court was again so careless, dissipated, and ill-regulated, that it was said he sometimes lay in bed for a day for want of clothes to put on, his attendants having stolen all his dresses. But he headed his army like a brave prince and a gallant soldier, though he had the misfortune to be taken prisoner by King Henry with four hundred of his knights. Among them was poor harmless Edgar Atheling, whom Robert loved well. Edgar was not important enough to be severe with. The king afterwards gave him a small pension, which he lived upon and died upon in peace, among the quiet woods and fields of England. And Robert, poor, kind, generous, wasteful, heedless Robert, with so many faults, and yet with virtues that might have made a better and a happier man. What was the end of him? If the king had had the magnanimity to say with a kind air, Brother, tell me, before these noblemen, that from this time you will be my faithful follower and friend, and never raise your hand against me or my forces more, he might have trusted Robert to the death. But the king was not a magnanimous man. He sentenced his brother to be confined for life in one of the royal castles. In the beginning of his imprisonment, he was allowed to ride out, guarded. But he one day broke away from his guard and galloped off. He had the evil fortune to ride into a swamp, where his horse stuck fast and he was taken. When the king heard of it, he ordered him to be blinded, which was done by putting a red-hot metal basin on his eyes. And so, in darkness and in prison, many years, he thought of all his past life, of the time he had wasted, of the treasure he had squandered, of the opportunities he had lost, of the youth he had thrown away, of the talents he had neglected. Sometimes, on fine autumn mornings, he would sit and think of the old hunting parties in the free forest, where he had been the foremost and the gayest. Sometimes, in the still nights, he would wake, and mourn for the many nights that had stolen past him at the gaming table, sometimes would seem to hear upon the melancholy wind the old songs of the minstrels, sometimes would dream in his blindness of the light and glitter of the Norman court. Many and many a time he groped back in his fancy to Jerusalem, where he had fought so well, or at the head of his brave companions bowed his feathered helmet to the shouts of welcome greeting him in Italy, and seemed again to walk among the sunny vineyards, or on the shore of the blue sea with his lovely wife. 
and then, thinking of her grave, and of his fatherless boy, he would stretch out his solitary arms and weep. At length, one day, there lay in prison, dead, with cruel and disfiguring scars upon his eyelids, bandaged from his jailer's sight, but on which the eternal heavens looked down, a worn old man of eighty. He had once been Robert of Normandy. Pity him. At the time when Robert of Normandy was taken prisoner by his brother, Robert's little son was only five years old. This child was taken, too, and carried before the king, sobbing and crying, for young as he was, he knew he had good reason to be afraid of his royal uncle. The king was not much accustomed to pity those who were in his power, but his cold heart seemed for the moment to soften towards the boy. He was observed to make a great effort as if to prevent himself from being cruel, and ordered the child to be taken away, whereupon a certain baron, who had married a daughter of Duke Robert's, by name Helie of Saint-Saint, took charge of him tenderly. The king's gentleness did not last long. Before two years were over, he sent messengers to this lord's castle to seize the child and bring him away. The baron was not there at the time, but his servants were faithful, and carried the boy off in his sleep and hid him. When the baron came home, and was told what the king had done, he took the child abroad, and leading him by the hand, went from king to king and from court to court, relating how the child had a claim to the throne of England, and how his uncle the king, knowing that he had that claim, would have murdered him, perhaps, but for his escape. The youth and innocence of the pretty little William Fitzrobert, for that was his name, made him many friends at that time. When he became a young man, the king of France, uniting with the French counts of Anjou and Flanders, supported his cause against the king of England, and took many of the king's towns and castles in Normandy. But King Henry, artful and cunning always, bribed some of William's friends with money, some with promises, some with power. He bought off the Count of Anjou by promising to marry his eldest son, also named William, to the Count's daughter. And indeed the whole trust of this king's life was such in bargains, and he believed, as many another king has done since, and as one king did in France a very little time ago, that every man's truth and honour can be bought at some price. For all this he was so afraid of William Fitzrobert and his friends that for a long time he believed his life to be in danger, and never lay down to sleep, even in his palace surrounded by his guards, without having a sword and buckler at his bedside. To strengthen his power, the king with great ceremony betrothed his eldest daughter Matilda, then a child only eight years old, to be the wife of Henry V, the Emperor of Germany. To raise her marriage portion, he taxed the English people in a most oppressive manner, then treated them to a great procession, to restore their good humour, and sent Matilda away in fine state, with the German ambassadors, to be educated in the country of her future husband. And now his queen, Maud the Good, unhappily died. It was a sad thought for that gentle lady, that the only hope with which she had married a man whom she had never loved, the hope of reconciling the Norman and English races, had failed. At the very time of her death, Normandy and all France was in arms against England, for so soon as his last danger was over, King Henry had been false to all the French powers he had promised, bribed, and bought, and they had naturally united against him. After some fighting, however, in which few suffered but the unhappy common people, who always suffered whatsoever was the matter, he began to promise, bribe, and buy again, and by those means, and by the help of the Pope, who exerted himself to save more bloodshed, and by solemnly declaring over and over again that he really was in earnest this time, and would keep his word, the king made peace. One of the first consequences of this peace was that the king went over to Normandy with his son Prince William and a great retinue, to have the prince acknowledged as his successor by the Norman nobles and to contract the promised marriage, this was one of the many promises the king had broken, between him and the daughter of the Count of Anjou. Both these things were triumphantly done, with great show and rejoicing, and on the 25th of November, in the year 1120, the whole retinue prepared to embark at the port of Barfleur for the voyage home. On that day, and at that place, there came to the king Fitz Stephen, a sea captain, and said, my liege, my father served your father all his life upon the sea. He steered the ship with the golden boy upon the prow in which your father sailed to conquer England. I beseech you to grant me the same office. I have a fair vessel in the harbour here, called the White Ship. 
manned by fifty sailors of renown. I pray you, sire, to let your servant have the honour of steering you in the white ship to England. I am sorry, friend, replied the king, that my vessel is already chosen, and that I cannot, therefore, sail with the son of the man who served my father. But the prince and all his company shall go along with you in the fair white ship, manned by the fifty sailors of renown. An hour or two afterwards the king set sail in the vessel he had chosen, accompanied by other vessels, and sailing all night with a fair and gentle wind, arrived upon the coast of England in the morning. While it was yet night, the people in some of those ships heard a faint wild cry come over the sea, and wondered what it was. Now the prince was a dissolute, debauched young man of eighteen, who bore no love to the English, and had declared that when he came to the throne he would yoke them to the plough like oxen. He went aboard the white ship, and with one hundred and forty youthful nobles like himself, among whom were eighteen noble ladies of the highest rank. All this gay company, with their servants and the fifty sailors, made three hundred souls aboard the fair white ship. "'Give three casks of wine, Fitzstephen,' said the prince, "'to the fifty sailors of renown. My father the king has sailed out of the harbour. What time is there to make merry here, and yet reach England with the rest?' "'Prince,' said Fitzstephen, "'Before morning my fifty and the white ship shall overtake the swiftest vessel in attendance on your father the king, if we sail at midnight.' Then the prince commanded to make merry, and the sailors drank out the three casks of wine, and the prince and all the noble company danced in the moonlight on the deck of the white ship. When at last she shot out of the harbour of Barfleur, there was not a sober seaman on board, but the sails were all set and the oars all going merrily. Fitzstephen had the helm. The gay young nobles and the beautiful ladies, wrapped in mantles of various bright colours to protect them from the cold, talked, laughed, and sang. The prince encouraged the fifty sailors to row harder yet for the honour of the white ship. Crash! A terrific cry broke from three hundred hearts. It was the cry the people in the distant vessels of the king heard faintly on the water. The white ship had struck a rock, was filling, going down. Fitzstephen hurried the prince into a boat with some few nobles. Push off, he whispered, and row to land. It is not far, and the sea is smooth. The rest of us must die. But as they rowed away fast from the sinking ship, the prince heard the voice of his sister Marie, the Countess of Perche, calling for help. He never in his life had been so good as he was then. He cried in an agony, Row back at any risk, I cannot bear to leave her. They rowed back. As the prince held out his arms to catch his sister, such numbers leaped in that the boat was overset, and in the same instant the white ship went down. Only two men floated. They both clung to the main yard of the ship, which had broken from the mast, and now supported them. One asked the other who he was. He said, I am a nobleman, Godfrey by name, the son of Gilbert de Ligel. And you, said he, I am Birold, a poor butcher of Rouen, was the answer. Then they said together, Lord be merciful to us both, and tried to encourage one another, as they drifted in the cold benumbing sea on that unfortunate November night. By and by another man came swimming towards them, whom they knew, when he pushed aside his long wet hair, to be Fitzstephen. "'Where is the prince?' said he. "'Gone, gone,' the two cried together. "'Neither he, nor his brother, nor his sister, nor the king's niece, nor her brother, nor any of all the brave three hundred, noble or commoner, except we three, has risen above the water.' Fitzstephen, with a ghastly face, cried, "'Woe, woe to me!' and sunk to the bottom." The other two clung to the yard for some hours. At length the young noble said faintly, I am exhausted and chilled with the cold, and can hold no longer. Farewell, good friend, God preserve you. So he dropped and sunk, and of all the brilliant crowd the poor butcher of Rouen alone was saved. In the morning some fishermen saw him floating in his sheepskin coat and got him into their boat, the sole relator of the dismal tale. For three days no one dared to carry the intelligence to the king. At length they sent into his presence a little boy, who, weeping bitterly and kneeling at his feet, told him that the white ship was lost with all on board. The king fell to the ground like a dead man, and never, never afterwards was seen to smile. But he plotted again, and he promised again, and bribed and bought again in his old deceitful way. Having no son to succeed him after all his pains, 
The prince will never yoke us to the plough now, said the English people. He took a second wife, Adelaide, or Alice, a duke's daughter, and the pope's niece. Having no more children, however, he proposed to the barons to swear that they would recognize as his successor his daughter Matilda, whom, as she was now a widow, he had married to the eldest son of the Count of Anjou, Geoffrey, surnamed Plantagenet, from a custom he had of wearing a sprig of flowering broom, called Jeannette, in French, in his cap for a feather. As one false man usually makes many, and as a false king in particular is pretty certain to make a false court, the barons took the oath about the succession of Matilda and her children after her, twice over, without in the least intending to keep it. The king was now relieved from any remaining fears of William Fitzrobert by his death in the monastery of St. Ober in France, at twenty-six years old, of a pike wound in the hand. And as Matilda gave birth to three sons, he thought the succession to the throne secure. He spent most of the latter part of his life, which was troubled by family quarrels, in Normandy, to be near Matilda. When he had reigned upward of thirty-five years and was sixty-seven years old, he died of an indigestion and fever, brought on by eating, when he was far from well, of a fish called lamprey, against which he had often been cautioned by his physicians. His remains were brought over to Reading Abbey to be buried. You may perhaps hear the cunning and promise-breaking of King Henry I called policy by some people, and diplomacy by others. Neither of these fine words will in the least mean that it was true, and nothing that is not true can possibly be good. His greatest merit that I know of was his love of learning. I should have given him greater credit even for that, if it had been strong enough to induce him to spare the eyes of a certain poet he once took prisoner, who was a knight besides. But he ordered the poet's eyes to be torn from his head, because he had laughed at him in his verses. And the poet, in the pain of that torture, dashed out his own brains against his prison wall. King Henry I was avaricious, revengeful, and so false, that I suppose a man never lived whose word was less to be relied upon. End of chapter 10「A of a Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 11. England under Matilda and Stephen. The king was no sooner dead than all the plans and schemes he had laboured at so long, and lied so much for, crumbled away like a hollow heap of sand. Stephen, whom he had never mistrusted or suspected, started up to claim the throne. Stephen was the son of Adela, the conqueror's daughter, married to the Count of Blois. To Stephen, and to his brother Henry, the late king had been liberal, making Henry Bishop of Winchester, and finding a good marriage for Stephen, and much enriching him. This did not prevent Stephen from hastily producing a false witness, a servant of the late king, to swear that the king had named him for his heir upon his deathbed. On this evidence the Archbishop of Canterbury crowned him. The new king, so suddenly made, lost not a moment in seizing the royal treasure, and hiring foreign soldiers with some of it to protect his throne. If the dead king had even done as the false witness said, he would have had small right to will away the English people, like so many sheep or oxen, without their consent. But he had, in fact, bequeathed all his territory to Matilda, who, supported by Robert, Earl of Gloucester, soon began to dispute the crown. Some of the powerful barons and priests took her side, some took Stephen's, all fortified their castles, and again the miserable English people were involved in war, from which they could never derive advantage, whosoever was victorious, and in which all parties plundered, tortured, starved, and ruined them. Five years had passed since the death of Henry I, and during those five years there had been two terrible invasions by the people of Scotland under their king, David, who was at last defeated with all his army, when Matilda, attended by her brother Robert and a large force, appeared in England to maintain her claim. 
A battle was fought between her troops and King Stephen's at Lincoln, in which the King himself was taken prisoner, after bravely fighting until his battle-axe and sword were broken, and was carried into strict confinement at Gloucester. Matilda then submitted herself to the priests, and the priests crowned her Queen of England. She did not long enjoy this dignity. The people of London had a great affection for Stephen. Many of the barons considered it degrading to be ruled by a woman, and the Queen's temper was so haughty that she made innumerable enemies. The people of London revolted, and, in alliance with the troops of Stephen, besieged her at Winchester, where they took her brother Robert prisoner, whom, as her best soldier and chief general, she was glad to exchange for Stephen himself, who thus regained his liberty. Then the long war went on afresh. Once she was pressed so hard in the castle of Oxford, in the winter weather when the snow lay thick upon the ground, that her only chance of escape was to dress herself all in white, and, accompanied by no more than three faithful knights, dressed in like manner that their figures should not be seen from Stephen's camp as they passed over the snow, to steal away on foot, cross the frozen Thames, walk a long distance, and at last gallop away on horseback. All this she did, but to no great purpose then for her brother dying while the struggle was yet going on, she at last withdrew to Normandy. In two or three years after her withdrawal, her cause appeared in England afresh in the person of her son Henry, young Plantagenet, who, at only eighteen years of age, was very powerful, not only on account of his mother having resigned all Normandy to him, but also from his having married Eleanor, the divorced wife of the French king, a bad woman who had great possessions in France. Louis, the French king, not relishing this arrangement, helped Eustace, King Stephen's son, to invade Normandy, but Henry drove their united forces out of that country, and then returned here to assist his partisans, whom the king was then besieging at Wallingford upon the Thames. Here, for two days, divided only by the river, the two armies lay encamped opposite to one another. On the eve, as it seemed to all men, of another desperate fight, when the Earl of Arundel took heart, and said that it was not reasonable to prolong the unspeakable miseries of two kingdoms to minister to the ambition of two princes. Many other noblemen, repeating and supporting this when it was once uttered, Stephen and young Plantagenet went down each to his own bank of the river, and held a conversation across it, in which they arranged a truce very much to the dissatisfaction of Eustace, who swaggered away with some followers and laid violent hands on the abbey of St. Edmundsbury, where he presently died mad. The truce led to a solemn council at Winchester, in which it was agreed that Stephen should retain the crown, on condition of his declaring Henry his successor, that William, another son of the king's, should inherit his father's rightful possessions, and that all the crown lands which Stephen had given away should be recalled and all the castles he had permitted to be built demolished. Thus terminated the bitter war, which had now lasted fifteen years, and had again laid England waste. In the next year Stephen died, after a troubled reign of nineteen years. Although King Stephen was, for the time in which he lived, a humane and moderate man, with many excellent qualities, and although nothing worse is known of him than his usurpation of the crown, which he probably excused to himself by the consideration that King Henry I was a usurper too, which was no excuse at all, the people of England suffered more in these dread nineteen years than at any former period even of their suffering history. In the division of the nobility between the two rival claimants of the crown, and in the growth of what is called the feudal system, which made the peasants the born vassals and mere slaves of the barons, every noble had his strong castle where he reigned the cruel king of all the neighbouring people. Accordingly he perpetrated whatever cruelties he chose, and never were worse cruelties committed upon earth than in wretched England in those nineteen years. The writers who were living then describe them fearfully. They say that the castles were filled with devils rather than with men, that the peasants, men and women, were put into dungeons for their gold and silver, were tortured with fire and smoke, were hung up by the thumbs, were hung up by the heels with great weight to their heads, were torn with jagged irons, killed with hunger, broken to death in narrow chests filled with sharp-pointed stones, murdered in countless fiendish ways. 
In England there was no corn, no meat, no cheese, no butter, there were no tilled lands, no harvests. Ashes of burnt towns and dreary wastes were all that the traveller, fearful of the robbers who prowled abroad at all hours, would see in a long day's journey, and from sunrise until night he would not come upon a home. The clergy sometimes suffered, and heavily too, from pillage but many of them had castles of their own and fought in helmet and armour like the barons, and drew lots with other fighting men for their share of booty. The Pope, or Bishop of Rome, on King Stephen's resisting his ambition, laid England under an interdict at one period of this reign, which meant that he allowed no service to be performed in the churches, no couples to be married, no bells to be rung, no dead bodies to be buried. Any man having the power to refuse these things— no matter whether he were called a pope, or a poulterer, would, of course, have the power of afflicting numbers of innocent people. That nothing might be wanting to the miseries of King Stephen's time, the Pope threw in this contribution to the public store, not very like the widow's contribution, as I think, when our Saviour sat in Jerusalem over against the treasury, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of A Child's History of England。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens Chapter 12 England under Henry the Second, Part the First Henry Plantagenet, when he was but twenty-one years old, quietly succeeded to the throne of England, according to his agreement made with the late king at Winchester. Six weeks after Stephen's death, he and his queen Eleanor were crowned in that city, into which they rode on horseback in great state, side by side, amidst much shouting and rejoicing, and clashing of music, and strewing of flowers. The reign of King Henry the Second began well. The king had great possessions, and, what with his own rights, and what with those of his wife, was lord of one third part of France. He was a young man of vigour, ability and resolution, and immediately applied himself to remove some of the evils which had arisen in the last unhappy reign. He revoked all the grants of land that had been hastily made on either side during the late struggles, he obliged numbers of disorderly soldiers to depart from England, he reclaimed all the castles belonging to the crown, and he forced the wicked nobles to pull down their own castles to the number of eleven hundred in which such dismal cruelties had been inflicted on the people. The king's brother, Geoffrey, rose against him in France, while he was so well employed, and rendered it necessary for him to repair to that country, where, after he had subdued and made a friendly arrangement with his brother, who did not live long, his ambition to increase his possessions involved him in a war with the French king, Louis, with whom he had been on such friendly terms just before, that, to the French king's infant daughter, then a baby in the cradle, he had promised one of his little sons in marriage, who was a child of five years old. However, the war came to nothing at last, and the Pope made the two kings friends again. Now the clergy in the troubles of the last reign had gone on very ill indeed. There were all kinds of criminals among them, murderers, thieves, and vagabonds, and the worst of the matter was that the good priests would not give up the bad priests to justice when they committed crimes, but persisted in sheltering and defending them. The king, well knowing that there could be no peace or rest in England while such things lasted, resolved to reduce the power of the clergy, and, when he had reigned seven years, found, as he considered, a good opportunity for doing so, in the death of the Archbishop of Canterbury. "'I will have for the new Archbishop,' thought the King, "'a friend in whom I can trust, who will help me to humble these rebellious priests, and to have them dealt with when they go wrong, as other men who do wrong are dealt with.' So he resolved to make his favourite the new Archbishop." and this favourite was so extraordinary a man, and his story is so curious, that I must tell you all about him. Once upon a time, 
A worthy merchant of London named Gilbert Becket made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and was taken prisoner by a Saracen lord. This lord, who treated him kindly and not like a slave, had one fair daughter, who fell in love with the merchant, and who told him that she wanted to become a Christian, and was willing to marry him if they could fly to a Christian country. The merchant returned her love, until he found an opportunity to escape, when he did not trouble himself about the Saracen lady, but escaped with his servant Richard, who had been taken prisoner along with him, and arrived in England, and forgot her. The Saracen lady, who was more loving than the merchant, left her father's house in disguise to follow him, and made her way under many hardships to the seashore. The merchant had taught her only two English words, for I suppose he must have learnt the Saracen tongue himself and made love in that language, of which London was one, and his own name, Gilbert, the other. She went among the ships, saying, London. London, over and over again, until the sailors understood that she wanted to find an English vessel that would carry her there. So they showed her such a ship, and she paid for her passage with some of her jewels, and sailed away. Well, the merchant was sitting in his counting-house in London one day, when he heard a great noise in the street, and presently Richard came running in from the warehouse, with his eyes wide open and his breath almost gone, saying, "'Master, master, here is the Saracen lady!' The merchant thought Richard was mad, but Richard said, "'No, master, as I live, the Saracen lady is going up and down the city calling Gilbert, Gilbert.' Then he took the merchant by the sleeve and pointed out of the window, and there they saw her among the gables and water-spouts of the dark, dirty street in her foreign dress, so forlorn, surrounded by a wandering crowd and passing slowly along, calling, "'Gilbert, Gilbert!' When the merchant saw her, and thought of the tenderness she had shown him in his captivity, and of her constancy his heart was moved, and he ran down into the street, and she saw him coming, and with a great cry fainted in his arms. They were married without loss of time, and Richard, who was an excellent man, danced with joy the whole day of the wedding, and they all lived happily ever afterwards. This merchant and this Saracen lady had one son, Thomas a Becket, he it was who became the favourite of King Henry the Second. He had become Chancellor when the King thought of making him Archbishop. He was clever, gay, well-educated, brave, had fought in several battles in France, had defeated a French knight in single combat, and brought his horse away as token of the victory. He lived in a noble palace, he was tutor of the young Prince Henry, he was served by one hundred and forty knights, his riches were immense. The king once sent him as his ambassador to France, and the French people, beholding in what state he travelled, cried out in the streets, "'How splendid must the king of England be, when this is only the chancellor!' They had good reason to wonder at the magnificence of Thomas a Becket, for, when he entered a French town, his procession was headed by two hundred and fifty singing boys, then came his hounds in couples, then eight wagons, each drawn by five horses driven by five drivers, two of the wagons filled with strong ale to be given away to the people, four with his gold and silver plate and stately clothes, two with the dresses of his numerous servants. Then came twelve horses, each with a monkey on his back. Then a train of people bearing shields and leading fine war-horses, splendidly equipped. Then falconers with hawks upon their wrists, then a host of knights and gentlemen and priests, then the Chancellor, with his brilliant garments flashing in the sun, and all the people capering and shouting with delight. The King was well pleased with all this, thinking that it only made himself the more magnificent to have so magnificent a favourite, but he sometimes jested with the Chancellor upon his splendour too. Once, when they were riding together through the streets of London in hard winter weather, they saw a shivering old man in rags. "'Look at the poor object,' said the King. "'Would it not be a charitable act to give that aged man a comfortable warm cloak?' "'Undoubtedly it would,' said Thomas of Eckett. "'And you do well, sir, to think of such Christian duties.' "'Come,' cried the King. "'Then give him your cloak.' It was made of rich crimson, trimmed with ermine. The king tried to pull it off, the chancellor tried to keep it on, both were near rolling from their saddles in the mud when the chancellor submitted, and the king gave the cloak to the old beggar, much to the beggar's astonishment, and much to the merriment of all the courtiers in attendance, for 
Courtiers are not only eager to laugh when the king laughs, but they really do enjoy a laugh against a favourite. I will make, thought Henry the Second, this Chancellor of mine, Thomas a Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury. He will then be the head of the church, and, being devoted to me, will help me to correct the church. He has always upheld my power against the power of the clergy, and once publicly told some bishops, I remember, that men of the church were equally bound to me with men of the sword. Thomas a Becket is the man of all other men in England to help me in my great design. So the king, regardless of all objection, either that he was a fighting man, or a lavish man, or a courtly man, or a man of pleasure, or anything but a likely man for the office, made him archbishop accordingly. Now, Thomas a Becket was proud, and loved to be famous. He was already famous for the pomp of his life, for his riches, his gold and silver plate, his wagons, horses, and attendants. He could do no more in that way than he had done, and being tired of that kind of fame, which is a very poor one, he longed to have his name celebrated for something else. Nothing, he knew, would render him so famous in the world as the setting of his utmost power and ability against the utmost power and ability of the king. He resolved with the whole strength of his mind to do it. He may have had some secret grudge against the king besides. The king may have offended his proud humour at some time or other, for anything I know. I think it likely, because it is a common thing for kings, princes, and other great people to try the tempers of their favourites rather severely. Even the little affair of the crimson cloak must have been anything but a pleasant one to a haughty man. Thomas a Becket knew better than any one in England what the king expected of him. In all his sumptuous life he had never yet been in a position to disappoint the king. He could take up that proud stand now as head of the church, and he determined that it should be written in history, either that he subdued the king, or that the king subdued him. So, of a sudden, he completely altered the whole manner of his life. He turned off all his brilliant followers, ate coarse food, drank bitter water, wore next his skin sackcloth covered with dirt and vermin, for it was then thought very religious to be dirty, flogged his back to punish himself, lived chiefly in a little cell, washed the feet of thirteen poor people every day, and looked as miserable as he possibly could. If he had put twelve hundred monkeys on horseback instead of twelve, and gone in procession with eight thousand wagons instead of eight, he could not have half astonished the people by so much as this great change. It soon caused him to be more talked about as an archbishop than he had been as a chancellor. The king was very angry, and was made still more so when the new archbishop, claiming various estates from the nobles as being rightfully church property, required the king himself for the same reason to give up Rochester Castle and Rochester City too. Not satisfied with this, he declared that no power but himself should appoint a priest to any church in the part of England over which he was archbishop, and when a certain gentleman of Kent made such an appointment as he claimed to have the right to do, Thomas a Becket excommunicated him. Excommunication was, next to the interdict I told you of at the close of the last chapter, the great weapon of the clergy. It consisted in declaring the person who was excommunicated an outcast from the church and from all religious offices, and in cursing him all over from the top of his head to the sole of his foot, whether he was standing up, lying down, sitting, kneeling, walking, running, hopping, jumping, gaping, coughing, sneezing, or whatever else he was doing. This unchristian nonsense would of course have made no sort of difference to the person cursed, who could say his prayers at home if he was shut out of church, and whom none but God could judge, but for the fears and superstitions of the people who avoided excommunicated persons and made their lives unhappy. So the king said to the new archbishop, Take off this excommunication from this gentleman of Kent, to which the archbishop replied, I shall do no such thing. The quarrel went on. A priest in Worcestershire committed a most dreadful murder that aroused the horror of the whole nation. The king demanded to have this wretch delivered up, to be tried in the same court and in the same way as any other murderer. The archbishop refused, and kept him in the bishop's prison. 
The King, holding a solemn assembly in Westminster Hall, demanded that in future all priests found guilty before their bishops of crimes against the law of the land should be considered priests no longer, and should be delivered over to the law of the land for punishment. The Archbishop again refused. The King required to know whether the clergy would obey the ancient customs of the country. Every priest there but one said, after Thomas a Becket, "'Saving my order.' This really meant that they would obey only those customs when they did not interfere with their own claims, and the King went out of the hall in great wrath. Some of the clergy began to be afraid now that they were going too far. Though Thomas Becket was otherwise as unmoved as Westminster Hall, they prevailed upon him for the sake of their fears to go to the King at Woodstock, and promised to observe the ancient customs of the country without saying anything about his order. The King received this submission favourably, and summoned a great council of the clergy to meet at the castle of Clarendon by Salisbury. But when the council met, the Archbishop again insisted on the words, "'Saving my order,' and he still insisted, though the lords entreated him, and priests wept before him and knelt to him, and an adjoining room was thrown open, filled with armed soldiers of the King to threaten him. At length he gave way, for that time, and the ancient customs, which included what the King had demanded in vain, were stated in writing, and were signed and sealed by the chief of the clergy, and were called the Constitutions of Clarendon. The quarrel went on, for all that. The Archbishop tried to see the King. The King would not see him. The Archbishop tried to escape from England. The sailors on the coast would launch no boat to take him away. Then he again resolved to do his worst in opposition to the King, and began openly to set the ancient customs at defiance. The King summoned him before a great council at Northampton, where he accused him of high treason, and made a claim against him, which was not a just one, for an enormous sum of money. Thomas a Becket was alone against the whole assembly, and the very bishops advised him to resign his office and abandon his contest with the King. His great anxiety and agitation stretched him on a sick-bed for two days, but he was still undaunted. He went to the adjourned council, carrying a great cross in his right hand, and sat down, holding it erect before him. The King angrily retired into an inner room. The whole assembly angrily retired, and left him there. But there he sat. The bishops came out again in a body, and renounced him as a traitor. He only said, "'I hear,' and sat there still. They retired again into the inner room, and his trial proceeded without him. By and by the Earl of Leicester, heading the barons, came out to read his sentence. He refused to hear it, denied the power of the court, and said he would refer his cause to the Pope. As he walked out of the hall, with the cross in his hand, some of those present picked up rushes. Rushes were strewn on the floors in those days by way of carpet, and threw them at him. He proudly turned his head, and said that, were he not archbishop, he would chastise those cowards with the sword he had known how to use in bygone days. He then mounted his horse, and rode away, cheered and surrounded by the common people to whom he threw open his house that night, and gave a supper, supping with them himself. That same night he secretly departed from the town, and so, travelling by night and hiding by day, and calling himself Brother Dear Man, got away, not without difficulty, to Flanders. The struggle still went on. The angry king took possession of the revenues of the archbishopric, and banished all the relations and servants of Thomas a Becket to the number of four hundred. The pope and the French king both protected him, and an abbey was assigned for his residence. Stimulated by this support, Thomas a Becket, on a great festival day, formally proceeded to a great church crowded with people, and going up into the pulpit, publicly cursed and excommunicated all who had supported the constitutions of Clarendon, mentioning many English noblemen by name, and not distantly hinting at the King of England himself. When intelligence of this new affront was carried to the king in his chamber, his passion was so furious that he tore his clothes, and rolled like a madman on his bed of straw and rushes. But he was soon up and doing. He ordered all the ports and coasts of England to be narrowly watched, that no letters of interdict might be brought into the kingdom, and sent messengers and bribes to the Pope's palace at Rome. Meanwhile, Thomas a Becket, for his part, was not idle at Rome, but constantly employed his utmost arts in his own behalf. Thus the contest stood, until there was peace between France and England, 
which had been for some time at war, and until the two children of the two kings were married in celebration of it. Then the French king brought about a meeting between Henry and his old favourite, so long his enemy. Even then, though Thomas a Becket knelt before the king, he was obstinate and immovable as to those words about his order. King Louis of France was weak enough in his veneration for Thomas a Becket and such men, but this was a little too much for him. He said that a Becket wanted to be greater than the saints and better than St. Peter, and rode away from him with the King of England. His poor French Majesty asked a Becket's pardon for so doing, however, soon afterwards, and cut a very pitiful figure. At last, and after a world of trouble, it came to this. There was another meeting on French ground between King Henry and Thomas a Becket, and it was agreed that Thomas a Becket should be Archbishop of Canterbury, according to the customs of former archbishops, and that the King should put him in possession of the revenues of that post. And now, indeed, you might suppose the struggle at an end, and Thomas a Becket at rest. No, not even yet. For Thomas a Becket, hearing by some means that King Henry, when he was in dread of his kingdom being placed under an interdict, had had his eldest son, Prince Henry, secretly crowned, not only persuaded the Pope to suspend the Archbishop of York who had performed that ceremony, and to excommunicate the bishops who had assisted at it, but sent a messenger of his own into England, in spite of all the King's precautions along the coast, who delivered the letters of excommunication into the bishops' own hands. Thomas a Becket then came over to England himself, after an absence of seven years. He was privately warned that it was dangerous to come, and that an ireful knight named Ranulph de Brock had threatened that he should not live to eat a loaf of bread in England. But he came. The common people received him well, and marched about with him in a soldierly way, armed with such rustic weapons as they could get. He tried to see the young prince who had once been his pupil, but was prevented. He hoped for some little support among the nobles and priests, but found none. He made the most of the peasants who attended him, and feasted them, and went on from Canterbury to Harrow-on-the-Hill, and from Harrow-on-the-Hill back to Canterbury, and on Christmas Day preached in the cathedral there, and told the people in his sermon that he had come to die among them, and that it was likely he would be murdered. He had no fear, however, or, if he had any, he had much more obstinacy, for he then and there excommunicated three of his enemies— of whom Ranulph de Brock, the ireful knight, was one. As men in general had no fancy for being cursed in their sitting and walking and gaping and sneezing and all the rest of it, it was very natural in the persons so freely excommunicated to complain to the king. It was equally natural in the king, who had hoped to see this troublesome opponent was at last quieted, to fall into a mighty rage when he heard of these new affronts, and on the Archbishop of York telling him that he could never hope for rest while Thomas a Becket lived, to cry out hastily before his court, "'Have I no one here who will deliver me from this man?' There were four knights present who, hearing the King's words, looked at one another, and went out. The names of these knights were Reginald Fitzurse, William Tracy, Hugh de Morville, and Richard Brito three of whom had been in the train of Thomas a Becket in the old days of his splendour. They rode away on horseback, in a very secret manner, and on the third day after Christmas Day arrived at Saltwood House not far from Canterbury, which belonged to the family of Ranulph de Brock. They quietly collected some followers here, in case they should need any, and proceeding to Canterbury suddenly appeared, the four knights and twelve men, before the archbishop in his own house at two o'clock in the afternoon, they neither bowed nor spoke, but sat down on the floor in silence, staring at the archbishop. Thomas a Becket said at length, "'What do you want?' "'We want,' said Reginald Fitzurse, "'the excommunication taken from the bishops, and you to answer for your offences to the king.' Thomas a Becket defiantly replied that the power of the clergy was above the power of the king, that it was not for such men as they were to threaten him, that— if he were threatened by all the swords in England, he would never yield. "'Then we will do more than threaten,' said the knights. And they went out with the twelve men, and put on their armour, and drew their shining swords, and came back. 
His servants, in the meantime, had shut up and barred the great gate of the palace. At first the knights tried to shatter it with their battle-axes, but, being shown a window by which they could enter, they let the gate alone and climbed in that way. While they were battering at the door, the attendants of Thomas a Becket had implored him to take refuge in the cathedral, in which, as a sanctuary or sacred place, they thought the knights would dare to do no violent deed. He told them again and again that he would not stir. Hearing the distant voices of the monks singing the evening service, however, he said it was now his duty to attend, and therefore, and for no other reason, he would go. There was a near way between his palace and the cathedral by some beautiful old cloisters which you may yet see. He went into the cathedral without any hurry, and having the cross carried before him as usual. When he was safely there his servants would have fastened the door, but he said no, it was the house of God, and not a fortress. As he spoke, the shadow of Reginald Fitzurse appeared in the cathedral doorway, darkening the little light there was outside on the dark winter evening. The knight said, in a strong voice, "'Follow me, loyal servants of the king!' The rattle of the armour of the other knights echoed through the cathedral as they came clashing in. It was so dark in the lofty aisles and among the stately pillars of the church, and there were so many hiding-places in the crypt below and in the narrow passages above, that Thomas a Becket might even at that pass have saved himself if he would. But he would not. He told the monks resolutely that he would not. And though they all dispersed, and left him there with no other follower than Edward Grimm, his faithful cross-bearer, he was as firm then as he had ever been in his life. The knights came on through the darkness, making a terrible noise with their armed tread upon the stone pavement of the church. "'Where is the traitor?' they cried out. He made no answer. But when they cried, "'Where is the archbishop?' he said proudly, "'I am here,' and came out of the shade and stood before them. The knights had no desire to kill him, if they could rid the king and themselves of him by any other means. They told him he must either fly or go with them. He said he would do neither, and he threw William Tracy off with such force when he took hold of his sleeve that Tracy reeled again. By his reproaches and his steadiness he so incensed them and exasperated their fierce humour that Reginald Fitzurse, whom he called by an ill name, said, "'Then die!' and struck at his head. But the faithful Edward Grimm put out his arm, and there received the main force of the blow, so that it only made his master bleed. Another voice from among the knights again called to Thomas a Becket to fly, but, with his blood running down his face and his hands clasped and his head bent, he commended himself to God and stood firm. Then they cruelly killed him close to the altar of St. Bennet, and his body fell upon the pavement, which was dirtied with his blood and brains. It is an awful thing to think of the murdered mortal who had so showered his curses about, lying, all disfigured in the church, where a few lamps here and there were but red specks on a pall of darkness, and to think of the guilty knights riding away on horseback, looking over their shoulders at the dim cathedral, and remembering what they had left inside. Part the Second when the king heard how Thomas a Becket had lost his life in Canterbury Cathedral through the ferocity of the four knights, he was filled with dismay. Some have supposed that when the king spoke those hasty words, Have I no one here who will deliver me from this man? He wished and meant a Becket to be slain. But few things are more unlikely, for besides that the king was not naturally cruel, though very passionate, he was wise, and must have known full well what any stupid man in his dominions must have known, namely that such a murder would rouse the Pope and the whole Church against him. He sent respectful messengers to the Pope, to represent his innocence, except in having uttered the hasty words, and he swore solemnly and publicly to his innocence, and contrived in time to make his peace. As to the four guilty knights, who fled into Yorkshire, and never again dared to show themselves at court, the Pope excommunicated them and they lived miserably for some time, shunned by all their countrymen. At last they went humbly to Jerusalem as a penance, and there died and were buried. It happened 
fortunately for the pacifying of the Pope, that an opportunity arose very soon after the murder of a Becket for the King to declare his power in Ireland, which was an acceptable undertaking to the Pope, as the Irish, who had been converted to Christianity by one Patricius, otherwise St. Patrick, long ago, before any Pope existed, considered that the Pope had nothing at all to do with them, or they with the Pope, and accordingly refused to pay him Peter's pence, or that tax of a penny a house which I have elsewhere mentioned. The King's opportunity arose in this way. The Irish were, at that time, as barbarous a people as you can well imagine. They were continually quarrelling and fighting, cutting one another's throats, slicing off one another's noses, burning one another's houses, carrying away one another's wives, and committing all sorts of violence. The country was divided into five kingdoms, Desmond, Thomond, Connaught, Ulster, and Leinster, each governed by a separate king, of whom one claimed to be the chief of the rest. Now, one of these kings, named Dermot MacMurrock, a wild kind of name, spelled in more than one wild kind of way, had carried off the wife of a friend of his, and concealed her on an island in a bog. The friend, resenting this, though it was quite the custom of the country, complained to the chief king, and with the chief king's help drove Dermot MacMurrock out of his dominions. Dermot came over to England for revenge, and offered to hold his realm as a vassal of King Henry, if King Henry would help him to regain it. The king consented to these terms, but only assisted him, then, with what were called letters patent, authorising any English subjects who were so disposed to enter into his service, and aid his cause. There was at Bristol a certain Earl Richard de Clare, called Strongbow, of no very good character, needy and desperate, and ready for anything that offered him a chance of improving his fortunes. There were in South Wales two other broken knights of the same good-for-nothing sort, called Robert Fitzstephen and Maurice Fitzgerald. These three, which, with a small band of followers, took up Dermot's cause, and it was agreed that, if it proved successful, Strongbow should marry Dermot's daughter Eva, and be declared his heir. The trained English followers of these knights were so superior in all the discipline of battle to the Irish that they beat them against immense superiority of numbers. In one fight, early in the war, they cut off three hundred heads, and laid them before MacMurrock, who turned them every one up with his hands, rejoicing, and coming to one which was the head of a man whom he had much disliked, grasped it by the hair and ears, and tore off the nose and lips with his teeth. You may judge from this what kind of a gentleman an Irish king in those times was. The captives all through this war were horribly treated, the victorious party making nothing of breaking their limbs, and casting them into the sea from the tops of high rocks. It was in the midst of the miseries and cruelties attendant on the taking of Waterford, where the dead lay piled in the streets, and the filthy gutters ran with blood, that Strongbow married Eva. An odious marriage company those mounds of corpses must have made, I think, and one quite worthy of the young lady's father. He died after Waterford and Dublin had been taken, and various successes achieved, and Strongbow became King of Leinster. Now came King Henry's opportunity. To restrain the growing power of Strongbow, he himself repaired to Dublin as Strongbow's royal master, and deprived him of his kingdom, but confirmed him in the enjoyment of great possessions. The king, then holding state in Dublin, received the homage of nearly all the Irish kings and chiefs, and so came home again with a great addition to his reputation as Lord of Ireland, and with a new claim on the favour of the Pope. And now their reconciliation was completed more easily and mildly by the Pope than the King might have expected, I think. At this period of his reign, when his troubles seemed so few and his prospects so bright, those domestic miseries began which gradually made the King the most unhappy of men, reduced his great spirit, wore away his health, and broke his heart. He had four sons. Henry, now aged eighteen, his secret crowning of whom had given such offence to Thomas a Becket, Richard, aged sixteen, Geoffrey, fifteen, and John, his favourite, a young boy whom the courtiers named Lackland, because he had no inheritance, but to whom the King meant to give the lordship of Ireland. 
all these misguided boys in their turn were unnatural sons to him, and unnatural brothers to each other. Prince Henry, stimulated by the French king and by his bad mother Queen Eleanor, began the undutiful history. First he demanded that his young wife Margaret, the king's daughter, should be crowned as well as he. His father, the king, consented, and it was done. It was no sooner done than he demanded to have a part of his father's dominions during his father's life. This being refused, he made off from his father in the night, with his bad heart full of bitterness, and took refuge at the French king's court. Within a day or two his brothers Richard and Geoffrey followed. Their mother tried to join them, escaping in man's clothes, but she was seized by King Henry's men, and immured in prison, where she lay deservedly for sixteen years. Every day, however, some grasping English nobleman, to whom the king's protection of his people from their avarice and oppression had given offence, deserted him and joined the princes. Every day he heard some fresh intelligence of the princes levying armies against him, of Prince Henry's wearing a crown before his own ambassadors at the French court, and being called the junior king of England, of all the princes swearing never to make peace with him their father without the consent and approval of the barons of France. But, with his fortitude and energy unshaken, King Henry met the shock of these disasters with a resolved and cheerful face. He called upon all royal fathers who had sons to help him, for his cause was theirs. He hired out of his riches twenty thousand men to fight the false French king who stirred his own blood against him, and he carried on the war with such vigour that Louis soon proposed a conference to treat for peace. The conference was held beneath an old, wide-spreading green elm-tree upon a plain in France. It led to nothing. The war recommenced. Prince Richard began his fighting career by leading an army against his father, but his father beat him and his army back, and thousands of his men would have rued the day in which they fought in such a wicked cause, had the King not received news of an invasion of England by the Scots, and promptly come home through a great storm to repress it. And whether he really began to fear that he suffered these troubles because a Becket had been murdered, or whether he wished to rise in the favour of the Pope, who had now declared a Becket to be a saint, or in the favour of his own people, of whom many believed that even a Becket's senseless tomb could work miracles, I don't know. But the King no sooner landed in England than he went straight to Canterbury, and when he came within sight of the distant cathedral he dismounted from his horse, took off his shoes, and walked, with bare and bleeding feet, to a Becket's grave. There he lay down on the ground, lamenting in the presence of many people, and by and by he went into the chapter-house, and, removing his clothes from his back and shoulders, submitted himself to be beaten with knotted cords, not beaten very hard, I dare say, though, by eighty priests, one after another. It chanced that on the very day that the King made this curious exhibition of himself, a complete victory was obtained over the Scots, which very much delighted the priests, who said that it was won because of his great example of repentance. For the priests in general had found out, since Becket's death, that they admired him of all things, though they had hated him very cordially when he was alive. The Earl of Flanders, who was at the head of the base conspiracy of the King's undutiful sons and their foreign friends, took the opportunity of the King being thus employed at home to lay siege to Rouen, the capital of Normandy. But the King, who was extraordinarily quick and active in all his movements, was at Rouen too, before it was supposed possible that he could have left England, and there he so defeated the said Earl of Flanders that the conspirators proposed peace, and his bad sons Henry and Geoffrey submitted. Richard resisted for six weeks, but, being beaten out of castle after castle, he at last submitted too, and his father forgave him. To forgive these unworthy princes was only to afford them breathing time for new faithlessness. They were so false, disloyal, and dishonourable that they were no more to be trusted than common thieves. In the very next year Prince Henry rebelled again, and was again forgiven. In eight years more Prince Richard rebelled against his elder brother and Prince Geoffrey infamously said that the brothers could never agree well together unless they were united against their father. In the very next year after their reconciliation by the King, Prince Henry again rebelled against his father, and again submitted, swearing to be true, and was again forgiven, and again rebelled with Geoffrey. But the end of this perfidious prince was come. He fell sick at a French town, 
and his conscience terribly reproaching him with his baseness, he sent messengers to the king his father, imploring him to come and see him, and to forgive him for one last time on his bed of death. The generous king, who had a royal and forgiving mind towards his children always, would have gone, but this prince had been so unnatural that the nobleman about the king suspected treachery, and represented to him that he could not safely trust his life with such a traitor, though his own eldest son. Therefore the king sent him a ring from off his finger as a token of forgiveness, and when the prince had kissed it, with much grief and many tears, and had confessed to those around him how bad and wicked and undutiful a son he had been, he said to the attendant priests, "'Oh, tie a rope about my body, and draw me out of bed, and lay me down upon a bed of ashes, that I may die with prayers to God in a repentant manner.' And so he died, at twenty-seven years old. Three years afterwards Prince Geoffrey, being unhorsed at a tournament, had his brains trampled out by a crowd of horses passing over him. So there only remained Prince Richard and Prince John, who was grown to be a young man now, and had solemnly sworn to be faithful to his father. Richard soon rebelled again, encouraged by his friend the French king Philip the Second, son of Louis, who was dead, and soon submitted and was again forgiven, swearing on the New Testament never to rebel again, and— in another year or so rebelled again, and, in the presence of his father, knelt down on his knee before the King of France, and did the French King homage, and declared that with his aid he would possess himself by force of all his father's French dominions. And yet this Richard called himself a soldier of our Saviour. And yet this Richard wore the cross which the kings of France and England had both taken in the previous year at a brotherly meeting underneath the old wide-spreading elm tree on the plain when they had sworn, like him, to devote themselves to a new crusade for the love and honour of the truth. Sick at heart, and wearied out by the falsehood of his sons, and almost ready to lie down and die, the unhappy king, who had so long stood firm, began to fail. But the Pope, to his honour, supported him, and obliged the French king and Richard, though successful in fight, to treat for peace. Richard wanted to be crowned King of England and pretended that he wanted to be married, which he really did not, to the French king's sister, his promised wife, whom King Henry detained in England. King Henry wanted, on the other hand, that the French king's sister should be married to his favourite son John, the only one of his sons, he said, who had never rebelled against him. At last King Henry, deserted by his nobles one by one, distressed, exhausted, broken-hearted, consented to establish peace. One final heavy sorrow was reserved for him even yet. When they brought him the proposed treaty of peace in writing, as he lay very ill in bed, they brought him also the list of the deserters from their allegiance, whom he was required to pardon. The first name upon this list was John, his favourite son, in whom he had trusted to the last. "'Oh, John, child of my heart!' exclaimed the king, in a great agony of mind. "'O oh, John, whom I love the best! O oh, John, for whom I have contended through these many troubles, have you betrayed me too?' And then he lay down with a heavy groan, and said, "'Now let the world go as it will. I care for nothing more.' After a time he told his attendants to take him to the French town of Chinon, a town he had been fond of during many years but he was fond of no place now. It was too true that he could care for nothing more upon this earth. He wildly cursed the hour when he was born, and cursed the children whom he left behind him, and expired. As, one hundred years before, the servile followers of the court had abandoned the conqueror in the hour of his death, so they now abandoned his descendant. The very body was stripped, in the plunder of the royal chamber, and it was not easy to find the means of carrying it for burial to the abbey church of Fontreveau. Richard was said in after years, by way of flattery, to have the heart of a lion. It would have been far better, I think, to have had the heart of a man. His heart, whatever it was, had cause to beat remorsefully within his breast, when he came, as he did, into the solemn abbey and looked on his dead father's uncovered face. His heart, whatever it was, had been a black 
and perjured heart in all its dealings with the deceased king, and more deficient in a single touch of tenderness than any wild beasts in the forest. There is a pretty story told of this reign, called the story of Fair Rosamond. It relates how the king doted on Fair Rosamond, who was the loveliest girl in all the world, and how he had a beautiful bower built for her in a park at Woodstock, and how it was erected in a labyrinth, and could only be found by a clue of silk. How the bad Queen Eleanor, becoming jealous of Fair Rosamond, found out the secret of the clue, and one day appeared before her with a dagger and a cup of poison and left her to the cruel choice between those deaths. How fair Rosamond, after shedding many piteous tears, and offering many useless prayers to the cruel queen, took the poison, and fell dead in the midst of the beautiful bower, while the unconscious birds sang gaily all round her. Now there was a fair Rosamond, and she was, I dare say, the loveliest girl in all the world, and the king was certainly very fond of her, and the bad queen Eleanor was certainly made jealous. But I am afraid—I say afraid, because I like the story so much—that there was no bower, no labyrinth, no silken clue, no dagger, no poison. I am afraid fair Rosamond retired to a nunnery near Oxford, and died there peaceably, her sister nuns hanging a silken drapery over her tomb, and often dressing it with flowers, in remembrance of the youth and beauty that had enchanted the king when he too was young, and when his life lay fair before him. It was dark and ended now, faded and gone. Henry Plantagenet lay quiet in the Abbey Church of Fontreville, in the fifty-seventh year of his age, never to be completed, after governing England well for nearly thirty-five years. End of chapter 12《Richard of the Lionheart succeeded to the throne of King Henry the Second, whose paternal heart he had done so much to break. He had been, as we have seen, a rebel from his boyhood, but the moment he became a king against whom others might rebel, he found out that rebellion was a great wickedness. In the heat of this pious discovery he punished all the leading people who had befriended him against his father. He could scarcely have done anything that would have been a better instance of his real nature or a better warning to fauners and parasites not to trust in lion-hearted princes. He likewise put his late father's treasurer in chains, and locked him up in a dungeon from which he was not set free, until he had relinquished not only all the crown treasure, but all his own money too. So Richard certainly got the lion's share of the wealth of this wretched treasurer, whether he had a lion's heart or not. He was crowned King of England with great pomp at Westminster walking to the cathedral under a silken canopy stretched on the tops of four lances, each carried by a great lord. On the day of his coronation a dreadful murdering of the Jews took place, which seems to have given great delight to numbers of savage persons calling themselves Christians. The king had issued a proclamation forbidding the Jews, who were generally hated, though they were the most useful merchants in England, to appear at the ceremony, but as they had assembled in London from all parts, bringing presents to show their respect for their new sovereign, some of them ventured down to Westminster Hall with their gifts, which were very readily accepted. It is supposed now that some noisy fellow in the crowd, pretending to be a very delicate Christian, set up a howl at this, and struck a Jew who was trying to get in at the hall door with his present. A riot arose. The Jews, who had got into the hall, were driven forth, and some of the rabble cried out that the new king had commanded the unbelieving race to be put to death. Thereupon the crowd rushed through the narrow streets of the city, slaughtering all the Jews they met, 
and when they could find no more out of doors, on account of their having fled to their houses and fastened themselves in, they ran madly about breaking open all the houses where the Jews lived, rushing in and stabbing or spearing them, sometimes even flinging old people and children out of the window into blazing fires they had lighted up below. This great cruelty lasted four-and-twenty hours, and only three men were punished for it. Even they forfeited their lives not for murdering and robbing the Jews, but for burning the houses of some Christians. King Richard, who was a strong, restless, burly man, with one idea always in his head, and that the very troublesome idea of breaking the heads of other men, was mightily impatient to go on a crusade to the Holy Land, with a great army. As great armies could not be raised to go even to the Holy Land without a great deal of money, he sold the crown domains and even the high offices of state, recklessly appointing noblemen to rule over his English subjects, not because they were fit to govern, but because they could pay high for the privilege. In this way, and by selling pardons at a dear rate, and by varieties of avarice and oppression, he scraped together a large treasure. He then appointed two bishops to take care of his kingdom in his absence, and gave great powers and possessions to his brother John to secure his friendship. John would rather have been made regent of England, but he was a sly man, and friendly to the expedition, saying to himself, no doubt, the more fighting, the more chance of my brother being killed, and when he is killed, then I become King John. Before the newly levied army departed from England, the recruits and the general populace distinguished themselves by astonishing cruelties on the unfortunate Jews, whom in many large towns they murdered by hundreds in the most horrible manner. At York, a large body of Jews took refuge in the castle, in the absence of its governor, after the wives and children of many of them had been slain before their eyes. Presently came the governor, and demanded admission. "'How can we give it thee, O governor?' said the Jews upon the walls. And if we open the gate by so much as the width of a foot, the roaring crowd behind thee will press in and kill us. Upon this the unjust governor became angry, and told the people that he approved of their killing these Jews, and a mischievous maniac of a friar, dressed all in white, put himself at the head of the assault, and they assaulted the castle for three days. Then said Jochen, the head Jew, who was a rabbi or priest, to the rest, Brethren, there is no help for us with the Christians, who are hammering at the gates and walls, and who must soon break in. As we and our wives and children must die, either by Christian hands or by our own, let it be by our own. Let us destroy by fire what jewels and other treasure we have here, then fire the castle, and then perish. A few could not resolve to do this, but the greater part complied. They made a blazing heap of all their valuables, and when those were consumed, set the castle in flames while the flames roared and crackled about them, and shooting up into the sky turned it blood-red, Jochen cut the throat of his beloved wife and stabbed himself. All the others who had wives or children did the like dreadful deed. When the populace broke in, they found, except the trembling few cowering in corners whom they soon killed, only heaps of greasy cinders, with here and there something like part of the blackened trunk of a burnt tree, but which had lately been a human creature formed by the beneficent hand of the Creator, as they were. After this bad beginning, Richard and his troops went on, in no very good manner, with the Holy Crusade. It was undertaken jointly by the King of England and his old friend Philip of France. They commenced the business by reviewing their forces, to the number of one hundred thousand men. Afterwards they severally embarked their troops for Messina in Sicily, which was appointed as the next place of meeting. King Richard's sister had married the king of this place, but he was dead, and his uncle Tancred had usurped the crown, cast the royal widow into prison, and possessed himself of her estates. Richard fiercely demanded his sister's release, the restoration of her lands, and, according to the royal custom of the island, that she should have a golden chair, a golden table, four-and-twenty silver cups, and four-and-twenty silver dishes. As he was too powerful to be successfully resisted, Tancred yielded to his demands, and then the French king grew jealous and complained that the English king wanted to be absolute in the island of Messina and everywhere else. Richard, however, cared little or nothing for this complaint, and, in consideration of a present of twenty thousand pieces of gold, promised his pretty little nephew Arthur, then a child of two years old, in marriage to Tancred's daughter. We shall hear again of pretty little Arthur by and by. 
This Sicilian affair arranged without anybody's brains being knocked out, which must have rather disappointed him, King Richard took his sister away, and also a fair lady named Berengaria, with whom he had fallen in love in France, and whom his mother, Queen Eleanor, so long in prison, you remember, but released by Richard on his coming to the throne, had brought out there to be his wife, and sailed with them for Cyprus. He soon had the pleasure of fighting the king of the island of Cyprus, for allowing his subjects to pillage some of the English troops who were shipwrecked on the shore, and, easily conquering this poor monarch, he seized his only daughter, to be a companion to the Lady Berengaria, and put the king himself into silver fetters. He then sailed away again with his mother, sister, wife, and the captive princess, and soon arrived before the town of Acre, which the French king with his fleet was besieging from the sea. But the French king was in no triumphant condition, for his army had been thinned by the swords of the Saracens, and wasted by the plague, and Saladin, the brave sultan of the Turks, at the head of a numerous army, was at that time gallantly defending the place from the hills that rise above it. Wherever the united army of crusaders went, they agreed in few points except in gaming, drinking, and quarrelling in a most unholy manner in debauching the people among whom they tarried, whether they were friends or foes, and in carrying disturbance and ruin into quiet places. The French king was jealous of the English king, and the English king was jealous of the French king, and the disorderly and violent soldiers of the two nations were jealous of one another. Consequently, the two kings could not at first agree, even upon a joint assault on Acre. But when they did make up their quarrel for that purpose, the Saracens promised to yield the town, to give up to the Christians the wood of the Holy Cross, to set at liberty all their Christian captives, and to pay two hundred thousand pieces of gold. All this was to be done within forty days, but, not being done, King Richard ordered some three thousand Saracen prisoners to be brought out in front of his camp, and there, in full view of their own countrymen, to be butchered. The French king had no part in this crime, for he was by that time travelling homeward with the greater part of his men, being offended by the overbearing conduct of the English king, being anxious to look after his own dominions, and being ill, besides, from the unwholesome air of that hot and sandy country. King Richard carried on the war without him, and remained in the east, meeting with a variety of adventures, nearly a year and a half. Every night, when his army was on the march and came to a halt, the heralds cried out three times to remind all the soldiers of the cause in which they were engaged, Save the Holy Sepulchre! And then all the soldiers knelt and said Amen. Marching or encamping, the army had continually to strive with the hot air of the glaring desert, or with the Saracen soldiers animated and directed by the brave Saladin, or with both together. Sickness and death, battle and wounds, were always among them, but through every difficulty King Richard fought like a giant, and worked like a common labourer. Long and long after he was quiet in his grave, his terrible battle-axe, with twenty English pounds of English steel in its mighty head, was a legend among the Saracens, and when all the Saracen and Christian hosts had been dust for many a year, if a Saracen horse started at any object by the wayside, his rider would exclaim, What dost thou fear, fool? Dost thou think King Richard is behind it? No one admired this king's renown for bravery more than Saladin himself, who was a generous and gallant enemy. When Richard lay ill of a fever, Saladin sent him fresh fruits from Damascus and snow from the mountain tops. Courtly messages and compliments were frequently exchanged between them, and then King Richard would mount his horse and kill as many Saracens as he could, and Saladin would mount his and kill as many Christians as he could. In this way King Richard fought to his heart's content at Arsouf and at Jaffa, and, finding himself with nothing exciting to do at Ascalon except to rebuild for his own defence some fortifications there which the Saracens had destroyed, he kicked his ally, the Duke of Austria, for being too proud to work at them. The army at last came within sight of the holy city of Jerusalem, but, being then a mere nest of jealousy, and quarrelling and fighting, soon retired, and agreed with the Saracens upon a truce for three years, three months, three days, and three hours. Then the English Christians, protected by the noble Saladin from Saracen revenge, visited our Saviour's tomb, and then King Richard embarked with a small force at Acre to return home. 
but he was shipwrecked in the Adriatic Sea, and was fain to pass through Germany under an assumed name. Now there were many people in Germany who had served in the Holy Land under that proud Duke of Austria who had been kicked, and some of them, easily recognising a man so remarkable as King Richard, carried their intelligence to the kicked Duke, who straightway took him prisoner at a little inn near Vienna. The Duke's master, the Emperor of Germany, and the King of France, were equally delighted to have so troublesome a monarch in safe keeping. Friendships which are founded on a partnership in doing wrong are never true, and the King of France was now quite as heartily King Richard's foe as he had ever been his friend in his unnatural conduct to his father. He monstrously pretended that King Richard had designed to poison him in the East. He charged him with having murdered there a man whom he had in truth befriended. He bribed the Emperor of Germany to keep him close prisoner, and, finally, through the plotting of these two princes, Richard was brought before the German legislature, charged with the foregoing crimes and many others. But he defended himself so well that many of the assembly were moved to tears by his eloquence and earnestness. It was decided that he should be treated, during the rest of his captivity, in a manner more becoming his dignity than he had been, and that he should be set free on the payment of a heavy ransom. This ransom the English people willingly raised. When Queen Eleanor took it over to Germany, it was at first evaded and refused, but she appealed to the honour of all the princes of the German Empire in behalf of her son, and appealed so well that it was accepted and the King released. Thereupon the King of France wrote to Prince John, "'Take care of thyself. The devil is unchained.' Prince John had reason to fear his brother for he had been a traitor to him in his captivity. He had secretly joined the French king, had vowed to the English nobles and people that his brother was dead, and had vainly tried to seize the crown. He was now in France, at a place called Evreux. Being the meanest and basest of men, he contrived a mean and base expedient for making himself acceptable to his brother. He invited the French officers of the garrison in that town to dinner, murdered them all, and then took the fortress. With this recommendation to the good will of a lion-hearted monarch, he hastened to King Richard, fell on his knees before him, and obtained the intercession of Queen Eleanor. "'I forgive him,' said the King, "'and I hope I may forget the injury he has done me, as easily as I know he will forget my pardon.'" While King Richard was in Sicily, there had been trouble in his dominions at home. One of the bishops whom he had left in charge thereof, arresting the other, and making, in his pride and ambition, as great a show as if he were king himself. But the king hearing of it at Messina, and appointing a new regency, this Longchamp, for that was his name, had fled to France in a woman's dress, and had there been encouraged and supported by the French king. With all these causes of offence against Philip in his mind, King Richard had no sooner been welcomed home by his enthusiastic subjects with great display and splendour, and had no sooner been crowned afresh at Winchester, than he resolved to show the French king that the devil was unchained indeed, and made war against him with great fury. There was fresh trouble at home about this time, arising out of the discontents of the poor people, who complained that they were far more heavily taxed than the rich and who found a spirited champion in William Fitz Osbert called Longbeard. He became the leader of a secret society, comprising fifty thousand men. He was seized by surprise. He stabbed the citizen who first laid hands upon him, and retreated bravely fighting to a church, which he maintained four days until he was dislodged by fire, and run through the body as he came out. He was not killed, though, for he was dragged, half dead, at the tail of a horse to Smithfield, and there hanged. Death was long a favourite remedy for silencing the people's advocates, but as we go on with this history I fancy we shall find them difficult to make an end of, for all that. The French war, delayed occasionally by a truce, was still in progress when a certain lord named Videmar, Viscount of Limoges, chanced to find in his ground a treasure of ancient coins. As the king's vassal, he sent the king half of it, but the king claimed the whole. The lord refused to yield the whole. The king besieged the lord in his castle, swore that he would take the castle by storm, and hang every man of its defenders on the battlements. 
There was a strange old song in that part of the country to the effect that in Limoges an arrow would be made by which King Richard would die. It may be that Bertrand de Gourdon, a young man who was one of the defenders of the castle, had often sung it, or heard it sung of a winter night, and remembered it when he saw, from his post upon the ramparts, the King, attended only by his chief officer riding below the walls, surveying the place. He drew an arrow to the head, took steady aim, said between his teeth, "'Now I pray God speed thee well, Arrow,' discharged it, and struck the king in the left shoulder. Although the wound was not at first considered dangerous, it was severe enough to cause the king to retire to his tent, and direct the assault to be made without him. The castle was taken, and every man of its defenders was hanged, as the king had sworn all should be, except Bertrand de Gournon, who was reserved until the royal pleasure respecting him should be known. By that time unskilful treatment had made the wound mortal, and the king knew that he was dying. He directed Bertrand to be brought into his tent. The young man was brought there heavily chained. King Richard looked at him steadily. He looked as steadily at the king. "'Knave,' said King Richard, "'What have I done to thee that thou shouldest take my life?' "'What hast thou done to me?' replied the young man. "'With thine own hands thou hast killed my father and my two brothers. Myself thou wouldst have hanged. Let me die now, by any torture thou wilt. My comfort is that no torture can save thee. Thou too must die, and through me the world is quit of thee.' Again the king looked at the young man steadily. Again the young man looked steadily at him. Perhaps some remembrance of his generous enemy Saladin, who was not Christian, came into the mind of the dying king. Youth, he said, I forgive thee. Go unhurt. Then, turning to the chief officer, who had been riding in his company when he received the wound, King Richard said, Take off his chains, give him a hundred shillings, and let him depart. He sank down on his couch, and a dark mist seemed in his weakened eyes to fill the tent wherein he had so often rested, and he died. His age was forty-two. He had reigned ten years. His last command was not obeyed, for the chief officer flayed Bertrand de Gourdon alive, and hanged him. There is an old tune yet known. A sorrowful air will sometimes outlive many generations of strong men, and even last longer than battle-axes with twenty pounds of steel in the head, by which this king is said to have been discovered in captivity. Blondel, a favourite minstrel of King Richard, as the story relates, faithfully seeking his royal master, went singing it outside the gloomy walls of many foreign fortresses and prisons, until at last he heard it echoed from within a dungeon, and knew the voice, and cried out in ecstasy, O oh, Richard! O oh, my King! You may believe it, if you like. It would be easy to believe worse things. Richard was himself a minstrel and a poet. If he had not been a prince, too, he might have been a better man, perhaps, and might have gone out of the world with less bloodshed and waste of life to answer for. End of chapter 13《ハッピーバースデーシリーズ》ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピーバースデーシリーズ。ハッピー John became king of England. His pretty little nephew Arthur had the best claim to the throne, but John seized the treasure, and made fine promises to the nobility, and got himself crowned at Westminster within a few weeks after his brother's death. I doubt whether the crown could possibly have been put upon the head of a meaner coward, or a more detestable villain, if England had been searched from end to end to find him out. The French king, Philip, refused to acknowledge the right of John to his new dignity, and declared in favour of Arthur. You must not suppose that he had any generosity of feeling for the fatherless boy. It merely suited his ambitious schemes to oppose the King of England. 
So John and the French King went to war about Arthur. He was a handsome boy, at that time only twelve years old. He was not born when his father Geoffrey had his brains trampled out at the tournament, and, besides the misfortune of never having known a father's guidance and protection, he had the additional misfortune to have a foolish mother, Constance by name, lately married to her third husband. She took Arthur, upon John's accession, to the French king, who pretended to be very much his friend, and who made him a knight, and promised him his daughter in marriage, but who cared so little about him in reality that, finding it in his interest to make peace with King John for a time, he did so without the least consideration for the poor little prince, and heartlessly sacrificed all his interests. Young Arthur, for two years afterwards, lived quietly and in the course of that time his mother died. But the French king, then finding it in his interest to quarrel with King John again, again made Arthur his pretense, and invited the orphan boy to court. "'You know your rights, prince,' said the French king, "'and you would like to be a king. Is it not so?' "'Truly,' said Prince Arthur, "'I should greatly like to be a king.' Then, said Philip, you shall have two hundred gentlemen who are knights of mine, and with them you shall go to win back the provinces belonging to you, of which your uncle, usurping King of England, has taken possession. I myself, meanwhile, will head a force against him in Normandy. Poor Arthur was so flattered and so grateful that he signed a treaty with the crafty French king, agreeing to consider him his superior lord and that the French king should keep for himself whatever he could take from King John. Now, King John was so bad in all ways, and King Philip was so perfidious, that Arthur, between the two, might as well have been a lamb between a fox and a wolf. But, being so young, he was ardent and flushed with hope, and when the people of Brittany, which was his inheritance, sent him five hundred more knights and five thousand foot-soldiers, he believed his fortune was made. The people of Brittany had been fond of him from his birth, and had requested that he might be called Arthur, in remembrance of that dimly famous English Arthur, of whom I told you early in this book, whom they believed to have been the brave friend and companion of an old king of their own. They had tales among them about a prophet called Merlin, of the same old time, who had foretold that their own king should be restored to them after hundreds of years and they believed that the prophecy would be fulfilled in Arthur, that the time would come when he would rule them with a crown of Brittany upon his head, and when neither King of France nor King of England would have any power over them. When Arthur found himself riding in a glittering suit of armour, on a richly caparisoned horse, at the head of his train of knights and soldiers, he began to believe this too, and to consider old Merlin a very superior prophet. He did not know, how could he, being so innocent and inexperienced, that his little army was a mere nothing against the power of the King of England. The French King knew it, but the poor boy's fate was little to him, so that the King of England was worried and distressed. Therefore King Philip went his way into Normandy, and Prince Arthur went his way towards Mirebeau, a French town near Poitiers, both very well pleased. Prince Arthur went to attack the town of Mirebeau, because his grandmother, Eleanor, who had so often made her appearance in this history, and who had always been his mother's enemy, was living there, and because his knights said, "'Prince, if you can take her prisoner, you will be able to bring the king your uncle to terms.' But she was not to be easily taken. She was old enough by this time, eighty, but she was as full of stratagem as she was full of years and wickedness. Receiving intelligence of young Arthur's approach, she shut herself up in a high tower, and encouraged her soldiers to defend it like men. Prince Arthur, with his little army, besieged the high tower. King John, hearing how matters stood, came up to the rescue with his army. So here was a strange family party, the boy prince besieging his grandmother, and his uncle besieging him. This position of affairs did not last long. One summer night King John, by treachery, got his men into the town, surprised Prince Arthur's force, took two hundred of his knights, and seized the prince himself in his bed. 
The knights were put in heavy irons and driven away in open carts drawn by bullocks to various dungeons where they were most inhumanly treated, and where some of them were starved to death. Prince Arthur was sent to the castle of Falaise. One day, while he was in prison at that castle, mournfully thinking it strange that one so young should be in so much trouble, and looking out of a small window in the deep dark wall at the summer sky and the birds, the door was softly opened, and he saw his uncle the king standing in the shadow of the archway, looking very grim. Arthur, said the king, with his wicked eyes more on the stone floor than on his nephew, will you not trust to the gentleness, the friendship, and the truthfulness of your loving uncle? I will tell my loving uncle that, replied the boy, when he does me right. Let him restore to me my kingdom of England, and then come and ask me the question. The king looked at him, and went out. "'Keep that boy close prisoner,' said he to the warden of the castle. Then the king took secret counsel with the worst of his nobles how the prince was to be got rid of. Some said, "'Put out his eyes and keep him in prison as Robert of Normandy was kept.' Others said, "'Have him stabbed.' Others said, "'Have him hanged.' Others, "'Have him poisoned.' King John, feeling that in any case, whatever was done afterwards, it would be a satisfaction to his mind to have those handsome eyes burnt out that had looked at him so proudly, while his own royal eyes were blinking at the stone floor, sent certain ruffians to fillets to blind the boy with red-hot irons. But Arthur so pathetically entreated them, and shed such piteous tears, and so appealed to Hubert de Borg, or Burr, the warden of the castle, who had a love for him and was an honourable tender man, that Hubert could not bear it. To his eternal honour he prevented the torture from being performed, and, at his own risk, sent the savages away. The chafed and disappointed king bethought himself of the stabbing suggestion next, and, with his shuffling manner and his cruel face, proposed it to one William de Bray. "'I am a gentleman, and not an executioner,' said William de Bray, and left the presence with disdain. But it was not difficult for a king to hire a murderer in those days. King John found one for his money, and sent him down to the castle of Falaise. "'On what errand dost thou come?' said Hubert to this fellow. "'To dispatch young Arthur,' he returned. "'Go back to him who sent thee,' answered Hubert, "'and say that I will do it.' King John, very well knowing that Hubert would never do it, but that he courageously sent this reply to save the prince or gain time, dispatched messengers to convey the young prisoner to the castle of Rouen. Arthur was soon forced from the good Hubert, of whom he had never stood in greater need than then, carried away by night and lodged in his new prison, where, through his grated window, he could hear the deep waters of the river Seine rippling against the stone wall below. One dark night, as he lay sleeping, dreaming, perhaps, of rescue by those unfortunate gentlemen who were obscurely suffering and dying in his cause, he was roused, and bidden by his jailer to come down the staircase to the foot of the tower. He hurriedly dressed himself and obeyed. When they came to the bottom of the winding stairs, and the night air from the river blew upon their faces, the jailer trod upon his torch and put it out. Then. Arthur, in the darkness, was hurriedly drawn into a solitary boat, and in that boat he found his uncle and one other man. He knelt to them, and prayed them not to murder him. Deaf to his entreaties, they stabbed him, and sunk his body in the river with heavy stones. When the spring morning broke, the tower door was closed, the boat was gone, the river sparkled on its way and never more was any trace of the poor boy beheld by mortal eyes. The news of this atrocious murder being spread in England awakened a hatred of the king, already odious for his many vices, and for his having stolen away and married a noble lady while his own wife was living, that never slept again through his whole reign. In Brittany the indignation was intense. Arthur's own sister Eleanor was in the power of John, and shut up in a convent at Bristol, but his half-sister Alice was in Brittany. 
the people chose her and the murdered prince's father-in-law, the last husband of Constance, to represent them, and carried their fiery complaints to King Philip. King Philip summoned King John, as the holder of territory in France, to come before him and defend himself. King John refusing to appear, King Philip declared him false, perjured, and guilty, and again made war. In a little time, by conquering the greater part of his French territory, King Philip deprived him of one-third of his dominions, and, through all the fighting that took place, King John was always found either to be eating and drinking like a gluttonous fool when the danger was at a distance, or to be running away like a beaten cur when it was near. You might suppose that when he was losing his dominions at this rate, and when his own nobles cared so little for him or his cause that they plainly refused to follow his banner out of England, he had enemies enough. But he made another enemy of the Pope, which he did in this way. The Archbishop of Canterbury dying, and the junior monks of that place wishing to get the start of the senior monks in the appointment of his successor, met together at midnight, secretly elected a certain Reginald, and sent him off to Rome to get the Pope's approval. The senior monks and the King soon finding this out, and being very angry about it, the junior monks gave way, and all the monks together elected the Bishop of Norwich, who was the King's favourite. The Pope, hearing the whole story, declared that neither election would do for him, and that he elected Stephen Langton. The monks, submitting to the Pope, the King turned them all out bodily and banished them as traitors. The Pope sent three bishops to the King to threaten him with an interdict. The King told the bishops that if any interdict was laid upon his kingdom, he would tear out the eyes and cut off the noses of all the monks he could lay hold of, and send them over to Rome, in that undecorated state, as a present for their master. The bishops, nevertheless, soon published the interdict, and fled. After it had lasted a year, the Pope proceeded to his next step, which was excommunication. King John was declared excommunicated with all the usual ceremonies. The King was so incensed at this, and was made so desperate by the disaffection of his barons and the hatred of his people, that it is said he even privately sent ambassadors to the Turks in Spain, offering to renounce his religion and hold his kingdom of them if they would help him. It is related that the ambassadors were admitted to the presence of the Turkish emir through long lines of Moorish guards and that they found the emir with his eyes seriously fixed on the pages of a large book, from which he never once looked up, that they gave him a letter from the king containing his proposals, and were gravely dismissed, that presently the emir sent for one of them, and conjured by him, by his faith in his religion, to say what kind of a man the king of England truly was, that the ambassador, thus pressed, replied that the King of England was a false tyrant against whom his own subjects would soon rise, and that was quite enough for the emir. Money being in his position the next best thing to men, King John spared no means of getting it. He set on foot another oppressing and torturing of the unhappy Jews, which was quite in his way, and invented a new punishment for one wealthy Jew of Bristol. Until such a time as that Jew should produce a certain large sum of money, the king sentenced him to be imprisoned, and every day to have one tooth violently wrenched out of his head, beginning with the double teeth. For seven days the oppressed man bore the daily pain and lost the daily tooth, but on the eighth he paid the money. With the treasure raised in such ways, the king made an expedition into Ireland, where some English nobles had revolted. It was one of the very few places from which he did not run away, because no resistance was shown. He made another expedition into Wales, whence he did run away in the end, but not before he had got from the Welsh people, as hostages, twenty-seven young men of the best families, every one of whom he caused to be slain in the following year. To interdict and excommunication the Pope now added his last sentence, deposition. He proclaimed John no longer king, absolved all subjects from their allegiance, and sent Stephen Langton and others to the King of France to tell him that, if he would invade England, he should be forgiven all his sins, at least should be forgiven them by the Pope, if that would do. As there was nothing that King Philip desired more than to invade England, he collected a great army at Rouen, and a fleet of seventeen hundred ships to bring them over. But 
the English people, however bitterly they hated the King, were not a people to suffer invasion quietly. They flocked to Dover, where the English standard was, in such great numbers to enrol themselves as defenders of their native land, that there were not provisions for them, and the King could only select and retain sixty thousand. But at this crisis the Pope, who had his own reasons for objecting to either King John or King Philip being too powerful, interfered. He entrusted a legate, whose name was Pandolf, with the easy task of frightening King John. He sent him to the English camp from France to terrify him with exaggerations of King Philip's power and his own weakness in the discontent of the English barons and people. Pandolf discharged his commission so well that King John, in a wretched panic, consented to acknowledge the Stephen Langton, to resign his kingdom to God, St. Peter, and St. Paul, which meant the Pope, and to hold it ever afterwards by the Pope's leave, on payment of an annual sum of money. To this shameful contract he publicly bound himself in the church of the Knights Templars at Dover, where he laid at the legate's feet a part of the tribute, which the legate haughtily trampled upon. But they do say that this was merely a genteel flourish, and that he was afterwards seen to pick it up and pocket it. There was an unfortunate prophet, the name of Peter, who had greatly increased King John's terrors by predicting that he would be unknighted, which the king supposed to signify that he would die, before the Feast of the Ascension should be passed. That was the day after this humiliation. When the next morning came, and the king, who had been trembling all night, found himself alive and safe, he ordered the prophet, and his son too, to be dragged through the streets at the tails of horses, and then hanged, for having frightened him. As King John had now submitted, the Pope, to King Philip's great astonishment, took him under his protection, and informed King Philip that he found he could not give him leave to invade England. The angry Philip resolved to do it without his leave, but he gained nothing and lost much, for the English, commanded by the Earl of Salisbury, went over in five hundred ships to the French coast, before the French fleet had sailed away from it, and utterly defeated the whole. The Pope then took off his three sentences, one after another, and empowered Stephen Langton publicly to receive King John into the favour of the Church again, and to ask him to dinner. The King, who hated Langton with all his might and main, and with reason too, for he was a great and a good man, with whom such a king could have no sympathy, pretended to cry and to be very grateful. There was a little difficulty about settling how much the king should pay as a recompense to the clergy for the losses he'd caused them, but the end of it was that the superior clergy got a good deal, and the inferior clergy got little or nothing, which has also happened since King John's time, I believe. When all these matters were arranged, the king in his triumph became more fierce and false and insolent to all around him than he had ever been. An alliance of sovereigns against King Philip gave him an opportunity of landing an army in France, with which he even took a town. But on the French king's gaining a great victory he ran away, of course, and made a truce for five years. And now the time approached, when he was to be still further humbled, and made to feel, if he could feel anything, what a wretched creature he was. Of all men in the world Stephen Langton seemed raised up by heaven to oppose and subdue him. When he ruthlessly burnt and destroyed the property of his own subjects, because their lords, the barons, would not serve him abroad, Stephen Langton fearlessly reproved and threatened him. When he swore to restore the laws of King Edward, or the laws of King Henry I, Stephen Langton knew his falsehood, and pursued him through all his evasions. When the barons met at the Abbey of St. Edmundsbury to consider their wrongs and the King's oppressions, Stephen Langton roused them by his fervid words to demand a solemn charter of rights and liberties from their perjured master, and to swear, one by one, on the high altar, that they would have it, or would wage war against him to the death. When the King hid himself in London from the barons, and was at last obliged to receive them, they told him roundly that they would not believe him unless Stephen Langton became a surety that he would keep his word. 
when he took the cross to invest himself with some interest and belong to something that was received with favour, Stephen Langton was still immovable. When he appealed to the Pope, and the Pope wrote to Stephen Langton in behalf of his new favourite, Stephen Langton was deaf even to the Pope himself, and saw before him nothing but the welfare of England and the crimes of the English King. At Easter time the barons assembled at Stamford in Lincolnshire in proud array, and, marching near to Oxford, where the King was, delivered into the hands of Stephen Langton and two others a list of grievances. And these, they said, he must redress, or we will do it for ourselves. When Stephen Langton told the King as much, and read the list to him, he went half mad with rage but that did him no more good than his afterwards trying to pacify the barons with lies. They called themselves and their followers the Army of God and the Holy Church. Marching through the country, with the people thronging to them everywhere, except at Northampton where they failed in an attack upon the castle, they at last triumphantly set up their banner in London itself, whither the whole land, tired of the tyrant, seemed to flock to join them. Seven knights alone, of all the knights in England, remained with the King, who, reduced to this strait, at last sent the Earl of Pembroke to the barons to say that he approved of everything, and would meet them to sign their charter when they would. Then, said the barons, let the day be the fifteenth of June, and the place Runnymede. On Monday the fifteenth of June, one thousand two hundred and fourteen, the King came from Windsor Castle, and the Barons came from the town of Staines, and they met on Runnymede, which is still a pleasant meadow by the Thames, where rushes grow in the clear water of the winding river, and its banks are green with grass and trees. On the side of the Barons came the general of their army, Robert Fitzwalter, and a great concourse of the nobility of England. With the King came, in all, some four-and-twenty persons of any note, most of whom despised him, and were merely his advisers in form. On that great day, and in that great company, the King signed Magna Charter, the Great Charter of England, by which he pledged himself to maintain the Church in its rights, to relieve the barons of oppressive obligations as vassals of the Crown, of which the barons in their turn pledged themselves to relieve their vassals, the people, to respect the liberties of London and all other cities and boroughs, to protect foreign merchants who came to England, to imprison no man without a fair trial, and to sell, delay, or deny justice to none. As the barons knew his falsehood well, they further required, as their securities, that he should send out of his kingdom all his foreign troops, that for two months they should hold possession of the city of London, and Stephen Langton of the Tower, and that five and twenty of their body, chosen by themselves, should be a lawful committee to watch the keeping of the charter, and to make war upon him if he broke it. All this he was obliged to yield. He signed the charter with a smile, and, if he could have looked agreeable, would have done so as he departed from the splendid assembly. When he got home to Windsor Castle he was quite a madman in his helpless fury, and he broke the charter immediately afterwards. He sent abroad for foreign soldiers, and sent to the Pope for help, and plotted to take London by surprise, while the barons should be holding a great tournament at Stamford, which they had agreed to hold there as the celebration of the charter. The barons, however, found him out and put it off. Then, when the barons desired to see him and tax him with his treachery, he made numbers of appointments with them, and kept none, and shifted from place to place, and was constantly sneaking and skulking about. At last he appeared at Dover, to join his foreign soldiers, of whom numbers came into his pay, and with them he besieged and took Rochester Castle, which was occupied by knights and soldiers of the barons. He would have hanged them, every one, but the leader of the foreign soldiers, fearful of what the English people might afterwards do to him, interfered to save the knights. Therefore the king was fain to satisfy his vengeance with the death of all the common men. Then he sent the Earl of Salisbury with one portion of his army to ravage the eastern part of his own dominions, while he carried fire and slaughter into the northern part, torturing, plundering, 
killing and inflicting every possible cruelty upon the people, and every morning setting a worthy example to his men by setting fire, with his own monster hands, to the house where he had slept last night. Nor was this all, for the Pope, coming to the aid of his precious friend, laid the kingdom under an interdict again, because the people took part with the barons. It did not much matter, for the people had grown so used to it now that they began to think nothing about it. It occurred to them, and perhaps to Stephen Langton too, that they could keep their churches open, and ring their bells, without the Pope's permission, as well as with it. So they tried the experiment, and found that it succeeded perfectly. It being now impossible to bear the country as a wilderness of cruelty, or longer to hold any terms with such a forsworn outlaw of a king, the barons sent to Louis, son of the French monarch, to offer him the English crown, caring as little for the Pope's excommunication of him if he accepted the offer, as it is possible his father may have cared for the Pope's forgiveness of his sins, he landed at Sandwich, King John immediately running away from Dover, where he happened to be, and went on to London. The Scottish king, with whom many of the northern English lords had taken refuge, numbers of the foreign soldiers, numbers of the barons, and numbers of the people went over to him every day, King John, the while, continually running away in all directions. The career of Louis was checked, however, by the suspicions of the barons, founded on the dying declaration of a French lord, that when the kingdom was conquered he was sworn to banish them as traitors, and to give their estates to some of his own nobles. Rather than suffer this, some of the barons hesitated. Others even went over to King John. It seemed to be the turning point of King John's fortunes, for in his savage and murderous course he had now taken some towns and met with some success. But happily for England, and humanity, his death was near. Crossing a dangerous quicksand, called the Wash, not very far from Wisbeach, the tide came up and nearly drowned his army. He and his soldiers escaped, but, looking back from the shore when he was safe, he saw the roaring water sweep down in a torrent, overturn the wagons, horses, and men that carried his treasure, and engulf them in a raging whirlpool from which nothing could be delivered. Cursing and swearing and gnawing his fingers, he went on to Swinestead Abbey, where the monks set before him quantities of pears and peaches and new cider, some say poison too, but there is very little reason to suppose so, of which he ate and drank in an immoderate and beastly way. All night he lay ill of a burning fever, and haunted with horrible fears. Next day they put him in a horse-litter and carried him to Sleaford Castle, where he passed another night of pain and horror. Next day they carried him, with greater difficulty than on the day before, to the castle of Newark-upon-Trent, and there, on the eighteenth of October, in the forty-ninth year of his age, and the seventeenth of his vile reign, was an end of this miserable brute. End of chapter 14「Chapter fifteen of a Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter sixteen. England under Henry the Third, called of Winchester. If any of the English barons remembered the murdered Arthur's sister, Eleanor, the fair maid of Brittany, shut up in her convent at Bristol, none among them spoke of her now, or maintained her right to the crown. The dead usurper's eldest boy, Henry by name, was taken by the Earl of Pembroke, the Marshal of England, to the city of Gloucester, and there crowned in great haste when he was only ten years old. As the crown itself had been lost with the king's treasure in the raging water, and as there was no time to make another, 
they put a circle of plain gold upon his head instead. "'We have been the enemies of this child's father,' said Lord Pembroke, a good and true gentleman, to the few lords who were present, and he merited our ill will. But the child himself is innocent, and his youth demands our friendship and protection. Those lords felt tenderly towards the little boy, remembering their own young children, and they bowed their heads and said, Long live King Henry the Third. Next, a great council met at Bristol, revised Magna Charta, and made Lord Pembroke regent or protector of England, as the king was too young to reign alone. The next thing to be done was to get rid of Prince Louis of France, and to win over those English barons who were still ranged under his banner. He was strong in many parts of England, and in London itself, and he held, among other places, a certain castle called the Castle of Mount Sorrel, in Leicestershire. To this fortress, after some skirmishing and truce-making, Lord Pembroke laid siege. Louis dispatched an army of six hundred knights and twenty thousand soldiers to relieve it. Lord Pembroke, who was not strong enough for such a force, retired with all his men. The army of the French prince, which had marched there with fire and plunder, marched away with fire and plunder, and came, in a boastful swaggering manner, to Lincoln. The town submitted, but the castle in the town, held by a brave widow lady, named Nicola de Camville, whose property it was, made such a sturdy resistance that the French count, in command of the army of the French prince, found it necessary to besiege this castle. While he was thus engaged, word was brought to him that Lord Pembroke, with four hundred knights, two hundred and fifty men with cross bows, and a stout force, both of horse and foot, was marching towards him. "'What care I?' said the French count. "'The Englishman is not so mad as to attack me and my great army in a walled town. But the Englishman did it for all that, and did it not so madly but so wisely.' that he decoyed the great army into the narrow, ill-paved lanes and byways of Lincoln, where its horse soldiers could not ride in any strong body, and there he made such havoc with them, that the whole force surrendered themselves prisoners, except the Count, who said that he would never yield to any English traitor alive, and accordingly got killed. The end of this victory, which the English called, for a joke, the fair of Lincoln, was the usual one in those times. The common men were slain without any mercy, and the knights and gentlemen paid ransom and went home. The wife of Louis, the fair Blanche of Castile, dutifully equipped a fleet of eighty good ships, and sent it over from France to her husband's aid. An English fleet of forty ships, some good and some bad, gallantly met them near the mouth of the Thames, and took or sunk sixty-five in one fight. This great loss put an end to the French prince's hopes. A treaty was made at Lambeth, in virtue of which the English barons, who had remained attached to his cause, returned to their allegiance and it was engaged on both sides that the prince and all his troops should retire peacefully to France. It was time to go, for war had made him so poor that he was obliged to borrow money from the citizens of London to pay his expenses home. Lord Pembroke afterwards applied himself to governing the country justly, and to healing the quarrels and disturbances that had arisen among men in the days of the bad King John. 
he caused Magna Charta to be still more improved, and so amended the forest laws that a peasant was no longer put to death for killing a stag in a royal forest, but was only imprisoned. It would have been well for England if it could have had so good a protector many years longer, but there was not to be. Within three years after the young king's coronation, Lord Pembroke died, and you may see his tomb at this day in the old temple church in London. The protectorship was now divided. Peter de Roches, whom King John had made Bishop of Winchester, was entrusted with the care of the person of the young sovereign, and the exercise of the royal authority was confided to Earl Hubert de Burr. These two personages had from the first no liking for each other, and soon became enemies. When the young king was declared of age, Peter de Roches, finding that Hubert increased in power and favour, retired discontentedly and went abroad. For nearly ten years afterwards, Hubert had full sway alone. But ten years is a long time to hold the favour of a king. This king, too, as he grew up, showed a strong resemblance to his father, in feebleness, inconsistency, and irresolution. The best that can be said of him is that he was not cruel. De Roche's coming home again, after ten years, and being a novelty, the king began to favour him and to look coldly on Hubert. Wanting money besides, and having made Hubert rich, he began to dislike Hubert. At last he was made to believe, or pretended to believe, that Hubert had misappropriated some of the royal treasure, and ordered him to furnish an account of all he had done in his administration. Besides which, the foolish charge was brought against Hubert, that he had made himself the king's favourite by magic. Hubert very well knowing that he could never defend himself against such nonsense, and that his old enemy must be determined on his ruin. Instead of answering, the charges fled to Merton Abbey. Then the king, in a violent passion, sent for the mayor of London, and said to the mayor, Take twenty thousand citizens, and drag me Hubert de Burr out of that abbey, and bring him here. The mayor posted off to do it, but the archbishop of Dublin, who was a friend of Hubert's, warning the king that an abbey was a sacred place, and that if he committed any violence there, he must answer for it to the church. The king changed his mind and called the mayor back, and declared that Hubert should have four months to prepare his defence, and should be safe and free during that time. Hubert who relied upon the king's word, though I think he was old enough to have known better, came out of Merton Abbey upon these conditions, and journeyed away to see his wife, a Scottish princess, who was then at St. Edmund's Bury. Almost as soon as he had departed from the sanctuary, his enemies persuaded the weak king to send out one Sir Godfrey de Crancombe, who commanded three hundred vagabonds called the Black Band, with orders to seize him. They came up with him at a little town in Essex, called Brentwood, when he was in bed. He leaped out of bed, got out of the house, fled to the church, ran up to the altar, and laid his hand upon the cross. Sir Godfrey and the Black Band, caring neither for church, altar nor cross, dragged him forth to the church door, with their drawn swords flashing round his head, and sent for a smith to rivet a set of chains upon him. When the smith, I wish I knew his name, was brought, all dark and swarthy with the smoke of his forge, 
and panting with the speed he had made, and the black band, falling aside to show him the prisoner, cried with a loud uproar, Make the fetters heavy, make them strong. The smith dropped upon his knee, but not to the black band, and said, This is the brave Earl Hubert de Burr, who fought at Dover Castle, and destroyed the French fleet, and has done his country much good service. You may kill me, if you like, but I will never make a chain for Earl Hubert de Burr. The black band never blushed, or they might have blushed at this. They knocked the smith about from one to another, and swore at him, and tied the earl on horseback, undressed as he was, and carried him off to the Tower of London. The bishops, however, were so indignant at the violation of the sanctuary of the church, that the frightened king soon ordered the black band to take him back again, at the same time commanding the sheriff of Essex to prevent his escaping out of Brentwood Church. Well, the sheriff dug a deep trench all round the church, and erected a high fence, and watched the church night and day. The black band and their captain watched it too, like three hundred and one black wolves. For thirty-nine days Hubert de Burr remained within. At length, upon the fortieth day, cold and hunger were too much for him, and he gave himself up to the black band, who carried him off, for the second time, to the tower. When his trial came on, he refused to plead, but at last it was arranged that he should give up all the royal lands which had been bestowed upon him, and should be kept at the castle of Devizes, in what was called free prison, in charge of four knights appointed by four lords. There he remained almost a year, until, learning that a follower of his old enemy the bishop was made keeper of the castle, and fearing that he might be killed by treachery, he climbed the ramparts one dark night, dropped from the top of the high castle wall into the moat, and coming safely to the ground, took refuge in another church. From this place he was delivered by a party of horse dispatched to his help by some nobles, who were by this time in revolt against the king and assembled in Wales. He was finally pardoned and restored to his estates, but he lived privately, and never more aspired to a high post in the realm, or to a high place in the king's favour. And thus end, more happily than the stories of many favourites of kings, the adventures of Earl Hubert de Burr. The nobles, who had risen in revolt, were stirred up to rebellion by the overbearing conduct of the Bishop of Winchester, who, finding that the King secretly hated the great charter which had been forced from his father, did his utmost to confirm him in that dislike, and in the preference he showed to foreigners over the English. Of this, and of his even publicly declaring that the barons of England were inferior to those of France, the English lords complained with such bitterness that the king, finding them well supported by the clergy, became frightened for his throne, and sent away the bishop and all his foreign associates. On his marriage, however, with Eleanor, a French lady, the daughter of the Count of Provence, he openly favoured the foreigners again, and so many of his wife's relations came over, and made such an immense family party at court, and got so many good things, and pocketed so much money, and were so high with the English whose money they pocketed, that the bolder English barons murmured openly about a clause there was in the Great Charter, which provided for the banishment of unreasonable favourites. But the foreigners only laughed disdainfully, 
and said, What are your English laws to us? King Philip of France had died, and had been succeeded by Prince Louis, who had also died after a short reign of three years, and had been succeeded by his son of the same name, so moderate and just a man that he was not the least in the world like a king, as kings went. Isabella, King Henry's mother, wished very much, for a certain spite she had, that England should make war against this king, and, as King Henry was a mere puppet in anybody's hands who knew how to manage his feebleness, she easily carried her point with him. But the Parliament were determined to give him no money for such a war. So, to defy the Parliament, he packed up thirty large casks of silver. I don't know how he got so much. I dare say he screwed it out of the miserable Jews, and put them aboard ship, and went away himself to carry war into France, accompanied by his mother and his brother Richard, Earl of Cornwall, who was rich and clever. But he only got well beaten and came home. The good humour of the Parliament was not restored by this. They reproached the king with wasting the public money to make greedy foreigners rich, and were so stern with him, and so determined not to let him have more of it to waste if they could help it that he was at his wit's end for some, and tried so shamelessly to get all he could from his subjects, by excuses or by force, that the people used to say the king was the sturdiest beggar in England. He took the cross, thinking to get some money by that means, but, as it was very well known that he never meant to go on a crusade, he got none. In all this contention the Londoners were particularly keen against the king, and the king hated them warmly in return. Hating or loving, however, made no difference. He continued in the same condition for nine or ten years, when at last the baron said that if he would solemnly confirm their liberties afresh, the Parliament would vote him a large sum. As he readily consented, there was a great meeting held in Westminster Hall, one pleasant day in May, when all the clergy, dressed in their robes and holding every one of them a burning candle in his hand, stood up, the barons being also there, while the Archbishop of Canterbury read the sentence of excommunication against any man and all men who should henceforth in any way infringe the great charter of the kingdom. When he had done, they all put out their burning candles with a curse upon the soul of any one and every one who should merit that sentence. The king concluded with an oath to keep the charter, as I am a man, as I am a Christian, as I am a knight as I am a king. It was easy to make oaths, and easy to break them, and the king did both, as his father had done before him. He took to his old courses again when he was supplied with money, and soon cured of their weakness the few who had ever really trusted him. When his money was gone, and he was once more borrowing and begging everywhere with a meanness worthy of his nature, he got into a difficulty with the Pope respecting the crown of Sicily, which the Pope said he had a right to give away, and which he offered to King Henry for his second son, Prince Edmund. But if you or I give away what we have not got, and what belongs to somebody else, it is likely that the person to whom we give it will have some trouble in taking it. It was exactly so in this case. It was necessary to conquer the Sicilian crown before it could be put upon young Edmund's head. 
It could not be conquered without money. The Pope ordered the clergy to raise money. The clergy, however, were not so obedient to him as usual. They had been disputing with him for some time about his unjust preference of Italian priests in England, and they had begun to doubt whether the king's chaplain, whom he allowed to be paid for preaching in seven hundred churches, could possibly be, even by the Pope's favour, in seven hundred places at once. The Pope and the King together, said the Bishop of London, may take the mitre off my head, but, if they do, they will find that I shall put on a soldier's helmet. I pay nothing. The Bishop of Worcester was as bold as the Bishop of London, and would pay nothing either. Such sums as the more timid or the more helpless of the clergy did raise were squandered away, without doing any good to the king, or bringing the Sicilian crown an inch nearer to Prince Edmund's head. The end of the business was that the Pope gave the crown to the brother of the King of France, who conquered it for himself, and sent the King of England in a bill of one hundred thousand pounds for the expenses of not having won it. The King was now so much distressed that we might almost pity him, if it were possible to pity a king so shabby and ridiculous. His clever brother, Richard, had bought the title of King of the Romans from the German people, and was no longer near him to help him with advice. The clergy, resisting the very Pope, were in alliance with the barons. The barons were headed by Simon de Montfort, Earl of Leicester, married to King Henry's sister, and, though a foreigner himself, the most popular man in England against the foreign favourites. When the king next met his parliament, the barons, led by this earl, came before him, armed from head to foot, and cased in armour. When the parliament again assembled, in a month's time, at Oxford, this earl was at their head, and the king was obliged to consent, on oath, to what was called a committee of government, consisting of twenty-four members, twelve chosen by the barons, and twelve chosen by himself. But, at a good time for him, his brother Richard came back. Richard's first act, the barons would not admit him into England on other terms, was to swear to be faithful to the committee of government, which he immediately began to oppose with all his might. Then the barons began to quarrel among themselves, especially the proud Earl of Gloucester with the Earl of Leicester, who went abroad in disgust. Then the people began to be dissatisfied with the barons, because they did not do enough for them. The king's chances seemed so good again at length, that he took heart enough, or caught it from his brother, to tell the committee of government that he abolished them, as to his oath, never mind that, the Pope said, and to seize all the money in the mint, and to shut himself up in the Tower of London. Here he was joined by his eldest son, Prince Edward, and, from the Tower, he made public a letter of the Pope's to the world in general, informing all men that he had been an excellent and just king for five and forty years. As everybody knew he had been nothing of the sort, nobody cared much for this document. It so chanced that the proud Earl of Gloucester dying was succeeded by his son, and that his son, instead of being the enemy of the Earl of Leicester, was, for the time, his friend. It fell out, therefore, that these two earls joined their forces, took several of the royal castles in the country, and advanced as hard as they could on London. The London people, always opposed to the king, 
declared for them with great joy. The king himself remained shut up, not at all gloriously, in the tower. Prince Edward made the best of his way to Windsor Castle. His mother, the queen, attempted to follow him by water, but the people seeing her barge rowing up the river and hated her with all their hearts, ran to London Bridge, got together a quantity of stones and mud, and pelted the barge as it came through, crying furiously, Drown the witch! Drown her! They were so near doing it that the mayor took the old lady under his protection and shut her up in St. Paul's until the danger was past. It would require a great deal of writing on my part and a great deal of reading on yours to follow the king through his disputes with the barons and to follow the barons through their disputes with one another. So I will make short work of it for both of us and only relate the chief events that arose out of these quarrels. The good king of France was asked to decide between them. He gave it as his opinion that the king must maintain the great charter, and that the barons must give up the committee of government, and all the rest that had been done by the parliament at Oxford, which the royalists, or king's party, scornfully called the mad parliament. The barons declared that these were not fair terms, and they would not accept them. Then they caused the great bell of St. Paul's to be tolled, for the purpose of rousing up the London people, who armed themselves at the dismal sound and formed quite an army in the streets. I am sorry to say, however, that instead of falling upon the king's party with whom their quarrel was, they fell upon the miserable Jews, and killed at least five hundred of them. They pretended that some of these Jews were on the king's side, and that they kept hidden in their houses, for the destruction of the people, a certain terrible composition called Greek fire, which could not be put out with water, but only burnt the fiercer for it. What they really did keep in their houses was money, and this their cruel enemies wanted and this their cruel enemies took, like robbers and murderers. The Earl of Leicester put himself at the head of these Londoners and other forces, and followed the king to Lewes in Sussex, where he lay encamped with his army. Before giving the king's forces battle here, the Earl addressed his soldiers, and said that King Henry the Third had broken so many oaths that he had become the enemy of God, and therefore they would wear white crosses on their breasts, as if they were arrayed, not against a fellow Christian, but against a Turk. White crossed accordingly, they rushed into the fight. They would have lost the day, the king having on his side all the foreigners in England, and from Scotland, John Common, John Balliol, and Robert Bruce, with all their men, but for the impatience of Prince Edward, who, in his hot desire to have vengeance on the people of London, threw the whole of his father's army into confusion. He was taken prisoner, so was the king, so was the king's brother, the king of the Romans, and five thousand Englishmen were left dead upon the bloody grass. For this success the Pope excommunicated the Earl of Leicester, which neither the Earl nor the people cared at all about. The people loved him and supported him, and he became the real king, having all the power of the government in his own hands though he was outwardly respectful to King Henry the Third, whom he took with him wherever he went, like a poor old limp court card. He summoned a parliament in the year 1265, 
which was the first parliament in England that the people had any real share in electing, and he drew more and more in favour with the people every day, and they stood by him in whatever he did. Many of the other barons, and particularly the Earl of Gloucester, who had become by this time as proud as his father, grew jealous of this powerful and popular earl, who was proud too, and began to conspire against him. Since the Battle of Lewes, Prince Edward had been kept as a hostage, and, though he was otherwise treated like a prince, had never been allowed to go out without attendance appointed by the Earl of Leicester, who watched him. The conspiring lords found means to propose to him, in secret, that they should assist him to escape, and should make him their leader, to which he very heartily consented. So, on a day that was agreed upon, he said to his attendants after dinner, being then at Hereford, I should like to ride on horseback this fine afternoon a little way into the country, as they, too, thought it would be very pleasant to have a canter in the sunshine. They all rode out of the town together in a gay little troop. When they came to a fine level piece of turf, the prince fell to comparing their horses one with another, and offering bets that one was faster than another, and the attendants, suspecting no harm, rode galloping matches until their horses were quite tired. The prince rode no matches himself, but looked on from his saddle, and staked his money. Thus they passed the whole merry afternoon. Now the sun was setting, and they were all going slowly up a hill. The prince's horse very fresh, and all the other horses very weary, when a strange rider mounted on a grey steed appeared at the top of the hill and waved his hat. "'What does the fellow mean?' said the attendants, one to another. The prince answered on the instant, by setting spurs to his horse, dashing away at his utmost speed, joining the man, riding into the midst of a little crowd of horsemen, who were then seen waiting under some trees, and who closed around him, and so he departed in a cloud of dust, leaving the road empty of all but the baffled attendants, who sat looking at one another, while their horses drooped their ears and panted. The prince joined the Earl of Gloucester at Ludlow, the Earl of Leicester, with a part of the army, and the stupid old king, was at Hereford. One of the Earl of Leicester's sons, Simon de Montfort, with another part of the army, was in Sussex. To prevent these two parts from uniting was the prince's first object. He attacked Simon de Montfort by night, defeated him, seized his banners and treasure, and forced him into Kenilworth Castle in Warwickshire, which belonged to his family. His father, the Earl of Leicester, in the meanwhile, not knowing what had happened, marched out of Hereford, with his part of the army and the king, to meet him. He came on a bright morning in August to Evesham, which is watered by the pleasant river Avon, Looking rather anxiously across the prospect toward Kenilworth, he saw his own banners advancing, and his face brightened with joy. But it clouded darkly when he presently perceived that the banners were captured, and in the enemy's hands, and he said, It is over. The Lord have mercy on our souls, for our bodies are Prince Edward's. He fought like a true knight, nevertheless. When his horse was killed under him, he fought on foot. It was a fierce battle, and the dead lay in heaps everywhere. The old king stuck up in a suit of armour on a big war horse, which didn't mind him at all, 
with which carried him into all sorts of places where he didn't want to go, got into everybody's way, and very nearly got knocked on the head by one of his son's men. But he managed to pipe out, I am Harry of Winchester, and the prince, who heard him, seized his bridle, and took him out of peril. The Earl of Leicester still fought bravely, until his best son Henry was killed, and the bodies of his best friends choked his path, and then he fell, still fighting, sword in hand. They mangled his body, and sent it as a present to a noble lady, but a very unpleasant lady, I should think, who was the wife of his worst enemy. They could not mangle his memory in the minds of the faithful people, though. Many years afterwards they loved him more than ever, and regarded him as a saint, and always spoke of him as Sir Simon the Righteous. And even though he was dead, the cause for which he had fought still lived, and was strong, and forced itself upon the king in the very hour of victory. Henry found himself obliged to respect the great charter, however much he hated it, and to make laws similar to the laws of the great Earl of Leicester, and to be moderate and forgiving towards the people at last, even towards the people of London, who had so long opposed him. There were more risings before all this was done, but they were set at rest by these means, and Prince Edward did his best in all things to restore peace. One Sir Adam de Gordon was the last dissatisfied knight in arms, but the prince vanquished him in a single combat, in a wood, and nobly gave him his life, and became his friend, instead of slaying him. Sir Adam was not ungrateful. He ever afterwards remained devoted to his generous conqueror. When the troubles of the kingdom were thus calmed, Prince Edward and his cousin Henry took the cross, and went away to the Holy Land, with many English lords and knights. Four years afterwards the king of the Romans died, and next year, 1,272. His brother, the weak king of England, died. He was sixty-eight years old then, and had reigned fifty-six years. He was as much of a king in death as he had ever been in life. He was a mere pale shadow of a king at all times. End of chapter 15「Chapter sixteen of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, June 2007. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 16 England under Edward I, called Longshanks. It was now the year of our Lord, 1272, and Prince Edward, the heir to the throne, being away in the Holy Land, knew nothing of his father's death. The barons, however, proclaimed him king, immediately after the royal funeral, and the people very willingly consented since most men knew too well by this time what the horrors of a contest for the crown were. So King Edward I called, in a not very complimentary manner, Longshanks, because of the slenderness of his legs, was peacefully accepted by the English nation. His legs had need to be strong, however long and thin they were, for they had to support him through many difficulties on the fiery sands of Asia, where his small force of soldiers fainted, died, deserted, and seemed to melt away. 
But his prowess made light of it, and he said, I will go on, if I go on with no other follower than my groom. A prince of this spirit gave the Turks a deal of trouble. He stormed Nazareth, at which place, of all places on earth, I am sorry to relate, he made a frightful slaughter of innocent people, and then he went to Acre, where he got a truce of ten years from the Sultan. He had very nearly lost his life in Acre, through the treachery of a Saracen noble, called the Emir of Jaffa, who, making the pretense that he had some idea of turning Christian, and wanted to know all about that religion, sent a trusty messenger to Edward very often, with a dagger in his sleeve. At last, one Friday in Whitson week, when it was very hot, and all the sandy prospect lay beneath the blazing sun, burnt up like a great overdone biscuit, and Edward was lying on a couch, dressed for coolness in only a loose robe, the messenger, with his chocolate-coloured face, and his bright dark eyes and white teeth, came creeping in with a letter, and kneeled down like a tame tiger. But the moment Edward stretched out his hand to take the letter, the tiger made a spring at his heart. He was quick, but Edward was quick too. He seized the traitor by his chocolate throat, threw him to the ground, and slew him with the very dagger he had drawn. The weapon had struck Edward in the arm, and although the wound itself was slight, it threatened to be mortal, for the blade of the dagger had been smeared with poison. Thanks, however, to a better surgeon than was often to be found in those times, and to some wholesome herbs, and above all to his faithful wife Eleanor, who devotedly nursed him, and is said by some to have sucked the poison from the wound with her own red lips, which I am very willing to believe, Edward soon recovered, and was sound again. As the king his father had sent entreaties to him to return home, he now began the journey. He had got as far as Italy, when he met messengers who brought him intelligence of the king's death. Hearing that all was quiet at home, he made no haste to return to his own dominions, but paid a visit to the Pope, and went in state through various Italian towns, where he was welcomed with acclamations as a mighty champion of the cross from the Holy Land, and where he received presents of purple mantles and prancing horses, and went along in great triumph. The shouting people little knew that he was the last English monarch who would ever embark in a crusade, or that within twenty years every conquest which the Christians had made in the Holy Land, at the cost of so much blood, would be won back by the Turks. But all this came to pass. There was, and there is, an old town standing in a plain in France, called Chalon. When the king was coming towards this place on his way to England, a wily French lord, called the Count of Chalon, sent him a polite challenge to come with his knights and hold a fair tournament with the Count and his knights, and make a day of it with sword and lance. It was represented to the king that the Count of Chalon was not to be trusted, and that, instead of a holiday fight for mere show, and in good humour, he secretly meant a real battle, in which the English should be defeated by superior force. The king, however, nothing afraid, went to the appointed place on the appointed day, with a thousand followers. When the Count came with two thousand, and attacked the English in earnest, the English rushed at them with such valour that the Count's men and the Count's horses soon began to be tumbled down all over the field. The Count himself seized the King round the neck, but the King tumbled him out of his saddle in return for the compliment, and, jumping from his own horse, and standing over him, beat away at his iron armour like a blacksmith hammering on his anvil. Even when the Count owned himself defeated, and offered his sword, the King would not do him the honour to take it, but made him yield it up to a common soldier. There had been such fury shown in this fight, that it was afterwards called the Little Battle of Chalon. The English were very well disposed to be proud of their King after these adventures, so when he landed at Dover in the year 1274, being then thirty-six years old, and went on to Westminster, where he and his good queen were crowned with great magnificence, splendid rejoicings took place. For the coronation feast there were provided, among other eatables, four hundred oxen, four hundred sheep, four hundred and fifty pigs, eighteen wild boars, three hundred flitches of bacon, and twenty thousand fowls. 
the fountains and conduits in the street flowed with red and white wine instead of water, the rich citizens hung silks and cloths of the brightest colors out of their windows to increase the beauty of the show, and threw out gold and silver by whole handfuls to make scrambles for the crowd. In short, there was such eating and drinking, such music and capering, such a ringing of bells and tossing of caps, such a shouting and singing and reveling, as the narrow overhanging streets of old London City had not witnessed for many a long day. All the people were merry, except the poor Jews, who, trembling within their houses, and scarcely daring to peep out, began to foresee that they would have to find the money for this joviality sooner or later. To dismiss this sad subject of the Jews for the present, I am sorry to add that in this reign they were most unmercifully pillaged. They were hanged in great numbers, on accusations of having clipped the king's coin, which all kinds of people had done. They were heavily taxed, they were disgracefully badged, they were, on one day, thirteen years after the coronation, taken up with their wives and children, and thrown into beastly prisons, until they purchased their release by paying to the king twelve thousand pounds. Finally, every kind of property belonging to them was seized by the king, except so little as would defray the charge of their taking themselves away into foreign countries. Many years elapsed before the hope of gain induced any of their race to return to England, where they had been treated so heartlessly, and had suffered so much. If King Edward I had been as bad a king to Christians as he was to Jews, he would have been bad indeed but he was, in general, a wise and great monarch, under whom the country much improved. He had no love for the great charter, few kings had, through many, many years, but he had high qualities. The first bold object which he conceived when he came home was to unite, under one sovereign England, Scotland, and Wales, the two last of which countries had each a little king of its own, about whom the people were always quarrelling and fighting, and making a prodigious disturbance, a great deal more than he was worth. In the course of King Edward's reign he was engaged, besides, in a war with France. To make these quarrels clearer, we will separate their histories, and take them thus. Wales first, France second, Scotland third. Llewellyn was the Prince of Wales. He had been on the side of the barons in the reign of the stupid old king, but had afterwards sworn allegiance to him, when King Edward came to the throne, Llewellyn was required to swear allegiance to him also, which he refused to do. The king being crowned, and in his own dominions, three times more required Llewellyn to come and do homage, and three times more Llewellyn said he would rather not. He was going to be married to Eleanor de Montfort, a young lady of the family mentioned in the last reign, and it chanced that this young lady, coming from France with her youngest brother Emmerich, was taken by an English ship, and was ordered, by the English king, to be detained. Upon this the quarrel came to a head. The king went with his fleet to the coast of Wales, where, so encompassing Llewellyn, that he could only take refuge in the bleak mountain of Snowdon, in which no provisions could reach him, he was soon starved into an apology, and into a treaty of peace, and into paying the expenses of the war. The king, however, forgave him some of the hardest conditions of the treaty, and consented to his marriage, and he now thought he had reduced Wales to obedience. But the Welsh, although they were naturally a gentle, quiet, pleasant people, who liked to receive strangers in their cottages among the mountains, and to set before them with free hospitality whatever they had to eat and drink, and to play to them on their harps, and sing their native ballads to them, were a people of great spirit when their blood was up. Englishmen, after this affair, began to be insolent in Wales, and to assume the air of masters, and the Welsh pride could not bear it. Moreover, they believed in that unlucky old Merlin, some of whose unlucky old prophecies somebody always seemed doomed to remember when there was a chance of its doing harm. And just at this time some blind old gentleman with a harp and a long white beard, who was an excellent person, but had become of an unknown age and tedious, burst out with a declaration that Merlin had predicted that when English money had become round, a Prince of Wales would be crowned in London. Now King Edward had recently forbidden the English penny to be cut into halves and quarters for halfpence and farthings, 
and had actually introduced a round coin. Therefore the Welsh people said this was the time Merlin meant, and rose accordingly. King Edward had brought over Prince David, Llewellyn's brother, by heaping favours upon him. But he was the first to revolt, being perhaps troubled in his conscience. One stormy night he surprised the castle of Howarden, in possession of which an English nobleman had been left, killed the whole garrison, and carried off the nobleman, a prisoner to Snowdon. Upon this the Welsh people rose like one man, King Edward with his army, marching from Worcester to the Menai Strait, crossed it, near to where the wonderful tubular iron bridge now, in days so different, makes a passage for railway trains, by a bridge of boats that enabled forty men to march abreast. He subdued the island of Anglesey, and sent his men forward to observe the enemy. The sudden appearance of the Welsh created a panic among them, and they fell back to the bridge. The tide had in the meantime risen and separated the boats. The Welsh pursuing them, they were driven into the sea, and there they sunk, in their heavy iron armour, by thousands. After this victory Llewellyn, helped by the severe winter weather of Wales, gained another battle, but the king, ordering a portion of his English army to advance through South Wales, and catch him between two foes, and Llewellyn bravely turning to meet this new enemy, he was surprised and killed, very meanly, for he was unarmed and defenceless. His head was struck off and sent to London, where it was fixed upon the tower, encircled with a wreath, some say of ivy, some say of willow, some say of silver, to make it look like a ghastly coin in ridicule of the prediction. David, however, still held out for six months, though eagerly sought after by the king, and hunted by his own countrymen. One of them finally betrayed him with his wife and children. He was sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered, and from that time this became the established punishment of traitors in England, a punishment wholly without excuse, as being revolting, vile, and cruel, after its object is dead, and which has no sense in it, as its only real degradation, and that nothing can blot out, is to the country that permits on any consideration such abominable barbarity. Wales was now subdued, the queen giving birth to a young prince in the castle of Carnarvon. The king showed him to the Welsh people as their countryman, and called him Prince of Wales, a title that has ever since been borne by the heir apparent to the English throne, which that little prince soon became by the death of his elder brother. The king did better things for the Welsh than that, by improving their laws and encouraging their trade. Disturbances still took place, chiefly occasioned by the avarice and pride of the English lords, on whom Welsh lands and castles had been bestowed. But they were subdued, and the country never rose again. There is a legend that to prevent the people from being incited to rebellion by the songs of their bards and harpers, Edward had them all put to death. Some of them may have fallen among other men who held out against the king, but this general slaughter is, I think, a fancy of the harpers themselves, who, I dare say, made a song about it many years afterwards, and sang it by the Welsh firesides, until it came to be believed. The foreign war of the reign of Edward I arose in this way. The crews of two vessels, one a Norman ship, and the other an English ship, happened to go to the same place in their boats, to fill their casks with fresh water. Being rough, angry fellows, they began to quarrel, and then to fight, the English with their fists, the Normans with their knives, and in the fight a Norman was killed. The Norman crew, instead of revenging themselves upon those English sailors with whom they had quarrelled, who were too strong for them, I suspect, took to their ship again in a great rage, attacked the first English ship they met, laid hold of an unoffending merchant who happened to be on board, and brutally hanged him in the rigging of their own vessel, with a dog at his feet. This so enraged the English sailors that there was no restraining them, and whenever, and wherever, English sailors met Norman sailors, they fell upon each other tooth and nail. The Irish and Dutch sailors took part with the English, the French and Guianese sailors helped the Normans, and thus the greater part of the mariners sailing over the sea became in their way as violent and raging as the sea itself when it is disturbed. King Edward's fame had been so high abroad 
that he had been chosen to decide a difference between France and another foreign power, and had lived upon the continent three years. At first neither he nor the French King Philip, the good Louis had been dead some time, interfered in these quarrels, but when a fleet of eighty English ships engaged and utterly defeated a Norman fleet of two hundred, in a pitched battle fought round a ship at anchor, in which no quarter was given, the matter became too serious to be passed over. King Edward, as Duke of Guienne, was summoned to present himself before the King of France, at Paris, and answer for the damage done by his sailor subjects. At first he sent the Bishop of London as his representative, and then his brother Edmund, who was married to the French Queen's mother. I am afraid Edmund was an easy man, and allowed himself to be talked over by his charming relations, the French court ladies. At all events he was induced to give up his brother's dukedom for forty days, as a mere form, the French king said, to satisfy his honour, and he was so very much astonished, when the time was out, to find that the French king had no idea of giving it up again, that I should not wonder if it hastened his death, which soon took place. King Edward was a king to win his foreign dukedom back, if it could be won by energy and valour. He raised a large army, renounced his allegiance as Duke of Guienne, and crossed the sea to carry war into France. Before any important battle was fought, however, a truce was agreed upon for two years, and in the course of that time the Pope effected a reconciliation. King Edward, who was now a widower, having lost his affectionate and good wife Eleanor, married the French king's sister, Margaret, and the Prince of Wales was contracted to the French king's daughter, Isabella. Out of bad things, good things sometimes arise. Out of this hanging of the innocent merchant, and the bloodshed and strife it caused, there came to be established one of the greatest powers that the English people now possess. The preparations for the war being very expensive, and King Edward greatly wanting money, and being very arbitrary in his ways of raising it, some of the barons began firmly to oppose him. Two of them, in particular, Humphrey Bohun, Earl of Hereford, and Roger Bigod, Earl of Norfolk, were so stout against him, that they maintained he had no right to command them to head his forces in Guienne, and flatly refused to go there. "'By heaven, Sir Earl,' said the king to the Earl of Hereford, in a great passion, "'you shall either go or be hanged.' "'By heaven, Sir King,' replied the Earl, "'I will neither go, nor yet will I be hanged.' And both he and the other Earl sturdily left the court, attended by many lords." The king tried every means of raising money. He taxed the clergy, in spite of all the Pope said to the contrary, and when they refused to pay, reduced them to submission, by saying, Very well, then they had no claim upon the government for protection, and any man might plunder them who would, which a good many men were very ready to do, and very readily did, and which the clergy found too losing a game to be played at long." He seized all the wool and leather in the hands of the merchants, promising to pay for it some fine day, and he set a tax upon the exportation of wool, which was so unpopular among the traders that it was called the evil toll. But all would not do. The barons, led by those two great earls, declared any taxes imposed without the consent of Parliament unlawful, and the Parliament refused to impose taxes, until the king should confirm afresh the two great charters, and should solemnly declare in writing that there was no power in the country to raise money from the people evermore, but the power of Parliament representing all ranks of the people. The king was very unwilling to diminish his own power by allowing this great privilege in the Parliament, but there was no help for it, and he at last complied. We shall come to another king by and by, who might have saved his head from rolling off, if he had profited by this example. The people gained other benefits in Parliament, from the good sense and wisdom of this king. Many of the laws were much improved, provision was made for the greater safety of travellers, and the apprehension of thieves and murderers, the priests were prevented from holding too much land, and so becoming too powerful, and justices of the peace were first appointed, though not at first under that name, in various parts of the country. And now we come to Scotland, which was the great and lasting trouble of the reign of King Edward I. 
About thirteen years after King Edward's coronation, Alexander the Third, the King of Scotland, died of a fall from his horse. He had been married to Margaret, King Edward's sister. All their children being dead, the Scottish crown became the right of a young princess, only eight years old, the daughter of Eric, King of Norway, who had married a daughter of the deceased sovereign. King Edward proposed that the maiden of Norway, as this princess was called, should be engaged to be married to his eldest son. But unfortunately, as she was coming over to England, she fell sick, and landing on one of the Orkney Islands, died there. A great commotion immediately began in Scotland, where as many as thirteen noisy claimants to the vacant throne started up and made a general confusion. King Edward, being much renowned for his sagacity and justice, it seems to have been agreed to refer the dispute to him. He accepted the trust, and went with an army to the borderland, where England and Scotland joined. There he called upon the Scottish gentlemen to meet him at the castle of Norham, on the English side of the river Tweed, and to that castle they came. But before he would take any step in the business, he required those Scottish gentlemen, one and all, to do homage to him as their superior lord, and when they hesitated, he said, By holy Edward, whose crown I wear, I will have my rights, or I will die in maintaining them. The Scottish gentlemen, who had not expected this, were disconcerted, and asked for three weeks to think about it. At the end of three weeks, another meeting took place, on a green plain on the Scottish side of the river. Of all the competitors for the Scottish throne, there were only two who had any real claim, in right of their near kindred to the royal family. These were John Balliol and Robert Bruce, and the right was, I have no doubt, on the side of John Balliol. At this particular meeting, John Balliol was not present, but Robert Bruce was, and on Robert Bruce being formally asked whether he acknowledged the King of England for his superior lord, he answered, plainly and distinctly, yes, he did. Next day John Balliol appeared, and said the same. This point settled, some arrangements were made for inquiring into their titles. The inquiry occupied a pretty long time, more than a year. While it was going on, King Edward took the opportunity of making a journey through Scotland, and calling upon the Scottish people of all degrees to acknowledge themselves his vassals, or be imprisoned until they did. In the meanwhile, commissioners were appointed to conduct the inquiry, a parliament was held at Berwick about it, the two claimants were heard at full length, and there was a vast amount of talking. At last, in the great hall of the castle of Berwick, the king gave judgment in favour of John Balliol, who, consenting to receive his crown by the King of England's favour and permission, was crowned at Scone, in an old stone chair which had been used for ages in the abbey there, at the coronations of Scottish kings. Then King Edward caused the great seal of Scotland, used since the late king's death, to be broken in four pieces, and placed in the English treasury, and considered that he now had Scotland, according to the common saying, under his thumb. Scotland had a strong will of its own yet, however. King Edward, determined that the Scottish king should not forget he was his vassal, summoned him repeatedly to come and defend himself and his judges before the English Parliament, when appeals from the decisions of Scottish courts of justice were being heard. At length John Balliol, who had no great heart of his own, had so much heart put into him by the brave spirit of the Scottish people, who took this as a national insult, that he refused to come any more. Thereupon the king further required him to help him in his war abroad, which was then in progress, and to give up, as security for his good behaviour in future, the three strong Scottish castles of Jedburgh, Roxburgh, and Berwick. Nothing of this being done, on the contrary, the Scottish people concealing their king among their mountains in the highlands, and showing a determination to resist, Edward marched to Berwick with an army of thirty thousand foot and four thousand horse, took the castle, and slew its whole garrison and the inhabitants of the town as well, men, women, and children. Lord Warren, Earl of Surrey, then went on to the castle of Dunbar, before which a battle was fought, and the whole Scottish army defeated with great slaughter. The victory being complete, the Earl of Surrey was left as guardian of Scotland. The principal offices in that kingdom were given to Englishmen, 
the more powerful Scottish nobles were obliged to come and live in England. The Scottish crown and scepter were brought away, and even the old stone chair was carried off and placed in Westminster Abbey, where you may see it now. Balliol had the Tower of London lent him for a residence, with permission to range about it within a circle of twenty miles. Three years afterwards he was allowed to go to Normandy, where he had estates, and where he passed the remaining six years of his life, far more happily, I dare say, than he had lived for a long while in angry Scotland. Now there was, in the west of Scotland, a gentleman of small fortune named William Wallace, the second son of a Scottish knight. He was a man of great size and great strength. He was very brave and daring. When he spoke to a body of his countrymen, he could rouse them in a wonderful manner by the power of his burning words. He loved Scotland dearly, and he hated England with his utmost might. The domineering conduct of the English, who now held the places of trust in Scotland, made them as intolerable to the proud Scottish people as they had been, under similar circumstances, to the Welsh. And no man in all Scotland regarded them with so much smothered rage as William Wallace. One day an Englishman in office, little knowing what he was, affronted him. Wallace instantly struck him dead, and taking refuge among the rocks and hills, and there joining with his countryman, Sir William Douglas, who was also in arms against King Edward, became the most resolute and undaunted champion of a people struggling for their independence that ever lived upon the earth. The English guardian of the kingdom fled before him, and thus encouraged, the Scottish people revolted everywhere, and fell upon the English without mercy. The Earl of Surrey, by the King's commands, raised all the power of the border counties, and two English armies poured into Scotland. Only one chief, in the face of those armies, stood by Wallace, who, with a force of forty thousand men, awaited the invaders at a place on the river Forth, within two miles of Stirling. Across the river there was only one poor wooden bridge, called the Bridge of Kildene, so narrow that but two men could cross it abreast. With his eyes upon this bridge, Wallace posted the greater part of his men among some rising grounds, and waited calmly. When the English army came up on the opposite bank of the river, messengers were sent forward to offer terms. Wallace sent them back with a defiance, in the name of the freedom of Scotland. Some of the officers of the Earl of Surrey in command of the English, with their eyes also on the bridge, advised him to be discreet and not hasty. He, however, urged to immediate battle by some other officers, and particularly by Cressingham, King Edward's treasurer, and a rash man, gave the word of command to advance. One thousand English crossed the bridge, two abreast, the Scottish troops were as motionless as stone images. Two thousand English crossed, three thousand, four thousand, five. Not a feather all this time had been seen to stir among the Scottish bonnets. Now they all fluttered. "'Forward, one party, to the foot of the bridge!' cried Wallace, "'and let no more English cross. The rest, down with me on the five thousand who have come over, and cut them all to pieces.' It was done in the sight of the whole remainder of the English army, who could give no help. Cressingham himself was killed, and the Scotch made whips for the horses of his skin. King Edward was abroad at this time, and during the successes on the Scottish side which followed, and which enabled bold Wallace to win the whole country back again, and even to ravage the English borders. But after a few winter months the king returned, and took the field with more than his usual energy. One night, when a kick from his horse, as they both lay on the ground together, broke two of his ribs, and a cry arose that he was killed, he leaped into his saddle, regardless of the pain he suffered, and rode through the camp, day then appearing, he gave the word, still, of course, in that bruised and aching state, forward, and led his army on to near Falkirk, where the Scottish forces were seen drawn up on some stony ground behind a morass. Here he defeated Wallace, and killed fifteen thousand of his men. With the shattered remainder, Wallace drew back to Stirling, but, being pursued, set fire to the town that it might give no help to the English, and escaped. The inhabitants of Perth afterwards set fire to their houses for the same reason, and the king, unable to find provisions, was forced to withdraw his army. Another Robert Bruce, 
the grandson of him who had disputed the Scottish crown with Balliol, was now in arms against the king, that elder Bruce being dead, and also John Comyn, Balliol's nephew. These two young men might agree in opposing Edward, but could agree in nothing else, as they were rivals for the throne of Scotland. Probably it was because they knew this, and knew what troubles must arise, even if they could hope to get the better of the great English king, that the principal Scottish people applied to the Pope for his interference. The Pope, on the principle of losing nothing for want of trying to get it, very coolly claimed that Scotland belonged to him, but this was a little too much, and the Parliament in a friendly manner told him so. In the springtime of the year 1303, the King sent Sir John Seagrave, whom he made Governor of Scotland, with twenty thousand men, to reduce the rebels. Sir John was not as careful as he should have been, but encamped at Roslyn, near Edinburgh, with his army divided into three parts. The Scottish forces saw their advantage, fell on each part separately, defeated each, and killed all the prisoners. Then came the King himself once more, as soon as a great army could be raised, he passed through the whole north of Scotland, laying waste whatsoever came in his way, and he took up his winter quarters at Dunfermline. The Scottish cause now looked so hopeless that Comyn and the other nobles made submission and received their pardons. Wallace alone stood out. He was invited to surrender, though on no distinct pledge that his life should be spared, but he still defied the ireful king, and lived among the steep crags of the highland glens, where the eagles made their nests, and where the mountain torrents roared, and the white snow was deep, and the bitter winds blew round his unsheltered head, as he lay through many a pitch-dark night, wrapped up in his plaid. Nothing could break his spirit, nothing could lower his courage, nothing could induce him to forget or to forgive his country's wrongs. Even when the castle of Stirling, which had long held out, was besieged by the king with every kind of military engine then in use, even when the lead upon cathedral roofs was taken down to help to make them, even when the king, though an old man, commanded in the siege as if he were a youth, being so resolved to conquer, even when the brave garrison, then found with amazement to be not two hundred people, including several ladies, were starved and beaten out, and were made to submit on their knees, and with every form of disgrace that could aggravate their sufferings, even then, when there was not a ray of hope in Scotland, William Wallace was as proud and firm as if he had beheld the powerful and relentless Edward lying dead at his feet. Who betrayed William Wallace in the end is not quite certain. That he was betrayed, probably by an intendant, is too true. He was taken to the castle of Dumbarton, under Sir John Menteith, and thence to London, where the great fame of his bravery and resolution attracted immense concourses of people to behold him. He was tried in Westminster Hall, with a crown of laurel on his head. It is supposed because he was reported to have said that he ought to wear, or that he would wear, a crown there, and was found guilty as a robber, a murderer, and a traitor. What they called a robber, he said to those who tried him, he was, because he had taken spoil from the king's men. What they called a murderer, he was, because he had slain an insolent Englishman. What they called a traitor, he was not, for he had never sworn allegiance to the king, and had ever scorned to do it. He was dragged at the tails of horses to West Smithfield, and there hanged on a high gallows, torn open before he was dead, beheaded, and quartered. His head was set upon a pole on London Bridge, his right arm was sent to Newcastle, his left arm to Berwick, his legs to Perth and Aberdeen. But if King Edward had had his body cut into inches, and had sent every separate inch to a separate town, he could not have dispersed it half so far and wide as his fame. Wallace will be remembered in songs and stories, while there are songs and stories in the English tongue, and Scotland will hold him dear, while her lakes and mountains last. Released from this dreaded enemy, the king made a fairer plan of government for Scotland, divided the offices of honour among Scottish gentlemen and English gentlemen, forgave past offences, and thought in his old age that his work was done. But he deceived himself. Coleman and Bruce conspired, and made an appointment to meet at Dumfries, in the church of the Minorites. There is a story that Coleman was false to Bruce, and had informed against him to the king, 
that Bruce was warned of his danger and the necessity of flight by receiving one night as he sat at supper from his friend the Earl of Gloucester twelve pennies and a pair of spurs, that as he was riding angrily to keep his appointment through a snowstorm with his horse's shoes reversed that he might not be tracked, he met an evil-looking serving-man, a messenger of Coman, whom he killed, and concealed in whose dress he found letters that proved Coman's treachery. However this may be, they were likely enough to quarrel in any case, being hot-headed rivals, and whatever they quarrelled about, they certainly did quarrel in the church where they met, and Bruce drew his dagger and stabbed Coman, who fell upon the pavement. When Bruce came out, pale and disturbed, the friends who were waiting for him asked, "'What was the matter?' "'I think I have killed Coman,' said he. "'You only think so?' returned one of them. "'I will make sure,' and going into the church and finding him alive, stabbed him again and again. Knowing that the king would never forgive this new deed of violence, the party then declared Bruce king of Scotland, got him crowned at Scone, without the chair, and set up the rebellious standard once again. When the king heard of it he kindled with fiercer anger than he had ever shown yet. He caused the Prince of Wales and two hundred and seventy of the young nobility to be knighted. The trees in the temple gardens were cut down to make room for their tents, and they watched their armour all night, according to the old usage, some in the temple church, some in Westminster Abbey, and at the public feast which then took place, he swore by heaven, and by two swans covered with gold network, which his minstrels placed upon the table, that he would avenge the death of Coman, and would punish the false Bruce. And before all the company he charged the prince his son, in case that he should die before accomplishing his vow, not to bury him until it was fulfilled. Next morning the prince and the rest of the young knights rode away to the border country to join the English army, and the king, now weak and sick, followed in a horse-litter. Bruce, after losing a battle, and undergoing many dangers and much misery, fled to Ireland, where he lay concealed through the winter. That winter Edward passed in hunting down and executing Bruce's relations and adherents, sparing neither youth nor age, and showing no touch of pity or sign of mercy. In the following spring Bruce reappeared and gained some victories. In these frays both sides were grievously cruel. For instance, Bruce's two brothers, being taken captives, desperately wounded, were ordered by the king to instant execution. Bruce's friend, Sir John Douglas, taking his own castle of Douglas out of the hands of an English lord, roasted the dead bodies of the slaughtered garrison in a great fire made of every movable within it, which dreadful cookery his men called the Douglas larder. Bruce, still successful, however, drove the Earl of Pembroke and the Earl of Gloucester into the castle of Ayr, and laid siege to it. The king, who had been laid up all winter, but had directed the army from his sickbed, now advanced to Carlisle, and there, causing the litter in which he had travelled, to be placed in the cathedral as an offering to heaven, mounted his horse once more, and for the last time. He was now sixty-nine years old, and had reigned thirty-five years. He was so ill that in four days he could go no more than six miles. Still, even at that pace, he went on and resolutely kept his face towards the border. At length he lay down at the village of Burrow upon Sands, and there, telling those around him to impress upon the prince that he was to remember his father's vow, and was never to rest until he had thoroughly subdued Scotland, he yielded up his last breath. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen, England under Edward the Second. King Edward the Second, the first Prince of Wales, 
was twenty-three years old when his father died. There was a certain favorite of his, a young man from Gascony, named Piers Gaveston, of whom his father had so much disapproved that he had ordered him out of England, and had made his son swear by the side of his sick-bed never to bring him back. But the prince no sooner found himself king than he broke his oath, as so many other princes and kings did, they were far too ready to take oaths, and sent for his dear friend immediately. Now this same Gaveston was handsome enough, but was a reckless, insolent, audacious fellow. He was detested by the proud English lords, not only because he had such power over the king, and made the court such a dissipated place, but also because he could ride better than they at tournaments, and was used, in his impudence, to cut very bad jokes on them, calling one the old hog, another the stage-player, another the Jew, another the black dog of Arden. This was as poor wit as need be, but it made those lords very wroth, and the surly Earl of Warwick, who was the black dog, swore that the time should come when Piers Gaveston should feel the black dog's teeth. It was not come yet, however, nor did it seem to be coming. The king made him Earl of Cornwall, and gave him vast riches, and when the king went over to France to marry the French princess Isabella, daughter of Philip le Bel, who was said to be the most beautiful woman in the world, he made Gaveston regent of the kingdom. His splendid marriage ceremony in the church of Our Lady at Bologna, where there were four kings and three queens present, quite a pack of court cards, for I dare say the knaves were not wanting, being over, he seemed to care little or nothing for his beautiful wife, but was wild with impatience to meet Gaveston again. When he landed at home, he paid no attention to anybody else, but ran into the favorite's arms before a great concourse of people, and hugged him and kissed him and called him his brother. At the coronation which soon followed, Gaveston was the richest and brightest of all the glittering company there, and had the honor of carrying the crown. This made the proud lords fiercer than ever. The people, too, despised the favorite, and would never call him Earl of Cornwall, however much he complained to the king, and asked him to punish them for not doing so, but persisted in styling him Plain Piers Gaveston. The barons were so unceremonious with the king, in giving him to understand that they would not bear this favorite, that the king was obliged to send him out of the country. The favorite himself was made to take an oath, more oaths, that he would never come back, and the barons supposed him to be banished in disgrace, until they heard that he was appointed governor of Ireland. Even this was not enough for the besotted king, who brought him home again in a year's time, and not only disgusted the court and the people by his doting folly, but offended his beautiful wife, too, who never liked him afterwards. He had now the old royal want of money, and the barons had the new power of positively refusing to let him raise any. He summoned a parliament at York, the barons refused to make one, while the favourite was near him. He summoned another parliament at Westminster, and sent Gaveston away. Then the barons came, completely armed, and appointed a committee of themselves to correct abuses in the state and in the king's household. He got some money on these conditions, and directly set off with Gaveston to the border country, where they spent it in idling away the time, and feasting, while Bruce made ready to drive the English out of Scotland. For, though the old king had even made this poor, weak son of his swear, as some say, that he would not bury his bones, but would have them boiled clean in a cauldron, and carried before the English army, until Scotland was entirely subdued, the second Edward was so unlike the first, that Bruce gained strength and power every day. The committee of nobles, after some months of deliberation, ordained that the king should henceforth call a parliament together, once every year, and even twice if necessary, instead of summoning it only when he chose. Further, that Gaveston should once more be banished, and this time on pain of death, if he ever came back. The king's tears were of no avail. He was obliged to send his favorite to Flanders. As soon as he had done so, however, he dissolved the Parliament, with the low cunning of a mere fool, and set off to the north of England, thinking to get an army about him to oppose the nobles. And once again he brought Gaveston home, and heaped upon him all the riches and titles of which the barons had deprived him. 
The Lords saw now that there was nothing for it but to put the favourite to death. They could have done so legally, according to the terms of his banishment, but they did so, I am sorry to say, in a shabby manner. Led by the Earl of Lancaster, the King's cousin, they first of all attacked the King and Gaveston at Newcastle. They had time to escape by sea, and the mean King, having his precious Gaveston with him, was quite content to leave his lovely wife behind. When they were comparatively safe, they separated. The King went to York to collect a force of soldiers, and the favourite shut himself up, in the meantime, in Scarborough Castle, overlooking the sea. This was what the barons wanted. They knew that the castle could not hold out. They attacked it, and made Gaveston surrender. He delivered himself up to the Earl of Pembroke, that lord whom he had called the Jew, on the Earl's pledging his faith and knightly word that no harm should happen to him, and no violence be done him. Now it was agreed with Gaveston that he should be taken to the castle of Wallingford, and there kept in honourable custody. They travelled as far as Deddington, near Banbury, where, in the castle of that place, they stopped for a night to rest. Whether the Earl of Pembroke left his prisoner there, knowing what would happen, or really left him thinking no harm, and only going, as he pretended, to visit his wife, the Countess, who was in the neighbourhood, is no great matter now. In any case, he was bound as an honourable gentleman to protect his prisoner, and he did not do it. In the morning, while the favourite was yet in bed, he was required to dress himself and come down into the courtyard. He did so without any mistrust, but started and turned pale when he found it full of strange, armed men. "'I think you know me?' said their leader, also armed from head to foot. "'I am the black dog of Ardennes.' The time was come when Piers Gaveston was to feel the black dog's teeth indeed. They set him on a mule, and carried him, in mock state and with military music, to the black dog's kennel, Warwick Castle, where a hasty council, composed of some great noblemen, considered what should be done with him. Some were for sparing him, but one loud voice, it was the black dog's bark, I dare say, sounded through the castle hall, uttering these words, "'You have the fox in your power.' Let him go now, and you must hunt him again. They sentenced him to death. He threw himself at the feet of the Earl of Lancaster, the old hog, but the old hog was as savage as the dog. He was taken out upon the pleasant road, leading from Warwick to Coventry, where the beautiful river Avon, by which, long afterwards, William Shakespeare was born, and now lies buried, sparkled in the bright landscape of the beautiful May day, and there they struck off his wretched head, and stained the dust with his blood. When the king heard of this black deed, in his grief and rage he denounced relentless war against his barons, and both sides were in arms for half a year. But it then became necessary for them to join their forces against Bruce, who had used the time well while they were divided, and had now a great power in Scotland. Intelligence was brought that Bruce was then besieging Stirling Castle, and that the governor had been obliged to pledge himself to surrender it, unless he should be relieved before a certain day. Hereupon the king ordered the nobles and their fighting men to meet him at Berwick, but the nobles cared so little for the king, and so neglected the summons, and lost time, that only on the day before that appointed for the surrender did the king find himself at Stirling, and even then with a smaller force than he had expected. However, he had altogether a hundred thousand men, and Bruce had not more than forty thousand, but Bruce's army was strongly posted in three square columns, on the ground lying between the burn or brook of Bannock, and the walls of Stirling Castle. On the very evening when the king came up, Bruce did a brave act that encouraged his men. He was seen by a certain Henry de Bohun, an English knight, riding about before his army on a little horse, with a light battle-axe in his hand, and a crown of gold on his head. This English knight, who was mounted on a strong war-horse, cased in steel, strongly armed, and able, as he thought, to overthrow Bruce by crushing him with his mere weight, set spurs to his great charger, rode on him, and made a thrust at him with his heavy spear. Bruce parried the thrust, and with one blow of his battle-axe, split his skull. The Scottish men did not forget this, next day when the battle raged. Randolph, Bruce's valiant nephew, rode with the small body of men he commanded, 
into such a host of the English, all shining in polished armor in the sunlight, that they seemed to be swallowed up and lost, as if they had plunged into the sea. But they fought so well, and did such dreadful execution, that the English staggered. Then came Bruce himself upon them, with all the rest of his army. While they were thus hard-pressed and amazed, there appeared upon the hills what they supposed to be a new Scottish army, but what were really only the camp followers, in number fifteen thousand, whom Bruce had taught to show themselves at that place and time. The Earl of Gloucester, commanding the English horse, made a last rush to change the fortune of the day, but Bruce, like Jack the Giant Killer in the story, had had pits dug in the ground, and covered over with turfs and stakes. Into these, as they gave way beneath the weight of the horses, riders and horses rolled by hundreds. The English were completely routed, all their treasure, stores, and engines were taken by the Scottish men, so many wagons and other wheeled vehicles were seized that it is related that they would have reached, if they had been drawn out in a line, one hundred and eighty miles. The fortunes of Scotland were, for the time, completely changed, and never was a battle won more famous upon Scottish ground than this great battle of Bannockburn. Plague and famine succeeded in England and still the powerless king and his disdainful lords were always in contention. Some of the turbulent chiefs of Ireland made proposals to Bruce to accept the rule of that country. He sent his brother Edward to them, who was crowned king of Ireland. He afterwards went himself to help his brother in his Irish wars, but his brother was defeated in the end and killed. Robert Bruce, returning to Scotland, still increased his strength there. As the king's ruin had begun in a favourite, so it seemed likely to end in one. He was too poor a creature to rely at all upon himself, and his new favorite was one Hugh the Dispenser, the son of a gentleman of ancient family. Hugh was handsome and brave, but he was the favorite of a weak king, whom no man cared to rush for, and that was a dangerous place to hold. The nobles leagued against him, because the king liked him, and they lay in wait, both for his ruin and his father's. Now the king had married him to the daughter of the late Earl of Gloucester, and had given both him and his father great possessions in Wales. In their endeavours to extend these, they gave violent offence to an angry Welsh gentleman named John de Mowbray, and to diverse other angry Welsh gentlemen, who resorted to arms, took their castles, and seized their estates. The Earl of Lancaster had first placed the favourite, who was a poor relation of his own, at court, and he considered his own dignity offended by the preference he received, and the honours he acquired. So he and the barons who were his friends joined the Welshmen, marched on London, and sent a message to the king demanding to have the favourite and his father banished. At first the king unaccountably took it into his head to be spirited, and to send them a bold reply, but when they quartered themselves around Holborn and Clerkenwell, and went down, armed, to the Parliament at Westminster, he gave way, and complied with their demands. His turn of triumph came sooner than he expected. It arose out of an accidental circumstance. The beautiful queen, happening to be travelling, came one night to one of the royal castles, and demanded to be lodged and entertained there until morning. The governor of this castle, who was one of the enraged lords, was away, and in his absence his wife refused admission to the queen. A scuffle took place among the common men on either side, and some of the royal attendants were killed. The people, who cared nothing for the king, were very angry that their beautiful queen should be thus rudely treated in her own dominions, and the king, taking advantage of this feeling, besieged the castle, took it, and then called the two despensers home. Upon this the confederate lords and the Welshmen went over to Bruce. The king encountered them at Boroughbridge, gained the victory, and took a number of distinguished prisoners, among them the Earl of Lancaster, now an old man, upon whose destruction he was resolved. This earl was taken to his own castle of Pontefract, and there tried and found guilty by an unfair court appointed for the purpose. He was not even allowed to speak in his own defence. He was insulted, pelted, mounted on a starved pony without saddle or bridle, carried out, and beheaded. Eight and twenty knights were hanged, drawn, and quartered. 
When the king had dispatched this bloody work, and had made a fresh and a long truce with Bruce, he took the Despenseurs into greater favour than ever, and made the father Earl of Winchester. One prisoner, and an important one, who was taken at Boroughbridge, made his escape, however, and turned the tide against the king. This was Roger Mortimer, always resolutely opposed to him, who was sentenced to death, and placed for safe custody in the Tower of London. He treated his guards to a quantity of wine into which he had put a sleeping potion, and, when they were insensible, broke out of his dungeon, got into a kitchen, climbed up the chimney, let himself down from the roof of the building with a rope ladder, passed the sentries, got down to the river, and made away in a boat to where servants and horses were waiting for him. He finally escaped to France, where Charles le Bel, the brother of the beautiful queen, was king. Charles sought to quarrel with the king of England, on pretense of his not having come to do him homage at his coronation. It was proposed that the beautiful queen should go over to arrange the dispute. She went, and wrote home to the king, that as he was sick and could not come to France himself, perhaps it would be better to send over the young prince, their son, who was only twelve years old, who could do homage to her brother in his stead, and in whose company she would immediately return. The king sent him, but both he and the queen remained at the French court, and Roger Mortimer became the queen's lover. When the king wrote, again and again, to the queen to come home, she did not reply that she despised him too much to live with him any more, which was the truth, but said she was afraid of the two despenseurs. In short, her design was to overthrow the favourite's power, and the king's power, such as it was, and invade England. Having obtained a French force of two thousand men, and being joined by all the English exiles then in France, she landed within a year, at Orwell, in Suffolk, where she was immediately joined by the earls of Kent and Norfolk, the king's two brothers, by other powerful noblemen, and lastly, by the first English general, who was dispatched to check her, who went over to her, with all his men. The people of London, receiving these tidings, would do nothing for the king, but broke open the tower, let out all his prisoners, and threw up their caps, and hurrahed for the beautiful queen. The king, with his two favourites, fled to Bristol, where he left old Despenser in charge of the town and castle, while he went on with the son to Wales. The Bristol men being opposed to the king, and it being impossible to hold the town with enemies everywhere within the walls, Despenser yielded it up on the third day, and was instantly brought to trial for having traitorously influenced what was called the king's mind, though I doubt if the king ever had any. He was a venerable old man, upwards of ninety years of age, but his age gained no respect or mercy. He was hanged, torn open while he was yet alive, cut up into pieces, and thrown to the dogs. His son was soon taken, tried at Hereford, before the same judge, on a long series of foolish charges, found guilty, and hanged upon a gallows fifty feet high, with a chaplet of nettles round his head. His poor old father and he were innocent enough of any worse crimes than the crime of having been friends of a king, on whom, as a mere man, they would never have deigned to cast a favourable look. It is a bad crime, I know, and leads to worse, but many lords and gentlemen, I even think some ladies too, if I recollect right, have committed it in England, who have neither been given to the dogs, nor hanged up fifty feet high. The wretched king was running here and there all this time, and never getting anywhere in particular, until he gave himself up, and was taken off to Kenilworth Castle. When he was safely lodged there, the queen went to London and met the Parliament, and the Bishop of Hereford, who was the most skilful of her friends, said, What was to be done now? Here was an imbecile, indolent, miserable king upon the throne. Wouldn't it be better to take him off, and put his son there instead? I don't know whether the queen really pitied him at this pass, but she began to cry. So the bishop said, Well, my lords and gentlemen, what do you think upon the whole of sending down to Kenilworth, and seeing if his majesty, God bless him, and forbid we should depose him, won't resign? My lords and gentlemen thought it a good notion, so a deputation of them went down to Kenilworth, and there the king came into the great hall of the castle, commonly dressed in a poor black gown. And when he saw a certain bishop among them, 
fell down, poor, feeble-headed man, and made a wretched spectacle of himself. Somebody lifted him up, and then Sir William Trussell, the Speaker of the House of Commons, almost frightened him to death by making him a tremendous speech to the effect that he was no longer a king, and that everybody renounced allegiance to him, after which Sir Thomas Blount, the steward of the household, nearly finished him, by coming forward and breaking his white wand, which was a ceremony only performed at a king's death. Being asked in this pressing manner what he thought of resigning, the king said he thought it was the best thing he could do. So he did it, and they proclaimed his son next day. I wish I could close this history by saying that he lived a harmless life in the castle, and the castle gardens at Kenilworth many years, that he had a favorite and plenty to eat and drink, and having that, wanted nothing. But he was shamefully humiliated. He was outraged and slighted, and had dirty water from ditches given him to shave with, and wept, and said he would have clean, warm water, and was altogether very miserable. He was moved from this castle to that castle, and from that castle to the other castle, because this lord or that lord or the other lord was too kind to him, until at last he came to Berkeley Castle, near the river Severn, where, the Lord Berkeley being then ill and absent, he fell into the hands of two black ruffians, called Thomas Gournay and William Ogle. One night, it was the night of September the 21st, 1,327, dreadful screams were heard by the startled people in the neighboring town, ringing through the thick walls of the castle and the dark, deep night, and they said, as they were thus horribly awakened from their sleep, May heaven be merciful to the king, for those cries forebode that no good is being done to him in this dismal prison. Next morning he was dead, not bruised or stabbed or marked upon the body, but much distorted in the face, and it was whispered afterwards that those two villains, Gournay and Ogle, had burnt up his inside with a red-hot iron. If you ever come near Gloucester and see the center tower of its beautiful cathedral, with its four rich pinnacles, rising lightly in the air, you may remember that the wretched Edward the Second was buried in the old abbey of that ancient city, at forty-three years old, after being for nineteen years and a half a perfectly incapable king. End of chapter 17「Chapter eighteen of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, September two thousand seven. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter eighteen England under Edward the Third Roger Mortimer, the Queen's lover, who escaped to France in the last chapter, was far from profiting by the examples he had had of the fate of favourites. Having, through the Queen's influence, come into possession of the estates of the two Despenseurs, he became extremely proud and ambitious, and sought to be the real ruler of England. The young king, who was crowned at fourteen years of age, with all the usual solemnities, resolved not to bear this, and soon pursued Mortimer to his ruin. The people themselves were not fond of Mortimer, first because he was a royal favourite, secondly because he was supposed to have helped to make a peace with Scotland which now took place, and in virtue of which the young king's sister Joan, only seven years old, was promised in marriage to David the son and heir of Robert Bruce, who was only five years old. The nobles hated Mortimer because of his pride, riches, and power. They went so far as to take up arms against him, but were obliged to submit. The Earl of Kent, one of those who did so, but who afterwards went over to Mortimer and the Queen, was made an example of in the following cruel manner. He seems to have been anything but a wise old earl, and he was persuaded by the agents of the favourite and the queen, that poor King Edward the Second was not really dead, and thus was betrayed into writing letters favouring his rightful claim to the throne, 
This was made out to be high treason, and he was tried, found guilty, and sentenced to be executed. They took the poor old lord outside the town of Winchester, and there kept him waiting some three or four hours until they could find somebody to cut off his head. At last a convict said he would do it, if the government would pardon him in return, and they gave him the pardon, and at one blow he put the Earl of Kent out of his last suspense. While the Queen was in France she had found a lovely and good young lady named Philippa, who she thought would make an excellent wife for her son. The young king married this lady soon after he came to the throne, and her first child, Edward, Prince of Wales, afterwards became celebrated, as we shall presently see, under the famous title of Edward the Black Prince. The young king, thinking the time ripe for the downfall of Mortimer, took counsel with the Lord Montacute how he should proceed. A Parliament was going to be held at Nottingham, and that Lord recommended that the favourite should be seized by night in Nottingham Castle, where he was sure to be. Now this, like many other things, was more easily said than done, because, to guard against treachery, the great gates of the castle were locked every night, and the great keys were carried upstairs to the Queen, who laid them under her own pillow. But the castle had a governor, and the governor, being Lord Montacute's friend, confided to him how he knew of a secret passage underground, hidden from observation by the weeds and brambles with which it was overgrown, and how, through that passage, the conspirators might enter in the dead of the night, and go straight to Mortimer's room. Accordingly, upon a certain dark night, at midnight, they made their way through this dismal place, startling the rats and frightening the owls and bats, and came safely to the bottom of the main tower of the castle, where the king met them, and took them up a profoundly dark staircase in a deep silence. They soon heard the voice of Mortimer in council with some friends, and bursting into the room with a sudden noise, took him prisoner. The queen cried out from her bedchamber, "'O oh, my sweet son, my dear son, spare my gentle Mortimer!' They carried him off, however, and before the next Parliament accused him of having made differences between the young king and his mother, and of having brought about the death of the Earl of Kent, and even of the late king, for, as you know by this time, when they wanted to get rid of a man in those old days, they were not very particular of what they accused him. Mortimer was found guilty of all this, and was sentenced to be hanged at Tyburn. The king shut his mother up in genteel confinement, where she passed the rest of her life, and now he became king in earnest. The first effort he made was to conquer Scotland. The English lords who had lands in Scotland, finding that their rights were not respected under the late peace, made war on their own account, choosing for their general Edward, the son of John Balliol, who made such a vigorous fight that in less than two months he won the whole Scottish kingdom. He was joined, when thus triumphant, by the king and parliament, and he and the king in person besieged the Scottish forces in Berwick. The whole Scottish army, coming to the assistance of their countrymen, such a furious battle ensued that thirty thousand men are said to have been killed in it. Balliol was then crowned King of Scotland, doing homage to the King of England. But little came of his successes after all, for the Scottish men rose against him within no very long time, and David Bruce came back within ten years and took his kingdom. France was a far richer country than Scotland, and the king had a much greater mind to conquer it. So he let Scotland alone, and pretended that he had a claim to the French throne in right of his mother. He had, in reality, no claim at all, but that mattered little in those times. He brought over to his cause many little princes and sovereigns, and even courted the alliance of the people of Flanders, a busy working community, who had very small respect for kings, and whose head man was a brewer. With such forces as he raised by these means, Edward invaded France, but he did little by that, except run into debt in carrying on the war to the extent of three hundred thousand pounds. The next year he did better, gaining a great sea-fight in the harbour of Sluys. This success, however, was very short-lived, for the Flemings took fright at the siege of St. Omer, 
and ran away, leaving their weapons and baggage behind them. Philip, the French king, coming up with his army, and Edward being very anxious to decide the war, proposed to settle the difference by single combat with him, or by a fight of one hundred knights on each side. The French king said he thanked him, but being very well as he was, he would rather not. So, after some skirmishing and talking, a short peace was made. It was soon broken by King Edward's favouring the cause of John, Earl of Montford, a French nobleman, who asserted a claim of his own against the French king, and offered to do homage to England for the crown of France, if he could obtain it through England's help. This French lord himself was soon defeated by the French king's son, and shut up in a tower in Paris. But his wife, a courageous and beautiful woman, who is said to have had the courage of a man, and the heart of a lion, assembled the people of Brittany, where she then was, and, showing them her infant son, made many pathetic entreaties to them not to desert her and their young lord. They took fire at this appeal, and rallied round her in the strong castle of Hennebon. Here she was not only besieged without by the French under Charles de Blois, but was endangered within by a dreary old bishop, who was always representing to the people what horrors they must undergo if they were faithful, first from famine, and afterwards from fire and sword. But this noble lady, whose heart never failed her, encouraged her soldiers by her own example, went from post to post like a great general, even mounted on horseback fully armed, and issuing from the castle by a by-path, fell upon the French camp, set fire to the tents, and threw the whole force into disorder. This done, she got safely back to Hennebon again, and was received with loud shouts of joy by the defenders of the castle, who had given her up for lost. As they were now very short of provisions, however, and as they could not dine off enthusiasm, and as the old bishop was always saying, I told you what it would come to, they began to lose heart, and to talk of yielding the castle up. The brave countess, retiring to an upper room, and looking with great grief out to sea, where she expected relief from England, saw at this very time the English ships in the distance, and was relieved and rescued. Sir Walter Manning, the English commander, so admired her courage, that, being come into the castle with the English knights, and having made a feast there, he assaulted the French by way of dessert, and beat them off triumphantly. Then he and the knights came back to the castle with great joy, and the countess, who had watched them from a high tower, thanked them with all her heart, and kissed them, every one. This noble lady distinguished herself afterwards in a sea-fight with the French off Guernsey, when she was on her way to England to ask for more troops. Her great spirit roused another lady, the wife of another French lord, whom the French king very barbarously murdered, to distinguish herself scarcely less. The time was fast coming, however, when Edward, Prince of Wales, was to be the great star of this French and English war. It was in the month of July, in the year 1346, when the King embarked at Southampton for France, with an army of about thirty thousand men in all, attended by the Prince of Wales and by several of the chief nobles. He landed at La Hogue in Normandy, and, burning and destroying as he went, according to custom, advanced up the left bank of the river Seine, and fired the small towns even close to Paris, but being watched from the right bank of the river by the French king and all his army, it came to this at last, that Edward found himself, on Saturday, the 26th of August, 1346, on a rising ground behind the little French village of Crecy, face to face with the French king's force, and although the French king had an enormous army, in number more than eight times his, he there resolved to beat him, or be beaten. The young prince, assisted by the Earl of Oxford and the Earl of Warwick, led the first division of the English army. Two other great earls led the second, and the king the third. When the morning dawned, the king received the sacrament, and heard prayers, and then, mounted on horseback, with a white wand in his hand, rode from company to company, and rank to rank, 
cheering and encouraging both officers and men. Then the whole army breakfasted, each man sitting on the ground where he had stood, and then they remained quietly on the ground, with their weapons ready. Up came the French king with all his great force. It was dark and angry weather. There was an eclipse of the sun. There was a thunderstorm, accompanied with tremendous rain. The frightened birds flew screaming above the soldiers' heads. A certain captain in the French army advised the French king, who was by no means cheerful, not to begin the battle until the morrow. The king, taking this advice, gave the word to halt. But those behind, not understanding it, or desiring to be foremost with the rest, came pressing on. The roads for a great distance were covered with this immense army, and with the common people from the villages, who were flourishing their rude weapons and making a great noise. Owing to these circumstances, the French army advanced in the greatest confusion, every French lord doing what he liked with his own men, and putting out the men of every other French lord. Now their king relied strongly upon a great body of crossbowmen from Genoa, and these he ordered to the front to begin the battle, on finding that he could not stop it. They shouted once, they shouted twice, they shouted three times to alarm the English archers. But the English would have heard them shout three thousand times, and would have never moved. At last the crossbowmen went forward a little, and began to discharge their bolts, upon which the English let fly such a hail of arrows that the Genoese speedily made off, for their crossbows, besides being heavy to carry, required to be wound up with a handle, and consequently took time to reload. The English, on the other hand, could discharge their arrows almost as fast as the arrows could fly. When the French king saw the Genoese turning, he cried out to his men to kill those scoundrels who were doing harm instead of service. This increased the confusion. Meanwhile the English archers, continuing to shoot as fast as ever, shot down great numbers of the French soldiers and knights, whom certain sly Cornishmen and Welshmen from the English army, creeping along the ground, dispatched with great knives. The prince and his division were at this time so hard-pressed that the Earl of Warwick sent a message to the king, who was overlooking the battle from a windmill, beseeching him to send more aid. "'Is my son killed?' said the king. "'No, sire, please God,' returned the messenger. "'Is he wounded?' said the king. "'No, sire. Is he thrown to the ground?' said the king. "'No, sire, not so, but he is very hard-pressed.' "'Then,' said the king, "'go back to those who sent you, and tell them I shall send no aid, because I set my heart upon my son, proving himself this day a brave knight.' and because I am resolved, please God, that the honour of a great victory shall be his. These bold words, being reported to the prince and his division, so raised their spirits that they fought better than ever. The king of France charged gallantly with his men many times, but it was of no use. Night closing in, his horse was killed under him by an English arrow, and the knights and nobles, who had clustered thick about him early in the day, were now completely scattered. At last some of his few remaining followers led him off the field by force, since he would not retire of himself, and they journeyed away to Amiens. The victorious English, lighting their watch-fires, made merry on the field, and the king, riding to meet his gallant son, took him in his arms, kissed him, and told him that he had acted nobly, and proved himself worthy of the day and of the crown. While it was yet night, King Edward was hardly aware of the great victory he had gained, but next day it was discovered that eleven princes, twelve hundred knights, and thirty thousand common men lay dead upon the French side. Among these was the king of Bohemia, an old blind man, who, having been told that his son was wounded in the battle, and that no force could stand against the black prince, called to him two knights, put himself on horseback between them, fastened the three bridles together, and dashed in among the English, where he was presently slain. He bore as his crest three white ostrich feathers, with the motto, Ik Dien, signifying in English, I serve. This crest and motto were taken by the Prince of Wales in remembrance of that famous day, 
and have been borne by the Prince of Wales ever since. Five days after this great battle, the king laid siege to Calais. This siege, ever afterwards memorable, lasted nearly a year. In order to starve the inhabitants out, King Edward built so many wooden houses for the lodgings of his troops, that it is said their quarters looked like a second Calais, suddenly sprung around the first. Early in the siege the governor of the town drove out what he called the useless mouths, to the number of seventeen hundred persons, men and women, young and old. King Edward allowed them to pass through his lines, and even fed them, and dismissed them with money. But later in the siege he was not so merciful, five hundred more who were afterwards driven out, dying of starvation and misery. The garrison were so hard-pressed at last that they sent a letter to King Philip, telling him that they had eaten all the horses, all the dogs, and all the rats and mice that could be found in the place, and that, if he did not relieve them, they must either surrender to the English or eat one another. Philip made one effort to give them relief, but they were so hemmed in by the English power that he could not succeed, and was fain to leave the place. Upon this they hoisted the English flag, and surrendered to King Edward. "'Tell your general,' said he to the humble messengers who came out of the town, "'that I require to have sent here six of the most distinguished citizens, bare-legged and in their shirts, with ropes about their necks, and let those six men bring with them the keys of the castle and the town. When the governor of Calais related this to the people in the market-place, there was great weeping and distress, in the midst of which one worthy citizen, named Eustache de Saint-Pierre, rose up and said that if the six men required were not sacrificed, the whole population would be. Therefore he offered himself as the first." Encouraged by this bright example, five other worthy citizens rose up, one after another, and offered themselves to save the rest. The governor, who was too badly wounded to be able to walk, mounted a poor old horse that had not been eaten, and conducted these good men to the gate, while all the people cried and mourned. Edward received them wrathfully, and ordered the heads of the whole six to be struck off, However, the good queen fell upon her knees, and besought the king to give them up to her. The king replied, I wish you had been somewhere else, but I cannot refuse you. So she had them properly dressed, made a feast for them, and sent them back with a handsome present, to the great rejoicing of the whole camp. I hope the people of Calais loved the daughter to whom she gave birth soon afterwards, for her gentle mother's sake. Now came that terrible disease— the plague into Europe, hurrying from the heart of China, and killed the wretched people, especially the poor, in such enormous numbers that one half of the inhabitants of England are related to have died of it. It killed the cattle in great numbers, too, and so few working men remained alive that there were not enough left to till the ground. After eight years of differing and quarrelling, the Prince of Wales again invaded France with an army of sixty thousand men. He went through the south of the country, burning and plundering wheresoever he went, while his father, who had still the Scottish war upon his hands, did the like in Scotland, but was harassed and worried in his retreat from that country by the Scottish men, who repaid his cruelties with interest. The French King Philip was now dead and was succeeded by his son, John. The black prince, called by that name from the color of the armor he wore, to set off his fair complexion, continuing to burn and destroy in France, roused John into determined opposition, and so cruel had the black prince been in his campaign, and so severely had the French peasants suffered, that he could not find one who, for love or money, or the fear of death, would tell him what the French king was doing, or where he was. Thus it happened that he came upon the French king's forces, all of a sudden, near the town of Poitiers, and found that the whole neighboring country was occupied by a vast French army. "'God help us,' said the black prince. "'We must make the best of it.' So on a Sunday morning, the 18th of September, the prince— whose army was now reduced to ten thousand men in all, 
prepared to give battle to the French king, who had sixty thousand horse alone. While he was so engaged, there came riding from the French camp a cardinal, who had persuaded John to let him offer terms, and try to save the shedding of Christian blood. Save my honour, said the prince to this good priest, and save the honour of my army, and I will make any reasonable terms. He offered to give up all the towns, castles, and prisoners he had taken, and to swear to make no war in France for seven years. But as John would hear of nothing but his surrender, with a hundred of his chief knights, the treaty was broken off, and the prince said quietly, God defend the right, we shall fight to-morrow. Therefore on the Monday morning, at a break of day, the two armies prepared for battle. The English were posted in a strong place, which could only be approached by one narrow lane, skirted by hedges on both sides. The French attacked them by this lane, but were so galled and slain by English arrows from behind the hedges that they were forced to retreat. Then went six hundred English bowmen round about, and, coming upon the rear of the French army, rained arrows on them thick and fast. The French knights, thrown into confusion, quitted their banners and dispersed in all directions. Said Sir John Chandos to the prince, "'Ride forward, noble prince, and the day is yours.' The king of France is so valiant a gentleman that I know he will never fly, and may be taken prisoner. Said the prince to this, Advance, English banners, in the name of God and St. George. And on they pressed until they came up with the French king, fighting fiercely with his battle-axe, and, when all his nobles had forsaken him, attended faithfully to the last by his youngest son Philip, only sixteen years of age. Father and son fought well, and the king had already two wounds in his face, and had been beaten down, when he at last delivered himself to a banished French knight, and gave him his right-hand glove, in token that he had done so. The black prince was generous as well as brave, and he invited the royal prisoner to supper in his tent, and waited upon him at table, and, when they afterwards rode into London in a gorgeous procession, mounted the French king on a fine, cream-coloured horse, and rode at his side on a little pony. This was all very kind, but I think it was, perhaps, a little theatrical, too, and has been made more meritorious than it deserved to be, especially as I am inclined to think that the greatest kindness to the king of France would have been not to have shown him to the people at all. However, it must be said, for these acts of politeness, that in course of time, they did much to soften the horrors of war and the passions of conquerors. It was a long, long time before the common soldiers began to have the benefit of such courtly deeds. But they did at last, and thus it is possible that a poor soldier, who asked for quarter at the Battle of Waterloo, or any other such great fight, may have owed his life indirectly to Edward the Black Prince." At this time there stood in the Strand, in London, a palace called the Savoy, which was given up to the captive King of France and his son for their residence. As the King of Scotland had now been King Edward's captive for eleven years too, his success was, at this time, tolerably complete. The Scottish business was settled by the prisoner being released under the title of Sir David, King of Scotland, and by his engaging to pay a large ransom. The state of France encouraged England to propose harder terms to that country, where the people rose against the unspeakable cruelty and barbarity of its nobles, where the nobles rose in turn against the people, where the most frightful outrages were committed on all sides, and where the insurrection of the peasants, called the insurrection of the Jacquerie, from Jacques, a common Christian name among the country people of France, awakened terrors and hatreds that have scarcely yet passed away. A treaty called the Great Peace was at last signed, under which King Edward agreed to give up the greater part of his conquests, and King John to pay, within six years, a ransom of three million crowns of gold. He was so beset by his own nobles and courtiers for having yielded to these conditions, though they could help him to know better that he came back of his own will to his old palace prison of the Savoy, and there died. There was a sovereign of Castile at that time, called Pedro the Cruel, who deserved the name remarkably well, 
having committed, among other cruelties, a variety of murders. This amiable monarch, being driven from his throne for his crimes, went to the province of Bordeaux, where the black prince, now married to his cousin Joan, a pretty widow, was residing, and besought his help. The prince, who took to him much more kindly than a prince of such fame ought to have taken to such a ruffian, readily listened to his fair promises, and, agreeing to help him, sent secret orders to some troublesome disbanded soldiers of his and his father's, who called themselves the Free Companions, and who had been a pest to the French people, for some time to aid this Pedro. The prince himself, going into Spain to head the army of relief, soon set Pedro on his throne again, where he no sooner found himself than, of course, he behaved like the villain he was, broke his word without the least shame, and abandoned all the promises he had made to the black prince. Now it had cost the prince a good deal of money to pay soldiers to support this murderous king, and finding himself, when he came back disgusted to Bordeaux, not only in bad health, but deeply in debt, he began to tax his French subjects to pay his creditors. They appealed to the French king Charles. War broke out again, and the French town of Limoges, which the prince had greatly benefited, went over to the French king. Upon this he ravaged the province of which it was the capital, burnt and plundered, and killed in the old sickening way, and refused mercy to the prisoners, men, women, and children, taken in the offending town, though he was so ill and so much in need of pity himself from heaven, that he was carried in a litter. He lived to come home and make himself popular with the people and Parliament, and he died on Trinity Sunday, the 8th of June, 1376, at forty-six years old. The whole nation mourned for him as one of the most renowned and beloved princes it had ever had, and he was buried with great lamentations in Canterbury Cathedral. Near to the tomb of Edward the Confessor, his monument, with his figure carved in stone, and represented in the old black armour, laying on its back, may be seen at this day, with an ancient coat of mail, a helmet, and a pair of gauntlets hanging from a beam above it, which most people like to believe were once worn by the black prince. King Edward did not outlive his renowned son long. He was old, and one Alice Perrer, a beautiful lady, had contrived to make him so fond of her in his old age, that he could refuse her nothing, and made himself ridiculous. She little deserved his love, or, what I dare say she valued a great deal more, the jewels of the late queen, which he gave her among other rich presents. She took the very ring from his finger, on the morning of the day when he died, and left him to be pillaged by his faithless servants. Only one good priest was true to him, and attended him to the last. Besides being famous for the great victories I have related, the reign of King Edward the Third was rendered memorable in better ways, by the growth of architecture and the erection of Windsor Castle, in better ways still, by the rising up of Wycliffe, originally a poor parish priest, who devoted himself to exposing, with wonderful power and success, the ambition and corruption of the Pope, and of the whole church of which he was the head. Some of those Flemings were induced to come to England in this reign, too, and to settle in Norfolk, where they made better woolen cloths than the English had ever had before. The Order of the Garter, a very fine thing in its way, but hardly so important as a good clothes for the nation, also dates from this period. The king is said to have picked up a lady's garter at a ball, and to have said, Honi sot qui mali pence, in English, evil be to him who evil thinks of it. The courtiers were usually glad to imitate what the king said or did, and hence, from a slight incident, the order of the garter was instituted, and became a great dignity. So the story goes. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Corrie Samuel. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter 19. England under Richard the Second. Richard, son of the Black Prince, a boy eleven years of age, succeeded to the throne under the title of King Richard the Second. The whole English nation were ready to admire him for the sake of his brave father. As to the lords and ladies about the court, they declared him to be the most beautiful, the wisest, and the best, even of princes, whom the lords and ladies about the court generally declare to be the most beautiful, the wisest, and the best of mankind. To flatter a poor boy in this base manner was not a very likely way to develop whatever was good in him, and it brought him to anything but a good or happy end. The Duke of Lancaster, the young king's uncle, commonly called John of Gaunt, from having been born at Ghent, which the common people so pronounced, was supposed to have some thoughts of the throne himself, but as he was not popular, and the memory of the Black Prince was, he submitted to his nephew. The war with France being still unsettled, the government of England wanted money to provide for the expenses that might arise out of it. Accordingly, a certain tax, called the poll tax, which had originated in the last reign, was ordered to be levied on the people. This was a tax on every person in the kingdom, male and female, above the age of fourteen, of three groats, or three fourpenny pieces, a year. Clergymen were charged more, and only beggars were exempt. I have no need to repeat that the common people of England had long been suffering under great oppression. They were still the mere slaves of the lords of the land on which they lived, and were on most occasions harshly and unjustly treated. But they had begun by this time to think very seriously of not bearing quite so much, and probably were emboldened by that French insurrection I mentioned in the last chapter. The people of Essex rose against the poll tax, and being severely handled by the government officers, killed some of them. At this very time one of the tax collectors, going his rounds from house to house at Dartford in Kent, came to the cottage of one Watt, a tiler by trade, and claimed the tax upon his daughter. Her mother, who was at home, declared that she was under the age of fourteen. Upon that, the collector, as other collectors had already done in different parts of England, behaved in a savage way, and brutally insulted Wat Tyler's daughter. The daughter screamed, the mother screamed, Wat the Tyler, who was at work not far off, ran to the spot, and did what any honest father under such provocation might have done, struck the collector dead at a blow. Instantly the people of that town uprose as one man. They made Wat Tyler their leader, they joined with the people of Essex, who were in arms under a priest called Jack Straw. They took out of prison another priest named John Ball, and gathering in numbers as they went along, advanced, in a great confused army of poor men, to Blackheath. It is said that they wanted to abolish all property, and to declare all men equal. I do not think this very likely, because they stopped the travellers on the roads, and made them swear to be true to King Richard and the people. Nor were they at all disposed to injure those who had done them no harm, merely because they were of high station, for the King's mother, who had to pass through their camp at Blackheath, on her way to her young son, lying for safety in the Tower of London, merely had to kiss a few dirty-faced rough-bearded men, who were noisily fond of royalty and so got away in perfect safety. Next day the whole mass marched on London Bridge. There was a drawbridge in the middle, which William Walworth, the mayor, caused to be raised, to prevent their coming into the city, but they soon terrified the citizens into lowering it again, and spread themselves with great uproar over the streets. They broke open the prisons, they burned the papers in Lambeth Palace, they destroyed the Duke of Lancaster's palace, the Savoy in the Strand, said to be the most beautiful and splendid in England, they set fire to the books and documents in a temple, and made a great riot. Many of these outrages were committed in drunkenness, since those citizens, who had well-filled cellars, were only too glad to throw them open to save the rest of their property. But even the drunken rioters were very careful to steal nothing. They were so angry with one man, who was seen to take a silver cup at the Savoy Palace, 
and put it in his breast, that they drowned him in the river, cup and all. The young king had been taken out to treat with them, before they committed these excesses. But he and the people about him were so frightened by the riotous shouts, that they got back to the tower in the best way they could. This made the insurgents bolder, so they went on rioting away, striking off the heads of those who did not, at a moment's notice, declare for King Richard and the people, and killing as many of the unpopular persons, whom they supposed to be their enemies, as they could by any means lay hold of. In this manner they passed one very violent day, and then proclamation was made that the king would meet them at Mile End, and grant their requests. The rioters went to Mile End to the number of sixty thousand, and the king met them there, and to the king the rioters peacefully proposed four conditions. First, that neither they nor their children, nor any coming after them, should be made slaves any more. Secondly, that the rent of land should be fixed at a certain price in money, instead of being paid in service. Thirdly, that they should have liberty to buy and sell in all markets and public places, like other free men. Fourthly, that they should be pardoned for past offences. Heaven knows there was nothing very unreasonable in these proposals. The young king deceitfully pretended to think so, and kept thirty clerks up all night, writing out a charter accordingly. Now, what Tyler himself wanted more than this? He wanted the entire abolition of the forest laws. He was not at Mile End with the rest, but, while that meeting was being held, broke into the Tower of London, and slew the Archbishop and the Treasurer, for whose heads the people had cried out loudly the day before. He and his men even thrust their swords into the bed of the Princess of Wales, while the Princess was in it to make certain that none of their enemies were concealed there. So Watt and his men still continued armed, and rode about the city. Next morning the King, with a small train of some sixty gentlemen, among whom was Walworth the Mayor, rode into Smithfield, and saw Watt and his people at a little distance. Says Watt to his men, There is the King, I will go speak with him, and tell him what we want. Straight away Watt rode up to him, and began to talk. "'King,' says Watt, "'dost thou see all my men there?' "'Ah,' says the king, "'why?' "'Because,' says Watt, "'they are all at my command, and have sworn to do whatever I bid them.' Some declared afterwards that as Watt said this he laid his hand on the king's bridle. Others declared that he was seen to play with his own dagger. I think myself that he just spoke to the king like a rough, angry man, as he was, and did nothing more. At any rate, he was expecting no attack, and preparing for no resistance, when Walworth the mayor did the not very valiant deed of drawing a short sword, and stabbing him in the throat. He dropped from his horse, and one of the king's people speedily finished him. So fell Wat Tyler. Fawners and flatterers made a mighty triumph of it, and set up a cry which will occasionally find an echo to this day. But what was a hard-working man, who had suffered much, and had been foully outraged, and it is probable that he was a man of a much higher nature, and a much braver spirit, than any of the parasites who exulted then, or have exulted since over his defeat. Seeing what down, his men immediately bent their bows to avenge his fall. If the young king had not had a presence of mind at that dangerous moment, both he and the mare to boot might have followed Tyler pretty fast. But the king, riding up to the crowd, cried out that Tyler was a traitor, and that he would be their leader. They were so taken by surprise that they set up a great shouting, and followed the boy until he was met at Islington by a large body of soldiers. The end of this rising was the then usual end. As soon as the king found himself safe, he unsaid all he had said, and undid all he had done. Some fifteen hundred of the rioters were tried, mostly in Essex, with great rigour, and executed with great cruelty. Many of them were hanged on gibbets, and left there as a terror to the country people. 
and because their miserable friends took down some of the bodies to bury, the king ordered the rest to be chained up, which was the beginning of the barbarous custom of hanging in chains. The king's falsehood in this business makes such a pitiful figure that I think what Tyler appears in history as beyond comparison the truer and more respectable man of the two. Richard was now sixteen years of age, and married Anne of Bohemia, an excellent princess, who was called the Good Queen Anne. She deserved a better husband, for the king had been fawned and flattered into a treacherous, wasteful, dissolute, bad young man. There were two popes at this time, as if one were not enough, and their quarrels involved Europe in a great deal of trouble. Scotland was still troublesome, too, and at home there was much jealousy and distrust, and plotting and counter-plotting, because the king feared the ambition of his relations, and particularly of his uncle, the Duke of Lancaster. And the Duke had his party against the king, and the king had his party against the Duke. Nor were these home troubles lessened, when the Duke went to Castile, to urge his claim to the crown of that kingdom. For then the Duke of Gloucester, another of Richard's uncles, opposed him, and influenced the Parliament to demand the dismissal of the King's favourite ministers. The King said, in reply, that he would not, for such men, dismiss the meanest servant in his kitchen. But it had begun to signify little what a King said, when a Parliament was determined, so Richard was at last obliged to give way, and to agree to another government of the kingdom, under a commission of fourteen nobles, for a year. His uncle of Gloucester was at the head of this commission, and in fact appointed everybody composing it. Having done all this, the King declared as soon as he saw an opportunity that he had never meant to do it, and that it was all illegal, and he got the judges secretly to sign a declaration to that effect. The secret oozed out directly, and was carried to the Duke of Gloucester. The Duke of Gloucester, at the head of forty thousand men, met the King on his entering into London to enforce his authority. The King was helpless against him, his favourites and ministers were impeached, and were mercilessly executed. Among them were two men, whom the people regarded with very different feelings. One, Robert Tresillian, Chief Justice, who was hated for having made what was called the Bloody Circuit, to try the rioters. The other, Sir Simon Burley, an honourable knight, who had been the dear friend of the Black Prince, and the Governor and Guardian of the King. For this gentleman's life, the good Queen even begged of Gloucester on her knees, but Gloucester, with or without reason, feared and hated him, and replied that if she valued her husband's crown, she had better beg no more. All this was done under what was called by some the wonderful, and by others with better reason the merciless, Parliament. But Gloucester's power was not to last for ever. He held it for only a year longer, in which year the famous Battle of Otterbourne, sung in the old Battle of Chevy Chase, was fought. When the year was out, the King, turning suddenly to Gloucester, in the midst of a great council, said, "'Uncle, how old am I?' "'Your Highness,' returned the Duke, "'is in your twenty-second year.' "'Am I so much?' said the King. "'Then I will manage my own affairs. I am much obliged to you, my good lords, for your past services, but I need them no more." He followed this up by appointing a new Chancellor and a new Treasurer, and announced to the people that he had resumed the government. He held it for eight years without opposition. Through all that time he kept his determination to revenge himself some day upon his uncle Gloucester, in his own breast. At last the good queen died, and then the king, desiring to take a second wife, proposed to his council that he should marry Isabella of France, the daughter of Charles the Sixth, who, the French courtiers said, as the English courtiers had said of Richard, was a marvel of beauty and wit, and quite a phenomenon, of seven years old. The council were divided about this marriage, but it took place. It secured peace between England and France for a quarter of a century, but it was strongly opposed to the prejudices of the English people. The Duke of Gloucester, who was anxious to take the occasion of making himself popular, declaimed against it loudly, 
and this, at length, decided the king to execute the vengeance he had been nursing so long. He went, with a gay company, to the Duke of Gloucester's house, Pleshy Castle, in Essex, where the Duke, suspecting nothing, came out into the courtyard to receive his royal visitor. While the king conversed in a friendly manner with the Duchess, the Duke was quietly seized, hurried away, shipped for Calais, and lodged in the castle there. His friends, the Earls of Arundel and Warwick, were taken in the same treacherous manner, and confined to their castles. A few days after, at Nottingham, they were impeached of high treason. The Earl of Arundel was condemned and beheaded, and the Earl of Warwick was banished. Then a writ was sent by a messenger to the Governor of Calais, requiring him to send the Duke of Gloucester over to be tried. In three days he returned an answer that he could not do that, because the Duke of Gloucester had died in prison. The Duke was declared a traitor. His property was confiscated to the King. A real or pretended confession he had made in prison, to one of the justices of the common pleas, was produced against him. And there was an end of the matter. How the unfortunate Duke died, very few cared to know. Whether he really died naturally, whether he killed himself, whether by the King's order he was strangled, or smothered between two beds, as a serving-man of the Governor's, named Hall, did afterwards declare, cannot be discovered. There is not much doubt that he was killed, somehow or other, by his nephew's orders. Among the most active nobles in these proceedings were the King's cousin, Henry Bullingbroke, whom the King had made Duke of Hereford, to smooth down the old family quarrels, and some others, who had in the family plotting times done just such acts themselves as they now condemned in the Duke. They seem to have been a corrupt set of men, but such men were easily found about the court in such days. The people murmured at all this, and were still very sore about the French marriage. The nobles saw how little the King cared for law, and how crafty he was and began to be somewhat afraid for themselves. The King's life was a life of continued feasting and excess. His retinue, down to the meanest servants, were dressed in a most costly manner, and caroused at his tables, it is related, to the number of ten thousand persons every day. He himself, surrounded by a body of ten thousand archers, and enriched by a duty on wool which the commons had granted him for life, saw no danger of ever being otherwise than powerful and absolute, and was as fierce and haughty as a king could be. He had two of his old enemies left, in the persons of the Dukes of Hereford and Norfolk. Sparing these no more than the others, he tampered with the Duke of Hereford, until he got him to declare before the council that the Duke of Norfolk had lately held some treasonable talk with him, as he was riding near Brentford, and that he had told him among other things, that he could not believe the King's oath, which nobody could, I should think. For this treachery he obtained a pardon, and the Duke of Norfolk was summoned to appear and defend himself. As he denied the charge, and said his accuser was a liar and a traitor, both noblemen, according to the manner of those times, were held in custody, and the truth was ordered to be decided by wager of battle at Coventry. This wager of battle meant that whosoever won the combat was to be considered in the right, which nonsense meant in effect that no strong man could ever be wrong. A great holiday was made, a great crowd assembled, with much parade and show, and the two combatants were about to rush at each other with their lances, when the king, sitting in a pavilion to see fair, threw down the truncheon he carried in his hand, and forbade the battle. The Duke of Hereford was to be banished for ten years, and the Duke of Norfolk was to be banished for life. So said the King. The Duke of Hereford went to France, and went no farther. The Duke of Norfolk made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and afterwards died at Venice of a broken heart. Faster and fiercer after this the King went on in his career. The Duke of Lancaster, who was the father of the Duke of Hereford, died soon after the departure of his son, and the king, although he had solemnly granted to that son leave to inherit his father's property, if it should come to him during his banishment, 
immediately seized it all, like a robber. The judges were so afraid of him that they disgraced themselves by declaring this theft to be just and lawful. His avarice knew no bounds. He outlawed seventeen counties at once, on a frivolous pretense, merely to raise money by way of fines for misconduct. In short, he did as many dishonest things as he could, and cared so little for the discontent of his subjects, though even the spaniel favourites began to whisper to him that there was such a thing as discontent afloat, that he took that time, of all others, for leaving England, and making an expedition against the Irish. He was scarcely gone, leaving the Duke of York regent in his absence, when his cousin, Henry of Hereford, came over from France, to claim the rights of which he had been so monstrously deprived. He was immediately joined by the two great earls of Northumberland and Westmoreland, and his uncle, the regent, finding the king's cause unpopular, and the disinclination of the army to act against Henry very strong, withdrew with the royal forces towards Bristol. Henry, at the head of an army, came from Yorkshire, where he had landed, to London and followed him. They joined their forces, how they brought that about is not distinctly understood, and proceeded to Bristol Castle, where the three noblemen had taken the young queen. The castle surrendering, they presently put those three noblemen to death. The regent then remained there, and Henry went on to Chester. All this time the boisterous weather had prevented the king from receiving intelligence of what had occurred. At length it was conveyed to him in Ireland, and he sent over the Duke of Salisbury, who, landing at Conway, rallied the Welshmen, and waited for the king a whole fortnight. At the end of that time the Welshmen, who were perhaps not very warm for him in the beginning, quite cooled down and went home. When the king did land on the coast at last, he came with a pretty good power, but his men cared nothing for him, and quickly deserted. Supposing the Welshmen to be still at Conway, he disguised himself as a priest, and made for that place, in company with his two brothers, and some few of their adherents. But there were no Welshmen left, only Salisbury and a hundred soldiers. In this distress the king's two brothers, Exeter and Surrey, offered to go to Henry to learn what his intentions were. Surrey, who was true to Richard, was put into prison. Exeter, who was false, took the royal badge, which was a heart, off his shield, and assumed the rose, the badge of Henry. After this it was pretty plain to the king what Henry's intentions were, without sending any more messengers to ask. The fallen king, thus deserted, hemmed in on all sides, and pressed with hunger, rode here, and rode there, and went to this castle, and went to that castle, endeavouring to obtain some provisions, but could find none. He rode wretchedly back to Conway, and there surrendered himself to the Earl of Northumberland, who came from Henry, in reality to take him prisoner, but in appearance to offer terms, and whose men were hidden not far off. By this Earl he was conducted to the castle of Flint, where his cousin Henry met him, and dropped on his knee as if he were still respectful to his sovereign. "'Fair cousin of Lancaster,' said the King, "'you are very welcome.' very welcome, no doubt, but he would have been more so in chains, or without a head. "'My lord,' replied Henry, "'I am come a little before my time, but with your good pleasure I will show you the reason. Your people complain with some bitterness that you have ruled them rigorously for two and twenty years. Now, if it please God, I will help you to govern them better in future.' "'Fair cousin,' replied the abject king, "'since it pleaseth you, it pleaseth me mightily." After this the trumpets sounded, and the king was stuck on a wretched horse, and carried prisoner to Chester, where he was made to issue a proclamation calling a parliament. From Chester he was taken on towards London. At Lichfield he tried to escape by getting out of a window, and letting himself down into a garden. It was all in vain, however, and he was carried on and shut up in the tower, where no one pitied him and where the whole people, whose patience he had quite tired out, reproached him without mercy. Before he got there, it is related, that his very dog left him, and departed from his side to lick the hand of Henry. 
The day before the Parliament met, a deputation went to this wrecked King, and told him that he had promised the Earl of Northumberland at Conway Castle to resign the Crown. He said he was quite ready to do it, and signed a paper in which he renounced his authority, and absolved his people from their allegiance to him. He had so little spirit left, that he gave his royal ring to his triumphant cousin Henry with his own hand, and said that if he could have had leave to appoint a successor, that same Henry was the man of all others whom he would have named. Next day, the Parliament assembled in Westminster Hall, where Henry sat at the side of the throne, which was empty and covered with a cloth of gold. The paper just signed by the King was read to the multitude amid shouts of joy, which were echoed through all the streets. When some of the noise had died away, the King was formally deposed. Then Henry arose, and making the sign of the cross on his forehead and breast, challenged the realm of England as his right. The archbishops of Canterbury and York seated him on the throne. The multitude shouted again, and the shouts re-echoed throughout all the streets. No one remembered now that Richard the Second had ever been the most beautiful, the wisest, and the best of princes, and he now made living, to my thinking, a far more sorry spectacle in a Tower of London than what Tyler had made, lying dead, among the hoofs of the royal horses in Smithfield. The poll-tax died with what? The Smiths to the King and royal family could make no chains in which the King could hang the people's recollection of him, so the poll-tax was never collected. End of chapter 19「Chapter Twenty of A Child's History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corrie Samuel. A Child's History of England by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty. England under Henry the Fourth, called Bullingbrook. During the last reign, the preaching of Wycliffe against the pride and cunning of the Pope and all his men had made a great noise in England. Whether the new king wished to be in favour with the priests, or whether he hoped, by pretending to be very religious, to cheat heaven itself into the belief that he was not a usurper, I don't know. Both suppositions are likely enough. It is certain that he began his reign by making a strong show against the followers of Wycliffe, who were called Lollards, or heretics, although his father, John of Gaunt, had been of that way of thinking, as he himself had been more than suspected of being. It is no less certain that he first established in England the detestable and atrocious custom, brought from abroad, of burning those people as a punishment for their opinions. It was the importation into England of one of the practices of what was called the Holy Inquisition, which was the most unholy and the most infamous tribunal that ever disgraced mankind, and made men more like demons than followers of our Saviour. No real right to the crown, as you know, was in this king. Edward Mortimer, the young Earl of March, who was only eight or nine years old, and who was descended from the Duke of Clarence, the elder brother of Henry's father, was, by succession, the real heir to the throne. However, the King got his son declared Prince of Wales, and, obtaining possession of the young Earl of March and his little brother, kept them in confinement, but not severely, in Windsor Castle. He then required the Parliament to decide what was to be done with the deposed King, who was quiet enough, and who only said that he hoped his cousin Henry would be a good lord to him. The Parliament replied that they would recommend his being kept in some secret place, where the people could not resort, and where his friends could not be admitted to see him. Henry accordingly passed this sentence upon him, and it now began to be pretty clear to the nation that Richard the Second would not live very long. It was a noisy Parliament, as it was an unprincipled one, 
and the lords quarrelled so violently among themselves, as to which of them had been loyal and which disloyal, and which consistent and which inconsistent, that forty gauntlets are said to have been thrown upon the floor at one time as challenges to as many battles, the truth being that they were all false and base together, and had been at one time with the old king, and at another time with the new one, and seldom true for any length of time to any one. They soon began to plot again. A conspiracy was formed to invite the king to a tournament at Oxford, and then to take him by surprise and kill him. This murderous enterprise, which was agreed upon at secret meetings in the house of the abbot of Westminster, was betrayed by the Earl of Rutland, one of the conspirators. The king, instead of going to the tournament, or staying at Windsor, where the conspirators suddenly went on finding themselves discovered, with the hope of seizing him, retired to London, proclaimed them all traitors, and advanced upon them with a great force. They retired into the west of England, proclaiming Richard king, but the people rose against them, and they were all slain. Their treason hastened the end of the deposed monarch. Whether he was killed by hired assassins, or whether he was starved to death, or whether he refused food on hearing of his brothers being killed, who were in that plot, is very doubtful. He met his death somehow, and his body was publicly shown at St. Paul's Cathedral, with only the lower part of the face uncovered. I can scarcely doubt that he was killed by the King's orders. The French wife of the miserable Richard was now only ten years old, and, when her father, Charles of France, heard of her misfortunes, and of her lonely condition in England, he went mad, as he had several times done before, during the last five or six years. The French dukes of Burgundy and Bourbon took up the poor girl's cause, without caring much about it, but on the chance of getting something out of England. The people of Bordeaux, who had a sort of superstitious attachment to the memory of Richard, because he was born there, swore by the Lord that he had been the best man in all his kingdom, which was going rather far, and promised to do great things against the English. Nevertheless, when they came to consider that they, and the whole people of France, were ruined by their own nobles, and that the English rule was much the better of the two, they cooled down again, and the two dukes, although they were very great men, could do nothing without them. Then began negotiations, between France and England, for the sending home to Paris of the poor little queen, with all her jewels, and her fortune of two hundred thousand francs in gold. The king was quite willing to restore the young lady, and even the jewels, but he said he really could not part with the money. So, at last, she was safely deposited at Paris without her fortune. And then the Duke of Burgundy, who was cousin to the French king, began to quarrel with the Duke of Orleans, who was brother to the French king, about the whole matter, and those two dukes made France even more wretched than ever. As the idea of conquering Scotland was still popular at home, the king marched to the River Tyne, and demanded homage of the king of that country. This being refused, he advanced to Edinburgh, but did little there, for, his army being in want of provisions, and the Scotch being very careful to hold him in check without giving battle, he was obliged to retire. It is to his immortal honour that in this sally he burnt no villages, and slaughtered no people, but was particularly careful that his army should be merciful and harmless. It was a great example in those ruthless times. A war among the border people of England and Scotland went on for twelve months, and then the Earl of Northumberland, the nobleman who had helped Henry to the crown, began to rebel against him, probably because nothing that Henry could do for him would satisfy his extravagant expectations. There was a certain Welsh gentleman, named Owen Glendower, who had been a student in one of the inns of court, and had afterwards been in the service of the late king, whose Welsh property was taken from him by a powerful lord related to the present king who was his neighbour. Appealing for redress and getting none, he took up arms, was made an outlaw, and declared himself sovereign of Wales. 
he pretended to be a magician, and not only were the Welsh people stupid enough to believe him, but even Henry believed him too. For, making three expeditions into Wales, and being three times driven back by the wildness of the country, the bad weather, and the skill of Glendower, he thought he was defeated by the Welshman's magic arts. However, he took Lord Grey and Sir Edmund Mortimer prisoners, and allowed the relatives of Lord Grey to ransom him, but would not extend such favour to Sir Edmund Mortimer. Now, Henry Percy, called Hotspur, son of the Earl of Northumberland, who was married to Mortimer's sister, is supposed to have taken offence at this, and therefore, in conjunction with his father and some others, to have joined Owen Glendower, and risen against Henry. It is by no means clear that this was the real cause of the conspiracy, but perhaps it was made the pretext. It was formed, and was very powerful, including Scroop, Archbishop of York, and the Earl of Douglas, a powerful and brave Scottish nobleman. The King was prompt and active, and the two armies met at Shrewsbury. There were about fourteen thousand men in each. The old Earl of Northumberland being sick, the rebel forces were led by his son. The King wore plain armour to deceive the enemy, and four noblemen, with the same object, wore the royal arms. The rebel charge was so furious that every one of those gentlemen was killed, the royal standard was beaten down, and the young Prince of Wales was severely wounded in the face. But he was one of the bravest and best soldiers that ever lived, and he fought so well, and the King's troops were so encouraged by his bold example, that they rallied immediately, and cut the enemy's forces all to pieces. Hotspur was killed by an arrow in the brain, and the rout was so complete that the whole rebellion was struck down by this one blow. The Earl of Northumberland surrendered himself soon after hearing of the death of his son, and received a pardon for all his offences. There were some lingerings of rebellion yet, Owen Glendower being retired to Wales, and a preposterous story being spread among the ignorant people that King Richard was still alive. How they could have believed such nonsense it is difficult to imagine, but they certainly did suppose that the court fool of the late King who was something like him, was he himself. So that it seemed as if, after giving so much trouble to the country in his life, he was still to trouble it after his death. This was not the worst. The young Earl of March and his brother were stolen out of Windsor Castle. Being retaken, and being found to have been spirited away by one Lady Spencer, she accused her own brother that Earl of Rutland, who was in the former conspiracy, and was now Duke of York, of being in the plot. For this he was ruined in fortune, though not put to death. And then another plot rose among the old Earl of Northumberland, some other lords, and that same Scroop, Archbishop of York, who was with the rebels before. These conspirators caused a writing to be posted on the church doors, accusing the King of a variety of crimes. But— the king being eager and vigilant to oppose them, they were all taken, and the archbishop was executed. This was the first time that a great churchman had been slain by the law in England, but the king was resolved that it should be done, and done it was. The next most remarkable event of this time was the seizure, by Henry, of the heir to the Scottish throne, James, a boy of nine years old. He had been put aboard ship by his father, the Scottish King Robert, to save him from the designs of his uncle, when, on his way to France, he was accidentally taken by some English cruisers. He remained a prisoner in England for nineteen years, and became in his prison a student and a famous poet. With the exception of occasional troubles with the Welsh and with the French, the rest of King Henry's reign was quiet enough. But the King was far from happy and probably was troubled in his conscience by knowing that he had usurped the crown, and had occasioned the death of his miserable cousin. The Prince of Wales, though brave and generous, is said to have been wild and dissipated, and even to have drawn his sword on Gascoigne, the chief justice of the King's bench, because he was firm in dealing impartially 
with one of his dissolute companions. Upon this the Chief Justice is said to have ordered him immediately to prison. The Prince of Wales is said to have submitted with a good grace, and the King is said to have exclaimed, Happy is the monarch who has so just a judge, and a son so willing to obey the laws. This is all very doubtful, and so is another story, of which Shakespeare has made beautiful use, that the Prince once took the crown out of his father's chamber as he was sleeping and tried it on his own head. The king's health sank more and more, and he became subject to violent eruptions on the face, and to bad epileptic fits, and his spirits sank every day. At last, as he was praying before the shrine of St. Edward at Westminster Abbey, he was seized with a terrible fit, and was carried into the abbot's chamber, where he presently died. It had been foretold that he would die at Jerusalem, which certainly is not, and never was, Westminster. But, as the abbot's room had long been called the Jerusalem Chamber, people said it was all the same thing, and were quite satisfied with the prediction. The king died on the 20th of March, 1413, in the forty-seventh year of his age, and the fourteenth of his reign. He was buried in Canterbury Cathedral. He had been twice married, and had, by his first wife, a family of four sons and two daughters. Considering his duplicity before he came to the throne, his unjust seizure of it, and above all, his making that monstrous law for the burning of what the priests called heretics, he was a reasonably good king, as kings went. End of chapter 20